Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the third Fusion High Performance Computing Workshop on behalf of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and all of our collaborators. My name is Mary Kate Chessy, and I'm a member of the workshop program committee and a postdoctoral researcher in the Fusion Group led by Dr. Mervi Monsonen at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I will host this welcome session on behalf of the entire program committee. This is an exciting time to come together with our international community dedicated to fusion energy. I'm referring to the news just a few days ago about the milestone energy output in an inertial confinement plasma experiment at the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This is an important achievement on the long path towards commercial fusion energy and quite a positive current event to keep in mind as we kick off our workshop. First, I would like to, let's see, thank the other members of the program committee. Um, they're shown here on this slide for their excellent leadership in putting together the exciting workshop program and for chairing the sessions. We also thank all our collaborators shown here for their contributions to this event, as well as all the local organizers for making this event possible. Over the two days of the workshop, we will hear three keynote talks, four invited talks, and 19 contributed talks. The program can be found online on the workshop webpage, hpcfusion.bsc.es. The duration of the talks in each category is shown here. For example, contributed presentations are 15 minutes long with five minutes for questions afterwards. Early career presenters, including students and recent graduates, have the chance to be recognized with one of three outstanding presentation awards accompanied by these prizes. You see here a copy of the popular fiction novel Origin, which is just for fun because it takes place in part in Barcelona and features the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in its story. For each winner, we also have a USB remote control slideshow advancer with a built-in laser pointer for our outstanding career, early career presenters next in-person events. The way that the award winners will be selected is new to the workshop this year. With the goal of providing feedback from experts in Fusion HPC to early career speakers, we developed a rubric. A sample from the rubric can be seen on the right, showing a few of the items reviewers will be looking for in early career presentations, such as how well the work is tied to prior work in the field. Rubrics are useful for making it clear what the expectations are for a good talk and for reducing reviewer bias by asking reviewers to consider several specific features of the presentation rather than relying on overall impressions of the work. We are enthusiastic to try this out, and we're also open to suggestions from all of you about changes to it for next year. Speaking of all of you, let's take a look at who we are at the workshop. Uh, it's really great to see so much interest in this workshop. In total, we received about 175 registrations from about 40 different countries, with the largest participation coming from Spain, the UK, France, India, and Italy. Thank you everyone for your participation. Regarding workshop logistics, we will have one virtual room for this workshop at all times. The link you received by email after registration will work for both days. We ask everyone to keep your camera and microphone off during the presentations, unless you are the one person actually giving the presentation. This is to keep the recording focused on just the active speaker. Based on survey responses about the Fusion HPC workshop last year, because your feedback is really useful when planning the next event, this year the program committee decided to increase the level of interactivity. You can ask questions after talks using your microphone if you raise your hand using the Zoom function. And you can also use the chat for questions or for connecting with other workshop participants. Session chairs will select from raised hands to invite you to unmute yourself and ask your question, or the chair will read questions from the chat to the speaker. 
If the question session finishes, you may use private messages in the chat to the speaker to continue the conversation without disturbing everyone else during the following talk. Go ahead and try it now. Um, use the text chat to introduce yourself to everyone if you wish. Tell us where you're connecting from. Uh, try a private direct message to one of your friends. Try using a reaction or raising your hand. The raise hand function can be found inside the reactions menu. Your hand will stay up until you click to lower it again or until our organizing team lowers it for you. Um, then uh, you can also check your Zoom settings for whether you want to show chat previews. If you don't want to see the pop-up messages from other people's chats, you can disable them in the chat menu. Um, Try it now, play around. I welcome you to honestly put messages in the chat and try raising your hand, lowering your hand, trying a reaction. Um, you can try it throughout this welcome session. Uh, once we get to the end, just make sure your hand is lowered and then keep the public chat messages focused on the ongoing presentation. So I'd be curious to see where everyone is connecting from. I'm interested in what time it is where you are. Um, the workshop will be recorded and the videos will be posted online afterwards. And if you have any questions or comments during the event, send an email to hpcfusion at bsc.es. Now, we would like to say a few words about the work we do at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. The BSC is a public research institution that receives support from the Spanish government, from the regional government of Catalonia, and from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. The BSC carries out research and provides computing services to Spanish and European networks. The BSC is also actively involved in training new PhD scientists, technology transfer, and connecting with the public to communicate its activities and achievements. By the way, you can follow the BSC and our Fusion Group on Twitter using the handles BSC CNS and BSC Fusion. You can also get involved and tweet about this workshop using the hashtag FusionHPC. The core of the BSC is the supercomputer Mare Nostrum, featured in that prize novel Origin, which has a peak performance of 13.9 petaflops. The general purpose cluster is used for service for scientific communities in Spain and Europe, and also used for in-house research activities. Along the bottom, you can see different stages in the evolution of Mare Nostrum. Right now we are using number four, but number five will soon come into play. In fact, just a few days ago, the installation of the first components of Mare Nostrum 5 started. The first racks of the file system have arrived at the BSC. There will be 25 racks that will have a total capacity of 240 petabytes, which is 16 times more than what Mare Nostrum 4 has. Next, a few words about the different departments at the BSC. The Computer Sciences Department is the BSC's oldest and largest department, encompassing about half the people at the BSC today. The mission of this department is to influence the way machines are built, programmed, and used. This includes work with computer and system architecture, programming models and performance tools, resource management, big data, and artificial intelligence. The life sciences department includes six different research groups and six different units whose major areas of interest are summarized here. The department mission is to understand living organisms using theoretical and computational methods, such as molecular modeling, genomics, proteomics, and more. Next, the mission of the Earth Sciences Department at the BSC is to develop and implement global and regional models of data solutions for air quality and climate forecasting. These topics have applications in urban development, agriculture, and more areas shown at the bottom here. The final research department at the BSC is the Department of Computer Applications in Science and Engineering, or CASE. This is an industry-oriented department with applications covering a wide range of areas shown on this slide as a few examples, uh, including energy and fusion. 
Working together with other BSC departments, we are improving the performance of existing fusion HPC codes via three key European projects. The first is the European Performance Optimization and Productivity Center of Excellence, or POP-COE. Next, um, the team for the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe, or PRACE, high-level support is hosted at our center. And third, we are the host of the Eurofusion Advanced Computing Hub in collaboration with Theomat and other European research laboratories. Come to the talk today by Xavier Saez to learn more about the Advanced Computing Hub. In addition to our work improving the existing HPC tools in Fusion, we also develop new Fusion modeling capabilities at our center. These developments are based on our in-house ALIA multi-physics computational mechanics code with highly scalable numerical methods. These figures show some examples of the many fields of science and engineering, including fusion, where we are using and developing ALIA with various collaborators. ALIA fusion applications have been developed as part of the Fusion Cat project. Next, we'll tell you a little bit more about the Fusion Cat project as it is one of the sponsors of this workshop. Fusion Cat is a consortium of seven partners in the Catalonia region in the northeast part of Spain. The project is led by the BSC and funded by the regional government of Catalonia and by the European Union. The partner institutions are shown here. Formal collaboration through the Fusion Cat project is coming to a very successful close at the end of this year. Um, but over the course of the project, we have made some important progress that will influence the next steps and future collaborations around fusion research and development in Catalonia. Examples of that important progress are summarized here. These are the major activities and outcomes from the BSC as part of the Fusion Cat project. Our work focused on writing or improving Fusion software, benchmarking, and validation. As part of the Alia Multiphysics software, we can study neutron transport, heat transfer, and fluid dynamics. An electromagnetic module of superconducting elements has been validated experimentally with a partner institution in Fusion Cat. I've been involved in the work on multi-scale atomistic modeling of fusion reactor materials. And as Fusion Cat is aligned with the European research roadmap to the realization of fusion energy, our work has been carried out with the ITER modeling and analysis suite in mind. Below you see images of several fusion devices from current to future plans, including ITER, which is an experimental fusion reactor currently under construction in the south of France. During this workshop, you can learn more about the BSC's work in fusion high performance computing by coming to the two talks from our research group given by Marti Sirkunz Idushans and by Xavier Saez at 11 a.m. Central European time and 3.05 p.m. CET as well. So with this, we have come to the end of the welcome session. Uh, go ahead now and check that your Zoom hand is lowered and that you're using the public chat to everyone only related to the next speaker's presentations. Private chat messages are still okay. If you have questions for workshop organizers, send an email to hpcfusion at bsc.es. And thank you once again for joining. We will now move into the first keynote session of the workshop. Chairing the session and introducing the keynote speaker will be program committee member, Dr. Ediberto Sanchez from CMAT, joining us from Madrid. Good morning, Eddie. Are you ready to take over? Thank you very much, Mary Kate, and good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to this first session of the day and first session of the event. This session is devoted to optimization applied to design, engineering, and control of fusion devices. We will have a keynote first and then two contributed talks in this session. Remember that uh, after the talk, you can ask questions either by raising your hand or in the Zoom application or by using the chat. And the first speaker in this session is Federico Felici from the Swiss Plasma Center in Lausanne. 
Federico is an expert on tokamak plasma control and is leading uh, machine learning approaches uh, to control. Federico is uh, one of the representatives of the European Union in the ITPA and is member of the ITER Scientific Fellow Network in the area of control and is scientific coordinator of the audio fusion experiments in PCB and as the upgrade. If he is going to talk about deep reinforcement uh, learning for magnetic confinement control. Federico, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation. You have 35 minutes. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear and see me. Uh, it's my great pleasure to give this talk on behalf of the jo joint EPFL and DeepMind team about this very exciting and interesting work about application of deep reinforcement learning for magnetic control on, uh, on uh, TCV. As we will see, this was exciting work to try to get this approach of reinforcement learning to actually design controllers both in simulations and then actually apply them in experiments. So one of the real novelties of this work, I can already anticipate, was really to have then the controllers being tested on an actual device. And the results of this have been published in this, uh, in this paper, which you may have seen. Uh, and I will refer to this paper for more details if you want to know more about the work. So first, let me begin by introducing the actual control problem that we're trying to solve, which is known as the axisymmetric equilibrium control problem. So as many of you know, in a magnetic fusion device, like in a tokamak, it's very important to uh, control the location and the equilibrium, the details of the equilibrium uh, that you have. So basically the shape and the position and the electric, the toroidal electric current being carried in the pla plasma. So this is achieved by controlling the currents in a set of so-called control coils which are located around the tokamak. This is the example of TCV. And in practice, this, uh, this is done by receiving uh, a, a set of magnetic measurements in real time, typically up to 100 one of them, sending this to a controller, which in the case of TCV operates at the highest frequency of about 10 kilohertz, and then sending voltage commands to the 19 power supplies which actuate the circuits of the poloidal field uh, co coils. Um, so specifically, what we need to control is a combination of various things. We need to control, first of all, the total electrical current carried in the, by the plasma in the toroidal, uh, toroidal direction. As most of you know, this is done by induced voltages by a time varying current in the central solenoid in most situations. And on top of that, we need to control at the very minimum the radial position and the vertical position of the plasma. In particular, the vertical position is tricky because for plasmas which have which have some kind of an elongation, so they're higher than they are wide, this vertical position is actually unstable. So this means that you need active feedback control to even maintain the plasma in place uh, and to have a stable discharge in the first place. If you do not do this, you get the example of what I'm showing here, which is so-called vertical displacement event, where the plasma vertical position is lost and the plasma is lost against the wall. So these three things you need to control in any case, in any, uh, in any tokamak, if you want to sustain a discharge for uh, any reasonable length of time. Now, in addition to this, it's often very useful to also control some other aspects, detailed aspects of the plasma shape which means, for example, the location of this X point, the location of these legs, maybe there's a secondary X point here that you want to control as well, and details about how this last flux, flux surface is distributed in, in space, space. Now, this is something which we already know how to do. It's, this problem has been, uh, has, has been tackled in the past extensively for existing uh, tokamaks. And today, uh, there are uh, methods to do this using traditional control engineering approaches which I will illustrate now one way of, uh, of solving this problem. There are many different options, but one of them I'll illustrate here. So typically what's done is a combination of a, a sequence of steps and various components to get this control problem solved. So first, there's a step in which one does a sequence of equilibrium calculations 
to calculate what kind of electrical currents we need in the poloidal field coils to maintain the we, th we think we need to maintain the equilibrium where we want it to be. So this is done based on calculations of uh, how the plasma equilibrium responds to changes in the current in the coils. Then, um, the next step is to then design feedback controllers for actual stabilization and, I should say, and tra tracking. So then, because we know that the feed forward calculation is not 100% correct, we know that we also need to design feedback controllers to take any kind of errors into account. Then, once we are uh, actually do, doing our tokamak experiment or tokamak discharge in real time, you need a number of components running in the control system itself. You need real-time estimators of the plasma position. So you somehow need to combine the magnetic, magnetic measurements into estimates for the R position, the Z position, the plasma current, and the plasma shape. The plasma shape in particular is tricky because to do that, you need sometimes something called real-time equilibrium reconstruction, which involves actually solving the Gratschow-Fraunhoff equation. We'll come to, to this in a second, but solving basically this partial differential equation in real time with constraints from your magnetic me measurements. Again, this is something that can be done, and many tokamaks nowadays do, do this, but it is a relatively tr tr tricky thing to do. Then, um, yeah, once you have all these observers, you have estimates in real time of what your plasma equilibrium looks like, and then you need to run various controllers. So typically the problem is solved by having separate controllers for each of the different control channels in some sense, and then choosing which coil current, which set of poloidal field coils are used to control a given quantity. And then all of this is combined and then sent in the end as the signals to the power supply actuators. So, this whole procedure is done today using traditional control engineering methods referred to as specifically model-based design because we have relatively good mo models for tokamak axisymmetric control. So we can use these models to design controllers and control engineers know how to use these uh, models to then design their controllers. And then usually when you actually apply these to a, a real machine, there's some degree of hand-based, uh, hand let's say, tuning of various control parameters depending on what you see in the actual experiments. So it is really um, relatively uh, com complicated and important work of tokamak control engineers to then tune these kind of control systems to work on a given device. So the work we try to do in uh, the, the work I'm presenting today is to try to solve this approach using a completely method, this problem using a completely different approach which is to have, instead of all these separate controllers, just have one single controller which does everything, meaning the estimation of the quantities we want to control and the control itself, everything in one go. So no equilibrium reconstruction, no separate calculation of the controlled uh, variables, no separate design of the various control loops. You try to solve the whole problem in one go. And we try to approach this using uh, an emerging method from the machine learning community called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a way basically to solve control problems inspired by the way that humans learn to solve problems, which more often than not is by trial and error interaction with the environment. And reinforcement learning is nothing but a, a generic framework, a mathematical framework to express how this learning is performed. So there are two important aspects to this paradigm. The first is that it allows us to really specify the goal of what we want to control using a so-called reward function. So this is a scalar reward function, which basically says what you, uh, yeah, which is an expression of whether the controller is doing a good job or not. Also, a reinforcement learning can deal in general with long-term dependencies. And this long-term dependency makes it suitable to, to use reinforcement learning for dynamic systems in a generic sense and let's say engineering dynamical systems like like a to tokamak uh, uh, specifically though it can deal with many other problems also with long-term dependencies so as you may have seen in the uh, in the in the me, me media reinforcement learning has had great success in uh, solving for example games like chess or shogi or go and also complex games like starcraft 2 
but also more and more um, there are applications of reinforcement learning to actual real world problems meaning not computational problems or problems solved within a computer but really problems in real life on actual hardware such as this robotic hand over here here now just to give you an idea of how reinforcement learning is different from other machine learning approaches that you may have uh, have her, her, her dog. So very broadly speaking, we can classify learning approaches in machine learning into three kind of categories. One would be supervised le le learning. So supervised learning is when you learn to classify data based on labeled examples. So somebody uh, gives you lots and lots of, of, of da data and tells you this data is this, this data is that, this data is that. So providing labels and then the machine learning system has to learn given a new piece of data, which label is the most probable to apply to, to this. That's supervised learning. Then there is unsupervised learning, which is a way to learn to separate data, not by, not by giving external labels, but by looking for similarities or differences between pieces of, of da data. This is a very broad category, which encompasses many, many machine learning uh, applications, such as cloud, clustering and various things like like that now reinforcement learning is something still completely different because here we're talking again about learning by trial and error how to act on an environment to achieve a high reward so there's the notion of an an environment this dynamic environment and trial and error interaction of how how one should act on this uh, on this environment when there's in and in reinforcement learning there's a very key issue of the trade-off between exploration and then lear learning from the experience. So this, in this trial and error, there has to be some degree of exploration to look into a space that you haven't looked before to see if there's any good rewards to be had there. And then actually learning from the experience by, um, yeah, so by basically by remembering as a function of time, which actions got you good rewards or, or, or not. So there's really this notion of an agent interacting with an environment and the environment giving back observations and giving back re rewards. Now, let me just show you a very simple example of reinforcement learning applied to, uh, um, to this, this kind of problem here, which is just the problem of this kind of mechanical leg, which has to learn how to walk in a simulated environment. So after 200 trials, nothing much was happening. It was barely even standing. After 2000 trials, we see already that it is at least able to move uh, full forwards. After 6,000 trials, we already learn, it has learned how to jump over obstacles to some extent. And the important part is here that the only information that the, the, that the system receives basically is how far has, the, uh, has this thing been able to move? So how many virtual meters has it, has it moved? And this is the only, re the only component of the re, re of the re board that this agent receives. And then it has to learn how to move all these components of the legs to get as high reward as it can. So after 6,000 trials, we see it goes really relatively far. After 8,000 trials, learn how to jump over obstacles. And after 15,000 trials, we see already this very impressive performance of it really jumping over various obstacles. So you can see in the examples I was just showing you, of course, it was learning how to do this because it had access to a simulation where it could run many, many tri trials very cheaply and very easily just in a virtual environment. But when we are wa wanting to try to use reinforcement learning to control a to tokamak, we cannot afford to do all these trial and error approaches. As you know, tokamaks are complicated experimental uh, devices. So we need to somehow have a simulation of what we want to control so that we can learn how to do the control and simulation and then transfer the resulting controller to the ha hardware. So to do this, I have to introduce the environment that we used to do the training for the reinforcement learning. So the way the, uh, the environment works is using a so-called free boundary simulator, which is basically the Gratschafranov equation, which as most of you know, is represents the ideal MHD force balance coupled to a circuit equation, which represents the evolution of the electrical current in the passive and active conductor. So the poloidal field coils and the passive conductors surrounding the pl plasma. So the, which is what is going into this simulation is again, really the voltages which are applied on the coils. And at the output of the simulator are all the currents in the conductor 
the plasma current distribution and synthetic me measurements. So synthetic representations of what the diagnostics are expected to see. Specifically to solve this problem, we use a code called FGE, which is part of the Swiss Plasma Center MATLAB Equilibrium Suite, which I take the opportunity to advertise, um, which is a suite of code which can solve all sorts of magnetic control, magnetic pro equilibrium problems written really for control oriented and for shot preparation for purposes. So typically the way the FGE code was running at the time we did this work, it took a couple of hours to simulate a few seconds of plasma evolution. The reason it took this amount of time is because we were very conservative in terms of convergent tolerances and we ran it at very high speeds, at very high frequencies, let's say of 50,000 steps per second to make sure that we were capturing accurately all of the detailed dynamics, in particular of the internal control co coils that we have on T TCB. This is a number which actually in recent um, years and months has gone down as we work to optimize this code and really make it possible to run this simulation more routinely and more quickly. There are some aspects of the physical problem which are not really, uh, not really simulated by the free, free boundary simulator. These are quantities which you have to prescribe externally. So these are in particular a measure of the plasma conductivity. This will is very important because it will decide how much current will be driven in the in the plasma based on a given induced loop voltage. The plasma normalized pressure has to be prescribed as an external parameter and the plasma current profile shape also has to be prescribed. This is Q axis. So the yeah, the Q value of the Q profile at the axis has to be prescribed. Again, because the simulator does not self consistently calculate anything about the internal plasma transport, it doesn't calculate the thermal or the energy transport or the particle transport, it just assumes that the internal plasma profiles are parameterized by three numbers. And basically these three numbers are, uh, uh, are influenced by the, these other three, uh, three physical parameters. So the resistivity, the plasma beta P and the Q on axis. So this all goes into this block here, the forward gratia frown of Solver. Of course, then we need to interface this with a model for the power supplies, a model for the magnetic sensors, so that in the end, the whole environment has the same inputs and outputs as the actual tokamak we will control. So the inputs are going to be the power supply voltages, power supply command voltages. Measurements are going to be the various magnetic measurements in the case of TCD, magnetic probes and flux loops. Now, on top of this, we need to add two other important features to the environment. The first is a termination criteria. Termination criteria are very important in reinforcement learning to say when really the simulation should be stopped because it has gone in a state we do not, uh, we do not want or we want to avoid. And we use a termination criteria, for example, to terminate the stimulation when, uh, uh, when the um, uh, limits on the electrical current on some coils, for example, is exceeded. So when we do that, the reward it becomes much, much lower and the controller actually will learn or the agent will learn how to uh, try to stay away from, from these kinds of situations. For example, also if the plasma is too far away from the target, we also stop. And if the, similar, if the solver didn't converge for whatever reason, we also stop. So this is basically to avoid cases where the controller pushes the system, the simulated system into an unwanted state. Um, then the final important component is the so-called reward function, which is where we specify what we want. So we have to encode somehow how the, um, how the whole environment is in a state that we want or not. So how well the control is actually working. I'm just going to show you a few examples of the kind of things which we have to, had to put into this reward, reward function to get it to do what we want. You can imagine at the beginning, we began with very simple reward functions based only on the error in the plasma position, um, uh, for, for example, the plasma position and plasma current. But then we saw it wanted to use the poloidal field coils in, a, in an unwanted way, so we had to add for example, some um, terms to penalize improper use of the poloidal field coils. And then later we wanted to control things related to the X points. And then we also had to add terms for X point control, uh, X point to penalize a wrong X point position for, for example. So overall, here is a, a, the fa final li list of all the components we decided to put into this, uh, this, uh, this re, this re, re board function. I wanted to put this here and show you the whole list to show you basically what comes out of actually the work of interacting with the reinforcement learning agent, seeing what it does, 
and then having to adapt to what you're seeing in the simulations and experiment to get the system to do what you want. Now I'll give you some more details about how the learning was actually uh, actually performed. So as I explained in the previous slides, we had the we have now the environment, and now the next step is to try to train a control policy to actually get the environment to do what we want, which means to get a high reward. So the way this, this works is that initially you start with a completely randomized control policy, which is really not doing any, anything, anything good, let's say, and it st starts interacting with the environment. And of course, in the beginning, it won't do anything good. The control will not be very, very good. So then what happens is that the information of this feedback loop, this closed feedback loop between control policy and environment, the, the information about this exchange, about this time varying stimulations is sent to a so-called replay bu buffer, where there is then this learner which tries to extract useful information from, from this. So what happens is because this control policy is somehow randomized, it will at some point do something which looks good or looks useful by accident. And then this information will be in this replay buffer and this learner will have to learn, okay, that kind of action is good. Let's repeat this kind of action. Let's, let's, let's try to learn a control policy which has a high probability of repeating these kind of good control actions. This is basically how it works. Now, this is going on not just in one simulation, this is going on in parallel with many, many simulations at the same time. And the data is being fed continuously to this re replay bu bu buffer. And if the learning is happening correctly, the control policies in time will learn to be better and better and more and more successful at generating a high re reward. So we see this here, uh, the, the typical time it took to, uh, to train the agents to do something, something good, so to achieve a high episode reward. We see as a function of time, uh, as a function of the number of actors, so how many of these were running in parallel, we see how long the training took. So we see that for 5,000 actors, in this case, in about less than one day or about half a day, you could already get a very good performance. But also with only 20 actors, you could do this uh, in a couple of days for the example we're showing here. This was a relatively simple example. There are other cases, if you want to do more complex control, this could take longer, like up to one, one week. More specifics about the algorithm that was used, we use so-called actor critic reinforcement learning. This is very good for control of environments with continuous valued states as the one that we have right, right, right now. I'll say just a few more words about this, how this actor critic uh, system works, give you a bit more details because this is an HPC workshop after all, a bit more details about how uh, the simulations were actually, actually done. So of course, working with DeepMind, all of the learning ran on uh, Google, data center, so all of these actors running in, in parallel were uh, up to, let's say, 5,000 5, of them in the example I was showing. We're running on these Google data centers. The graph was defined using a software called Launchpad. And uh, from, the, yeah, from the architecture point of view, uh, as I said, we use an actor critic approach, and whereby this the first part is critic ran on the so-called T. TPU, and these are optimized computational units for the linear, linear algebra, which is involved in training and evaluating deep neural networks. Uh, while the actual simulation, so the environment I was showing earlier, this ran on a CPU, which was simpler because it's basically a single thread application. Um, let me now spend a few words about how the actor critic method actually works. So, the way we should see, see this is that really this critic has to, has to learn an important quantity in reinforcement learning, which is called the Q function. So the Q function is uh, basically a function which is, which is giving you a pre pre prediction for how well some given policy is going to, to be, be. So if you know what your Q, Q function is, basically you can have an internal prediction of what a given action is going to, to, to do, do. So this critic basically has the job of learning how the environment behaves and also learning how an expected action on the environment is going to turn, turn out. At the same time, this actor has to learn what the control po po policy is. So the control policy is what is the actual control 
controller. And you can imagine if you have a parameterization of your policy, you can take gradients of the parameters of your policy on this QFA function. So if you find the parameters of your control function, which give you, which make the uh, the expected reward from your Q function very high, then you have a very good control controller. This is in in short how this actor critic method works. The advantages of an actor critic method is that you have high stability, flexibility in training, and, and efficient use of data, which is very important in our case because the simulations we have are relatively expensive. The specific advantages for the problem that we have is this is extremely important is that. So the, the actor is the actual controller. So this is the one which can really only receive the magnetic measurements and will send the actions in the end. But in principle, the critic can have access to privileged information, how we call it, being the full internal state of the simulator. Um, and basically, when we talk about deep reinforcement learning, all we're saying is that both this uh, bo both this Q, Q fa function used by the critic and the controller used by the action are represented by possibly deep neural networks. And that's what deep reinforcement learning is. We show here that actually having this, um, having this actor critic, critic system is not enough. One actual and very important part is that the critic itself has to be recurrent. It has to be Recurrent in the sense that it has to have an internal state. This you can imagine makes lots and lots of sense because it is the critic which has to learn the actual internal dynamics of our of our system. So it, the fact that you have this actor critic method allows you to have your critic being very very large. Also because it is used only in the tra training. Well, the actor has to be very small. It has to be small because that's the one that has to run in real time. So it cannot be a very big and complicated to evaluate neural network. Now we see here the importance of actually, um, we see here the importance of how actually having this critic being recurrent, because we see that if we have a recurrent network, which is in this case 256 wide, this is able to learn successfully. Well, even if, if you have a purely feed forward critic, so one that doesn't include any dynamics, even if you make it much bigger, you're still not able to learn. So this recurrency is really a very important part. Now we've been able, as I said, to do this, this tra training in the simulated environment. So we have now uh, these agents which are able to control the, the plasma in the simulated environment. Now we're going to do the work of actually bringing this to the TCV Tokamak ha hardware. So then there were first some, some technical steps needed to actually br bring this uh, um, bring this trained controller into the TCV control system. In the end, it had to run on one computational thread at 10 kilohertz. And in the end, the controller that we used is actually a, sim a relatively simple feed-forward neural network, relatively small, a multi-layer perceptron like this. Then when we tried this on the TCV hardware for the first time, one of the issues was we saw that it didn't really behave the way we expected, and we quickly re realized why this was ha happening. It was because the initially the, the training we were doing had been done with just one value of these three parameters that I mentioned earlier. So this Q on axis, this beta P, and this sigma of the plasma, so the plasma conductivity. So you can imagine if you train using only one va value of this, the controller might end up being very specifically trained for, for that. This is a very normal and very understandable thing, which means that we need to introduce robustness in the controller to make it actually able to deal with also with variations of these three parameters. So what we did is we uh, ran another set of training while when these quantities were being perturbed from one training to the next. So the controller had to learn to be, uh, yeah, to work in all cases within the variations of these parameters. Also, of course, we had to add perturbations to the measurements and to the actions. So this basically represents the fact that, of course, in a realistic environment, you have sensor noise and there's some disturbances in the way the voltages are being applied. And finally, we needed some trial and error to design the reward function. I showed you earlier the list of reward function terms. In the end, we were able to converge to one reward function, which worked for all cases. But this took some trial and error of seeing what the agent came up with and then seeing this was unwanted and then adding terms to fix, fix this. 
then finally, this is one example of an actual TCV shot being controlled by the agent trained by reinforcement learning. You see here an equilibrium reconstruction performed offline. And here you see the actual ca camera image for this particular discharge. Let's look at this one in a little bit more detail. This is the same shot, just with the information shown here as a function of time. You see the equilibrium begins at 0 0.1 seconds here, being relatively low elongation. Then the reinforcement learning agent was uh, was prepared to increase the elongation, move the plasma to a different location, create a div diverter like this, and then move it back. And here we see as a function of time, the references and the control control errors that we, we had. So we turned into in terms of the root mean square accuracy of the, for example, the desired plasma shape we were able to receive to have mostly very high accuracy, lower than one centimeter. We see here these blue points are actually what the control targets in terms of the desired shape of the last closed flux surface. Now, we didn't stop here. We also controlled, we also used the flexibility of TCV to control a number of different pla plasma shape, shape, shapes. These are all plasma shapes which are under investigation in TCV, which we were able to do with the previous control system as, as well. But we show that the reinforcement learning approach is flexible enough to also reproduce all of these relatively complex and relatively cha challenging um, different sh sh shapes. Now, at this time, I should say, each of these meant that you had to run a new training run in order to, uh, to be able to, uh, to, uh, do, uh, to do, do the, the test. But we were able to achieve all of these different sh sh shapes in T TCV. And then one, one f further uh, result is that we were able by by using this reinforcement learning approach to also for the first time stabilize so-called droplet plasmas in TCV, which means two plasmas being held in place in equilibrium at the same time. Now you can imagine if we need to do something like this with the traditional controllers, it would mean designing new, new observers for each of the radial and vertical position for each of the plasmas, and then multiplying the number of controllers being used to do this. The advantage of the reinforcement learning approach is that we basically only had to reformulate the the reward function and then the controller just came out of the reinforcement learning approach in one go able to solve this pro problem. Of course, from the computational point of view, one very important challenge here was to actually have um, your uh, Grashafranov solver, so the free boundary evolution simulator, being able to actually simulate plasmas with two magnetic axes. Um, so this was the real cha challenge here from the computational point of view. I'm almost at the end. I just want to spend a few more a few more mi minutes here discussing what the perceived advantages and disadvantages are of using these kind of reinforcement learning based approaches for control. So I'm traditionally a control engineer. I come from the control engineering world and moved into fusion, uh, let's say, at the, uh, after my university degrees. But I'm still very, uh, very strongly tied to these traditional con controllers. So when we come up with these new reinforcement learning um, uh, approaches, I think it's healthy to ask ourselves, what did we gain and what did we lose? So what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? So many of the disadvantages I already spoke about, you don't need to design, let's say, all of these different control loops and all of these different observers. You solve the whole problem in one, one go. And in terms of the domain no knowledge, you, you can say that this really shifts the focus from having to l have complex control engineering solutions to making complex simulators, which is probably good news for many in the HPC community who work on making all sorts of uh, all sorts of simulators for various aspects of fusion. But this kind of technology means that we can let the reinforcement learning or the machine learning approach do a lot of the control for us, and we can put a lot more effort into how the simulator uh, into getting high fidelity, high speed simulators. In terms of actually things you need to tune, I would say in both cases, there are parameters you need to tune. In one case, it's really the control parameters. In the other case of reinforcement learning, it's really the reward function engineering, so tuning all of the different terms in your reward function. Now I come to what I perceive as one still important disadvantage of reinforcement learning, the way it is done today. Once you've done your training with the reinforcement learning, you end up with what we can call a black box. It's just a compiled controller and you put it on the machine and either it works or it does not. If it doesn't work, there's not much you can do. You have to go back and you have to train again and try to understand why it didn't work. While in traditional controllers, you have 
actual parameters of the controllers themselves that you can change. So this allows you to change the control performance by changing a control knob. And control experts know which knobs to turn to make the plasma do what we want, depending on what we're seeing. So in terms of usability and of day-to-day -day interaction with the control system, there are still great advantages in using traditional controllers, which I think is important to mention here too. So I come to the to the conclu conclusions. I as I have as I have show, show, shown you, we have been able to demonstrate reinforcement learning for closed loop magnetic uh, control. This is really a milestone in terms of applying reinforcement learning to a re real world sy system, independently from the fact that we are using it for tokamak control. And here are some of the key challenges we need to overcome in terms of reward function engineering, having accurate and fast mo mo models to be able to do these things um, and, and so forth. Some of the things I've, I've already mentioned. Again, I, I refer you to the, the paper if you want to know more. And if you just allow me one, one more, one more sl sl slide, I want to say, how I think this work in a more generic sense, reinforcement learning and machine learning applied to fusion simulators where it's going to go in the few future. So today we applied it for basically magnetic control, but it would be really exciting to also apply this to optimize more aspects of the fusion plasmas. In particular, include the physics of the internal plasma dynamics, for example, including equations for temperature and density evolutions and more complex physics models which represent more aspects of your fusion system and then do reinforcement learning or other types of machine learning based optimization to do to do this so this really is uh, this is really po pointing us the way towards the importance of doing whole device simulations so device simulations also called digital twins or flight simulators which can really simulate entire aspects of your few fusion systems and we can use this to learn better operating scenarios or even to co-design the device itself with the pl plasma scenario. So if you if you want, in sometime in the future, we'll have your fusion full device simulators using hopefully many advanced HPC, um, HPC uh, uh, systems and HPC solutions that you'll be discussing in this workshop. And this will have parts which are use machine learning acceleration to, to speed up some of the computational bottlenecks. And we'll also use machine learning, for example, for data assimilation. So using experimental data to improve this. This will have to act in conjunction with control rollers to get your system to do what you want. And overall, on the higher level, we hope we'll have some optimization, maybe machine learning based optimized design of your whole system. So overall, this all points to a really bright, bright future for applications of reinforcement learning to fusion in a, in a, in a very uh, general way, but also to other engineering systems. And just on my last slide, I wanted to give you just a, 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 a list of some very interesting, very recent machine learning applications to nuclear fusion, already addressing some of the things which I have said. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would be very, very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico, for this interesting talk. Now we have time for questions that you can ask by through your hand or by the, the chat. I don't see any question. I have a question myself. I'm curious about whether the reward or penalties that you said uh, affect the results of your system. And can you elaborate on how to define these weights and how do they affect the results? Yeah, so this is, as I, as I mentioned, this, this so-called reward function engineering is one of the key things that you need to, to do. When you are uh, when you are designing or when you are working with this uh, kind of reinforcement learning approaches, in a sense, it's no different than you know when you are solving a generic optimization problem. You also have a scalar cost fa function, and it has many terms. And you have to you, there's no way around it. You have to cho choose what you put in terms of these weights. Now, the good news is that they behave kind of the way you would expect. So, for example, let's say a simple case where we're 
have one part of the um, of the error of one part of the cost function is the error in the plasma position, and another part is how how big you want to you have the coil the electrical currents in the poloidal field coils. So you have a penalization, suppose you have one penalization term for the PF coil current and one penalization term for the plasma position error. Of course, as you would expect, if you turn the the the, the current error term up too high, it's not going to be able to do a very good job in terms of maintaining the the position. If you turn the plasma position one too high, it's going to use the current in a very active and very strong strong way. So there's no generic rule to do this. It's really the the job of when you're doing the training and when you're interacting with the whole tra training setup to tune this kind of uh, rewards or something that you you need to do. So these are really hyper hyper uh, uh, parameters of the system. There are other methods to actually tune hyper parameters in an, an automated way. We didn't really explore these in detail in this particular uh, in this particular work. Uh, so I hope that answers your your question. There's really no no simple answer. It's really a matter of the people designing these algorithms to tune these parameters proper, properly. But the good news is that the intuition works. Yeah, thank you. We have another question in the chat by Federico Cipolletta. The question is how much expensive are the typical training simulations in terms of computational results? Yeah, so in the examples, I was showing the case which had 5,000 actors running in uh, in uh, par par parallel. This really needs, I say, spe spe specialized hardware or relatively big data sets centers to be able to do to do that that the other case i showed with only 20 actors this is within let's say within the 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 re reach of a small cl cluster which somebody could could have let's say in their lab so it's very hard to qu quantify in a, in a in a clear way it depends on how many of these actors you're running in parallel to give you an idea when i cited that number of about 1 hour for uh, one full uh, one full simulation of a TCV uh, discharge. This is this this I do on my laptop to give you an idea. So the simulations themselves are not extremely computationally um, intensive. It's more running many simulations in parallel and then the actual actual tra training of the neural network, which they take uh, computational time. Though I should say in this particular problem, the simulation is the one that by far dominated the computational time. So a lot of the effort in improving the reinforcement learning algorithms goes towards being able to work with scarce, uh, with a scarce amount, scarce data. So being really careful not to run simulations that you don't really need. So minimizing the number of simulations that you that you need. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. <clears throat> we have another question in the chat by Paul Willem. Says, as you mentioned the. Learn controller is a black box controller. Is it, is it possible to learn from the black box about parameters which one could choose in classical controller? Yeah, this is a very good good question. It's a question which I always always ask the, the 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 machine learning experts as well, right? So intuitively, you could think, okay, I find a controller, and then maybe if I take a linearization of my neural network around an operating point, maybe it can tell me something. So the machine learning experts say no, because it's it's very highly non non nonlinear, and there's no guarantee that what you say locally around the neural network uh, at an operating point can tell you anything about let's say what you how you would transfer that to a much uh, uh, to a much say, simpler controller in terms of control gains. Um, on the other hand, what you could think about doing in the in the future is to somehow give the reinforcement learning agent itself also knobs, so to train the reinforcement learning agent, including, let's say, training a particular control knob to do a particular thing that you want. That is, uh, I think, an interesting area of future research. The other thing you could do is to actually say, well, we don't use reinforcement learning, but we use some other machine learning method, maybe reinforcement learning, to train the or to find the, the optimal parameters for a traditional controller. But then you're already predetermining what the structure of your final controller is going to be. And that might not give you the optimal uh, solution either if you constrain into the degrees of freedom which a controller has. Okay, we have the very last question, I think, and we don't have much time. This is by Mervy Mancini. Thanks, Federico, for the nice talk. Could you 
could these techniques be used also for to speed up the commissioning and testing of magnetic controller of a new device such as CITER? Yeah, that's a very, very good, good question. The, the answer is I, I don't, I don't know. Um, there's, there's, there's some, some good re, re reasons why you may want to try that, and other reasons why you might, might not. So as I said, the fact that with the simple controllers you have a very clear control parameter for each um, thing you want to control is in the commissioning phase extremely important because the, the, the number of Let's say uh, that you can do iterations very, very quickly in the control room, and you can commission your controllers one at one at a time. So first your vertical control, then your radio control, then your IP control, and so forth. And this has really advantages to do this in the more traditional ways. Uh, this being said, if we think about, if you think ma many years from from uh, from now, if, when we develop, if we continue developing the capability of doing simulations. Uh, very quickly and very uh, efficiently for the magnetic controllers of the kind you would need to be able to do the reinforcement learning. This, in any case, has a huge advantage because then you can pre-train and pre-pre-test and gain experience in how you would prepare your magnetic controller on these uh, high fidelity or relatively high fidelity stimulators. So, and the the third part, yeah, what you could also imagine is when you have a traditionally um, uh, stru structured controller, but using reinforcement learning to train the, to learn the actual para parameters of this controller. Um, yeah, it's somehow more restrictive than the pure reinforcement learning, let's say with the, with the, with the generic agents that we were showing here, but that might be a kind of hybrid, hybrid method, which might be, might be uh, very interesting to uh, do. That being said, one more point, you know, we, today we're really at the beginnings of, of being able to do this kind of things. In the in the future, I see when these simulations become very, very cheap, cheap and we have developed methods to assimilate new data, which is coming from an experiment into these mo models in an effective and semi-automated way, then it may, may be more efficient to really do the training of a new controller with the reinforcement learning but the way that methods are today i'm not sure i would uh, i would recommend it but i think we can do a lot of work and research to make to really make these things have uh, actual practical advantages in commissioning future devices as you say but it will still take some some time well i think it's time to go to the next talk thank you very much federico for the talk and for the thank you to the questions the next speaker is Guillermo Godino from the Laboratorio Nacional de Fusión, TMAT. And Guillermo will talk about the use of optimization techniques for the design of advanced accelerator configuration. I don't know if Guillermo is ready. Are you ready, Guillermo? Yes, I'm. Okay, the floor is yours. And okay. start. You have 15 minutes. Good morning. Uh, I'll be presenting the work for from this year of my phd optimizing stellarators to have this quasi isodynamic uh, design first i'll talk about why all stellarators are being optimized next about how they are being optimized in particular with this genetic algorithm i've been using and finally the results for five and six periods well, why are stellarators optimized well uh, despite having some advantages over tokamax, they have, well, some in some aspects, they're not quite uh, as good. One such aspect is the confinement losses due to neoclassical transport. This affects particles that are, are bouncing back and forth rather than going round in full circles, and they slowly drift, they uh, drift outwards. These particles are uh, inherently confined in tokamax due to these being axisymmetric, but this is not the case in a generic 3D field, uh, such as in stellarators, due to the inhomogeneous magnetic field they have. Uh, this affects two kinds of uh, particles or populations. The first are the fast ions. These are alpha particles just created by the fusion reactions. They have quite a lot of energy, and this energy should be deposited in the bulk of the plasma. If they do escape, they may damage the plasma-facing components. 
The other is the bulk ions themselves, thermal ions. And these escaping represent a major contribution to the energy transport uh, leaving the plasma. Thankfully, since sterilizers have a lot of degrees of freedom, this enables uh, one to make a detailed optimization of the uh, magnetic configuration to optimize quite a few things. Now, how to optimize this in particular, the losses of fast ions or the losses due to neoclassical transport? Well, there's a property called omnigeneity. This refers to the magnetic drift in the radial direction, averaging out to zero. So overall, the particles don't uh, leave as much. Uh, a sufficient condition to achieve this property is to have a quasi-isodynamic field. This is omnigenous and has colloidally closed contours of the magnetic field. This is the magnetic field strength over a single field period, and these contours do indeed close poloidally. These kinds of fields have some benefits. They don't have fast ion losses without collisions. The neoclassical transport of these bulk ions is low or none. And the bootstrap current, which is a kind of toroidal current that is undesirable in these kinds of stellarators, is zero. They should also, in some cases, have low TEM turbulence. Now, what could one want to optimize in a stellarator? Well, there are several possible objectives, and we used the ones in white. The first two are referred to the uh, rotational transform, IOTA. Uh, First, the, we want to have a diverter an Iceland diverter configuration and uh, avoid uh, rational surfaces inside the plasma. Then the plasma should be MHD stable. And the next three are the ones I mentioned before about fast ion losses, bulk ion losses, and the low bootstrap current. The final two weren't optimized so far. The first is the turbulent transport which should be reduced, but it hasn't been included explicitly in the optimization. And the second is to have coils that are, can create the uh, magnetic configuration. This will be done later on. Next are some constraints. First, the plasma beta should be reactor relevant, so around 4%. The aspect ratio should also be adequate, not too large, around 10% is OK and the period number is fixed. The one missing is the four period, which has already been optimized by my supervisors here in CMAT and will be published in this paper. Next, how is the optimization done? In a generic optimization problem, there's three kinds of quantities, parameters, objectives, and targets. The former are quantities that can vary independently and uh, well within certain bounds. For a stellarator, an example could be the shape of the last closed flux surface. Next are the objectives, which are the quantities that you want to optimize. And by optimize, this means they should approach a given target for each. An example would be the fast ion losses, which should approach zero. As we saw, there's quite a few objectives, well, a couple objectives. And that means this is a multi-objective optimization problem. It can, however, be turned into a single objective optimization problem by defining this so-called cost function. Essentially, you just add the squares of the differences between objectives, each objective and its target with a chosen set of weights. Then the code suit stellop that we used will minimize the sum chi-squared for a chosen set of targets and weights uh, user-defined. Now, the genetic algorithm that we used is a bit different from the usual, from the more common uh, gradient-based methods. Instead of having a single configuration, it has a whole population of them, each one defined by its own set of parameters, sometimes referred to as genes. The algorithm itself takes a, well, loops over all the elements of the population, take the element J, for example, and it, for each one, it creates a new element j prime by randomly selecting two other configurations in the population and applying their difference to the j element to create this j prime then it applies this so-called greedy condition which means essentially if the j prime element the new j prime element has improved chi squared then it keeps j prime otherwise it keeps the original one to the next generation 
So over time, as generation after generation, it is guaranteed to at least not uh, to have the population generally increase. Yeah, generally improve. So. Next, the actual parameters in the sterator and later the objectives used. What well, parameters are these quantities that can vary independently? And we usually used around 60 of them. Uh, sterator itself may be uniquely determined by using these quantities. The shape of the mass closed flux surface, shown here, which is expressed in terms of a set of Fourier coefficients. Also the pressure profile and the toroidal current profile. This last one, since we don't have to ha want to have any toroidal current, is not an actual parameter, it's set to zero. With these three quantities, the equilibrium code VMEC calculates the equilibrium configuration for each design of every element of the population in every generation. That adds up to a lot of calls to this VMEC. Then, once you have the equilibrium, you uh, up some other codes, calculate the objectives that quantities that are to be optimized. And this is where one requires parallelization to simultaneously compute all the equilibria and the objective quantities. We usually used around the 108 or the 120 processors in each run lasting for six to 10 hours on this uh, Shula server here in CMAT. And as promised, the objectives. The first two were previously called constraints, but Stellopt treats them the same as objectives. The aspect ratio has a target value around 10, and the plasma beta around 4%. The rotational transform has to be such that it avoids some low order rationals, this one in particular that depends on the number of uh, field periods. And uh, at, on the outer side, at the last closed flux surface, the, IOT, the value of iota should be somewhere close to one to allow for the Iceland diverter configuration. Next is this magnetic well quantity. Uh, it being larger than zero helps, uh, emit, well, it's a requirement for MHD stability. And the radial derivative of the zero zero component of the magnetic field, uh, this one helps confine the fast ions if it is as large as possible. The next three are probably the three most important quantities. The first one, epsilon effective, is a means to quantify the losses of bulk ions due to this neoclassical transport. So the object target is, of course, zero. And the next two, gamma C and gamma alpha, are estimators for the fast ion losses, which should also be zero. By requiring these to be zero, one approaches a non or uh, quasi isodynamic de design. And next, the last four are objectives referring to the shape of the magnetic field itself. The first one is the variance of the magnetic field at the minimum. The minimum is this blue region in the center, so it should have a sort of uniform uh, magnetic field strength. The next two refer to the, the same, but at the maximum. The maximum should be uniform and approximately on this vertical line at constant toroidal angle. And the last one makes the, the minimum of the magnetic field here in the center become a bit wider. The bootstrap current and the turbulence are not explicitly included, included in the optimization, though they are, uh, the bootstrap is indirectly optimized for by approaching a QI design. And finally, onto the results. The first one is the five period configuration, optim the optimized configuration. It has a plasma beta a bit over four and an aspect ratio a bit over 10, but they're still uh, acceptable values. The cross section is a bit uh, elongated, but it's also acceptable. The magnetic well is above zero, so that's a, uh, the MH, one MHD require, stability requirement satisfied. And the magnetic, uh, the map of the magnetic field is reason, it looks like a QI configuration as required. The rotational transform profile avoids the 0 0.8 surface and gets approaches one on the outer side. And the actual quantities that were optimized for are these, or that were meant to be optimized. The first is the fraction of fast particles that have been lost over time. These red lines are for the Wendelstein 7x 
high mirror configuration, which is the better one for fast ion losses. And these are fast ions born at uh, the radial positions S equal 0.06 and S equal 0.25, that's half radius. The blue lines are for the, oh, the five period configuration. And they don't appear because they don't have at the at these radio positions, there are no fast ion losses up to 0.1 seconds in these collisionless simulations with Ascot. The next one is the bulk uh, ion losses due to neoclassical transport, quantified by this epsilon effective. Now compared with Bender's 107X, the standard configuration, which is better in these, in this quantity. As you can see, the bulk ion losses are a bit worse at the outer side, but the important region is the core, which has a higher temperature and hence lower collisionality. And here in the core region at lower radii, the five period configuration is better than uh, the standard Bendelstein 7X. These are all without coils. Finally, the bootstrap current, this is quantified by the D31 coefficient. And now compared again to the Wendelstein 7x high mirror configuration and in all collisionalities uh, considered it is closer to zero as intent as was ex well, expected by it being closer to a quasi isodynamic configuration the other uh, result was for six periods this is a bit higher plasma beta and aspect ratio but not too much it has better uh, cross section less elongated Again, the W is greater than zero, and it doesn't quite look as QI, and we will see the consequences of this, but it's still sufficiently close. The IOTA profile is pretty much the same. Avoid the, now it's uh, 0 0.83 surface and get uh, moves towards one on the outer side. You have one more minute, Guillermo. The fast ion losses are uh, they do have a, a bit of fast ion losses for the six period one uh, for ions born at half radius, but it's still better, uh, almost as good as the other one. The bulk ion losses are even better than four or five periods, uh, lower ones at the core, but it fails a bit in the bootstrap uh, current with the D31 coefficient being slightly larger than uh, Wendelstein 7x high mirror in this case. And finally, for the conclusions, from both the five and six period designs have a QI-like magnetic configuration and are MHD stable uh, as far as the magnetic well uh, is considered. They have been optimized well for bulk neoclassical ion losses and uh, fast ion losses. And the five period in particular also improves on the Wendelstein 7X for the bootstrap current. The, it is also comparable to the four period design uh, I mentioned before. The optimization in three periods, which hasn't been shown, was less successful, even though it had uh, more computational resource investment. Next, we will uh, evaluate the TM turbulence, but it is expected to be good because it's close to QI, though it also has another requirement, this maximum J property. And uh, during the next year, we will look for the coil design to make the, to have these uh, configurations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Guillermo, for this interesting and clear talk. This is time for questions. We don't have much time. Uh, first question is by Ama Kang. Can... Um, okay, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it was really good, so well done. Um, I have two questions. One is how did you decide on the cost function being your fitness function. Whoops. Yeah, like how did how did you decide that that's going to be the, the right way to decide on the fitness? Uh, the cost function, the general shape of it or the specific values of the targets and the weights. Okay. Uh, and the second question I have is why did you choose a genetic algorithm over any other method? For like optimization, the one most well, the ones most used are uh, gradient based algorithms. I think in particular one called the Levenberg Mark one, 
which was the one used for the four period one by my supervisors. Uh, but uh, I started in January and by February, I got stuck on a local minimum for a while. So I chose to move on from a local optimizer to a global optimizer. Right. And it rather quickly left uh, that local minimum. And the, the cost function itself, well, the weights are, the, we, we keep varying the weights depending on the results. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for a very quick question. No questions. So we go for the next talk. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Thank you. The next speaker is Luke Humphrey from Kaya, and we'll talk about machine learning techniques applied to engineering and design optimization. Are you ready, Luke? Yeah. Okay, Hello. so you can start. You have 50 minutes. Thank you. Okay, good morning, or good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you happen to be. Um, my name is Luke. I'm going to be talking about machine learning uh, techniques for sequential learning, engineering design optimization. So when you're optimizing an engineering design, there's three things you need to do. Uh, the first one is to describe the design parametrically. So these might be the geometric parameters of your design, or they might be material properties, etc. Secondly, you need to select uh, one or more optimization metrics that you're trying to optimize for. And then finally, you need to seek the values of those chosen parameters, which optimize your chosen metrics. So machine learning techniques can help with this. They can intelligently select the next candidates during an optimization sequence. And this allows us to make the best use of HPC resources by minimizing the number of simulations, which are expensive to evaluate. So the engineer's job becomes selecting the parameters to vary and the bounds to vary them, within to vary them, the optimization criteria, and if there's multiple, their relative weights, and the correct choice of machine learning technique that suits the problem at hand. So I'm breaking this talk down into three sections. We'll start with some of the theory, move on to a specific fusion example, and then finally look at next steps for the project. So let's start with the theory. I wanna introduce two terms, surrogate models and acquisition functions. Surrogate models are statistical models trained on an existing data set and used to interpolate between that data. So an example of this is a Gaussian processor. Acquisition functions are cheap to evaluate functions that are used as the loss function when training the surrogate model. So an example of this is uh, uh, shown below, and this is expected improvement. So if I can turn your attention to the plot, uh, we have here in the dashed yellow line, this is a simple, uh, simple sinusoidal function. And that's the true value. And then these pink crosses are noisy samples taken from that function. So if we train a surrogate model, a Gaussian processor in this case, on that data, it tries to fit the data producing this purple curve here. Um, and the shaded yellow area represents the uncertainty, the 95% confidence interval of that surrogate prediction. So the purple line is the prediction from the surrogate model. Um, and on the bottom here, we have the acquisition function. So this is over the same X range the expected improvement is uh, the, this mass here. So don't worry about the mass too much, but the important thing to note is that there are two terms here. There's an exploitation term whose maximum is found when the mean posterior prediction, this purple line, is much higher than the best value found so far. And there's an exploration term, which is at its maximum when the standard deviation or the uncertainty is high in that region. So we can see in the example pictured, that this trade-off leads to a maximum for expected improvement where this dashed white line is between where the mean prediction is highest and when the uncertainty is highest. And that's due to the trade-off between exploitation of the best so far and the exploration of the overall design space. So this can be applied to Bayesian optimization, which is defined as sequential design strategy for global optimization of a black box function. So the thing to note here is that the goal is finding the optimal design of your component. Training the surrogate model is a means to that end, 
but we're not trying to train a surrogate model and we don't care how good its predictions are outside of finding that optimum design. And the black box function in this case is a HPC simulation. So we, all the model knows is the inputs and outputs of that simulation, with the inputs being your uh, parameters that you're varying and the outputs, the optimization criteria that you're interested in. So in a Bayesian optimization loop, you start by training a surrogate model on some initial simulation data. Uh, in this simple 1D example, we have the two data points there and the surrogate fits a, a simple line. Then you optimize the acquisition function. So this red line on the right, um, this acquisition function, it's quite a simple one because the uncertainty is highest where the mean prediction is highest. So on this far right extreme, um, that's the optimum for the acquisition function. We evaluate that point uh, so this would be a HPC simulation, but in this case, it's just a sinusoidal function. That point is found to be much lower than predicted, and the model is updated to reflect that. So you retrain the model and you repeat, and, and you just repeat this pattern over enough iterations until you get to a point uh, where you meet your stopping criteria. So the stopping criteria I've usually used is when the acquisition function uh, is optimized and that value is below some threshold. In other words, the next iteration doesn't expect much improvement on what you've got so far. Taking this into a two-dimensional input space, um, this is a three-hump camel test problem. This is used as a stress tester for optimizers. Uh, here on the left, we can see the shape of this function. It's got these three local minima, but the global minima is the one in the middle. So your optimizer needs to be able to find this global minimum without falling into one of the traps on either side. Uh, this on the right, this animation is showing an optimizer I put together with PyTorch and Bowtorch. And because these uh, codes work on maximization, the function's just been flipped upside down. So that's why it appears in the inverted colors. Uh, so we're seeking the maximum, which is still in the middle. So you can see the animation running through this loop. The green cross shows where the next simulation is being run. Um, and I'll just start this up to start again. Each X shows a training point and the contour is showing how the surrogate model sees the design space. So it's exploring the design space, evaluating, and eventually settles at the global optimum in the center after about 50 iterations. Okay, so now let's apply that to a fusion problem. So the problem I've chosen is that of a simplified diverter monoblock. So a diverter monoblock is a modular cooling component used in tokamak diverters, like here on the left. Uh, this is a simplified model containing a filled interlayer, so there's no cooling pipe or fluid. This is something that's uh, being physically tested in Hive, uh, a, a high heat flux testing facility here at Cullum. And this makes it an ideal low parameter component just for a starting point and a proof of concept optimization. So this is the model I put together in Moose. It's a steady state thermomechanical solution uh, with thermally uh, temperature dependent thermal properties on the materials. The geometry and meshing is all parametric, so it can be varied to explore the design space. And this has a, the materials have a stress-free temperature of 20 degrees, heated uniformly to 100 degrees C. And the model is pinned at the base and allowed to deform elsewhere. So here we have the displacement field. You can see the displacement is zero at the base and allowed to expand up at the top. Now let's look at the thermal expansion of von Meister stress field. We can see that there is a stress here uh, around the interface between the tungsten armor and the copper corundum zirconium interlayer because the two materials have different thermal expansion coefficients. These models are put together based on some existing models in ANSYS. And we can see here the comparison, uh, the validation between those models is good. They, they, they predict the same behavior. So let's optimize this. Uh, so using the same Gaussian processor and expected improvement model as before with the three hump camel test problem, we're varying the following parameters. So uh, we're varying the monoblock width which is also the height of this square section of the monoblock around the uh, interlayer or the pipe. Um, and we're varying the armor height, which is this additional height on the plasma facing side of the monoblock. And the optimization criteria we're interested in is minimizing the highest point of thermal stress. So on this model, 
the highest point of thermal stress, the maximum of that field is here, this red portion, and we want that number to be as low as possible. Uh, so we can see the optimizer running on the right here as before, um, and finds an optimum after about 30 other iterations. There we go. So this is the optimum it finds the screen circle here. Uh, we can see that it's stripped off the armor completely and expanded the uh, oh sorry the top face, the top portion of the armor has been stripped off and the rest has been expanded to, to this ideal point at 83 uh, millimeters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, there's some issues of this optimization. Mainly, only stress is considered as a single objective optimization at this point. So the armor <clears throat> in this model is only serving to add a directionality to the stress. Um, but the armor does serve a purpose, which this model is ignoring. So a full physics model would be multi-objective, also minimizing the pumping power required to maintain operational temperatures, and the armor should serve a purpose there. There's also just too few parameters here to create a representative design space of fusion problems, and a full physics model will add uh, more to the design space. So let's look at next steps for the project. So as I just indicated, the next steps will be to increase the model complexity. Um, I'm looking to create an intermediate complexity model first and then follow that up with a full physics model. So for intermediate complexity, we can add in that copper pipe and bring the number of dimensions geometrically up to six when you consider all of the diameters involved. We can also swap out that uniform heating for a directional heat flux on the armor, which will more closely mimic its real behavior. And we can add in cooling as just as a simple convection flux on the inner side of the pipe. So not adding fluid simulation in yet. But then for the full physics model, we can add full nonlinear material properties, including plasticity and viscoplasticity. Add in cooling as a coupled CFD of the fluid flow through the pipe. And run the simulation not as steady state, but as transient, including the full thermal history through the manufacturing phase and the thermal pulses it would experience in a, in a pulse tokamak environment, uh, all building together to show the real uh, stress field that you'd end up with. From the surrogate modeling perspective, there's some improvements we can make. Uh, firstly, as indicated before, run a multi-objective optimization. For the intermediate model, we could have the objective to avoid the maximum temperature exceeding operational limits. And this would create a nice step discontinuity where the model is rewarded strongly if the temperature is not exceeded, um, but punished severely if it is exceeded. And different machine learning techniques will handle this sort of step discontinuity better than others. For the full physics model, we can instead minimize the pumping power for the computational fluid dynamics section of the code um, required to keep things in operational uh, temperatures. A quick win would also be improving the sample plan. So all the initial samples for the, that we've seen previously were just selected randomly from a uniform distribution within the set bounds, but there are more sophisticated ways to generate your initial data. For example, a Latin hypercube seen on the right here uh, features one point rep in each column and row of the design space, and this can just be scaled up to an arbitrary number of dimensions. <clears throat> and finally, we can explore different machine learning techniques. So some examples, um, by no means an exhaustive list are shown here. Uh, there's the neural network, whose strength is identifying nonlinear patterns in the design space. But there's a challenge there with a lack of well-defined acquisition functions. Uh, the physics-informed neural net builds on this by allowing you to encode some of the known physics and helping to train the model well on smaller data sets. But it does have that same challenge of a lack of well-defined acquisition functions. Another method is the particle swarm optimization, which uh, is pictured here in this animation. Um, all of these starting points are sort of optimized from their local area. So there's a built-in exploration of the design space. But a potential challenge here is that it may overuse HPC simulations since the model is only being updated after multiple parallel simulations. <clears throat> um, I'm going to skip over in the interest of time a couple of slides here, but here are some related projects and these slides will be up on the website later, so you can have a look and some acknowledgements as well uh, as links to all of the code used in this project. So to summarize, machine learning allows us to make the best use of HPC resources in sequential design. 
sequential learning engineering design optimization. And we've seen a proof of concept Bayesian optimization of a simple diverter monoblock and talked about the next steps towards exploring a range of optimization techniques at multiple levels of complexity. So I'd be really keen to have any feedback and suggestions. And if you'd like to email me something, my contact details are on the screen now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. We are on time, perfect time. So we have time for questions. I don't see any questions in the participants. You may, I have a question myself. Sure. You, you have mentioned that you parameterize the design and reduce it to a set of parameters. Assuming that uh, the more details you include, the, the, the larger would be the set of parameters, then I'm curious about how the results are affected uh, by the size of the, or the number of parameters you use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so far, um, I've only varied uh, two parameters. I've only done two, two parameter input space, being this height and the width. But, and this is quite easy to visualize on this 2D because you can create a nice contour plot like this. Um, but yeah, scaling this model up. Um, so for this model, we have all of these diameters and you'll create a multi-dimensional design space. Um, but the problem is essentially the same. Uh, I expect there will be more non-linearities and more, more minima uh, in that design space in the, in the multi-dimensional space. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. We have a question in the, the chat. Mm -hmm. This is by Bernard Dunfak. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask you if the number of points changes from 5 to 15, would the result be affected? The number of points, sir? I think the question goes uh, in the same direction. The complexity of the parameterization, I would say, I don't know mm. if this is the question. Maybe you can specify more in the chat, but not. We don't have any more information. Okay. Somebody is asking if you show this the summer slide. Sure. There you go. More questions? I don't see more questions. I have another one. For the simplified developer monoblock model, you said mm -hmm. that a very different optimum is found as compared to the original setting. Yeah. How can you compare the properties of the simplified, the optimized design and the simplified one? Can you repeat the question, sorry? How can I compare the properties? Yeah, can you, how can you compare? Because uh, you have a simplified model. Mm -hmm. How can you compare with a more complex model? How can you evaluate how the simplified model is uh, it's okay? Yeah, so in this case, you're thinking about what the what this model is taking into account. Um, yeah. So this optimization strips off the armor um, because it sees no function for the armor. But I think part of that is because it's being heated uniformly. The armor only serves to add a directionality, whereas the real design will be heated with a heat flux, uh, a directional heat flux, so the armor might actually reduce the, the maximum stress. We have another question in the participant mm -hmm. uh, by just Bunny Silva Solis. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks for this uh, very nice presentation. So I was uh, asking me uh, if in any moment are you considering your optimization process the influence of uh, the interaction of the plasma with the materials because if you take it into account optimize the size of the diverter but it could have a, a repercussion of the diffusion of the probably hydrogen isotopes on the materials and so on if you in the future are going to take into account that 
yeah that's definitely something we're talking about um i th i sort of envision the way we would do that um is in a change to the uh sort of a transient change to the material properties so for example neutron irradiation can in brittle materials so we might have the mm. uh the material properties increase mm. the brittleness uh as the time or as the uh heat flux continues yeah exactly yeah yeah it could be super interesting uh take it that into account because i think that is something important to to see as well yeah for sure mm. thank you thank you we have another question in the in the chat. This is by about the mic. Uh, <clears throat> this is a technical question. He said, "How do you automate the adjustment of your design and the next stimulation analysis at every time step?" Because I he understand that the the optimizer should call the and update the mm -hmm. every time every time step. Is this a, sorry? Is this question about the um, the the models comparing yeah. resonances? Mm -hmm. uh, so these are both steady state simulations. So they they just have one time step. There's just the initial and this and the solution. Um, excuse me. I meant at every step of the optimizer. So oh, of okay. your Bayesian optimizer, because you uh, update the, the design in the grid, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so the ANSYS model was not running an optimizer. This was just. This was created for um, for another project uh, for for this project here, just to see how the thermal stress field uh, for, from uniform heating is. Um, so yeah, I can only compare for that uh, initial design point. Okay, thank you. No problem. Hello, everyone. Again. Uh, my name is Alejandro Soba. I will be the chair of the second session of the day. Uh, the name of the session is Deterministic and Multiphysic Approach to Simulate Fusion Reactors. Uh, the session contains one inviting talk, uh, four contributing talks, and the first one will be in, in charge of Marty Circus Dilusans. Marty, you are ready? Hi, Alejandro. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, uh, you can share your your presentation. Remember that for all the present, may can make questions using chat or rising hat tool in the Zoom. Well, when you were ready, so can you see the presentation? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So thank you, Alejandro, and also thanks to the entire workshop committee. Good morning, I'm Martí Circunji Dushans, and today I'm going to present the validations carried out by our group using Neutro, which is a deterministic transpose solver for fusion applications. So in this talk, I will start giving a basic introduction about fusion neutronics. Then I will introduce Neutro and its futures, present the results and validations obtained with the code and also its scalability in terms of high performance computing and eventually i will end up the presentation talking about the current and future work that's being done and provide some conclusions so first thing first as you may already know in nuclear fusion Neutrons are produced as a result of the deuterium tritium reaction. These high energy neutrons move throughout the reactor, interacting with its constituents and also the reactor surroundings, compromising the, power, the nuclear plant, as well as the integrity and efficiency of the nuclear reactor components. On the other hand, one of the top neutronic priorities for fusion energy being successful is the production of tritium. While the deuterium can be extracted from seawater in virtually boundless quantities, the supply of available tritium is limited. And that's due to the fact that tritium cannot be naturally found on Earth due to its radioactive behavior with a half-life of approximately 12 years. So one way to produce tritium is to take advantage of fusion plasma neutrons 
and make them interact with a specific element, in that case, lithium, that is contained in a, in a blanket. So in order to simulate all these processes, neutrons being developed as a deterministic neutron transport solver within the ALIA multiphysics framework, which I will explain later on what ALIA is. And the goal of Neutro is to provide accurate calculations for shielding, tritium breathing, heat transfer, and damage to reactor elements, and assisting in the global analysis of the materials and component design. So the deterministic approach was chosen as it is deemed less expensive in terms of computational demand than other methods, and with the hope of providing a global analysis and complementing other methods, such as the Monte Carlo method. Neutro aims to solve the time-independent Boltzmann transport equation without the fission term, and it's basically represented by four terms. The first one is the leakage of neutrons across the boundary of the volume considered. Then we have the collision term, which represents neutron material interaction, and both terms represent the loss of neutrons. On the right-hand side of the equation, we have the in-scattering term, which takes into account neutrons coming from other directions and energies that are scattered in the direction and energy that we are considering. And finally, we have an external neutron source term. And both terms represent a production of neutrons in the considered volume. So, in this slide, we can see an overview of the equation being solved in neutral. It includes the total macroscopic cross-section and the macroscopic scattering matrix. Both of them are given as an input in neutral and are obtained from evaluated nuclear data files, which are publicly available, and they are pre-processed using an adequate software that allows neutral to read them as an input. In addition, this model, this equation, is based on an integral differential equation where all quantities in, the, in this equation have a dependency, meaning that the neutron transport equation is described by the spatial variable, neutrons energy, and neutrons direction of flight, as I'm indicating in this slide. And each of these variables have a continuous range and therefore need to be discretized for computational calculations. So to do that, the spatial domain is discretized using the finite element method. And this decision allowed Neutro to be developed within ALIA, which is a finite element multiphysics parallel framework that solves partial differential equations in non-structured meshes. And it was created and developed at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. ALIA has a modular structure with each module solving different physical processes. It is designed to solve different physical phenomena in a coupled way in large scale supercomputers, and particularly here in, in Mare Nostrum, which is housed at BSC and accomplishing high parallelism standards and excellent scalability up to 100,000 processes with physics models that are coded and compiled independently in separate modules. And I would just like to mention that all of this has allowed ALIA to be part of six European Union funded centers of excellence in high performance computing where they prepare simulation codes for exascale computing um, in view of supporting scientific progress. So also in the energy spectrum, the multigroup approximation was used. So the energy continuum here is divided into a certain number of bins here represented by the letter G, where each group is considered to have an average energy. So as a consequence of this approximation is that the cross sections remain constant within the range covered by the group. And as I mentioned before, cross sections are obtained through publicly available evaluated nuclear data files or NDF. And we use the free open source enjoy software to parse and retreat the cross sections and energy matrix for each energy group and energy range desired as it is shown in the plot 
for the tungsten and lithium isotopes. So this has to be done for each isotope considered in the material when running calculations in neutral. And in addition, we have developed some ad hoc tools that help us pre-processing this data given by Enjoy and transforming it into a readable format for neutral as an input. So we also have to discretize the phase space to have a finite number of directions in which particles can travel. This is achieved using the discrete ordinates methods, defining a set of directions, each with a relative weight over an angular part that maybe represent as points on the unit sphere. So we can see here in this image. And overall, this means that we have a G by M matrix to be solved for each finite element. And as with any discretization, the level of detail has a direct impact on the computational demand. Also, material anisotropy of the scattering medium is introduced into the scattering kernel using real based expressions for spherical harmonics. Incorporating this approximation with the energy multigroup and discrete ordinates methods, the scattering term is rewritten in this way, where a maximum value of L is chosen to cut the expansion. And in addition, we can see that any value of L greater than zero introduces angular anisotropy in the scattering medium. Otherwise, if L equals zero is chosen, we recover the original expression for the scattering kernel, as we can see in the equation above, and no anisotropy in the medium is introduced in our calculations. So to detail the current state of neutral, I would like to say that we are able to work with three-dimensional domains using unstructured meshes. And this is quite important since the intricate geometry of fusion reactors requires a precise geometrical description, as we can see in the image on the right, which is a representation of a slice of ITER's vacuum vessel. Also, the simulations are time independent and we can apply anisotropic scattering in the medium and anisotropic neutron source at boundaries. These features were previously presented in the second Fusion HPC workshop by one of my colleagues. So I encourage you to check out the talk, which is uploaded in the YouTube channel of this workshop. And also, quite recently, we added three new features to the module. One is the possibility of introducing multiple heterogeneous materials. The second one is the calculation nuclear heating due to neutron material interaction. And the third is coupling neutral with other ALIA modules solving the thermal, mechanical, and neutronic multiphysical behavior. So let's get into the results. And in order to validate neutral, we have tested our code against four classical tests that I will be showing you here. The first that I'm showing is the read test. And the main characteristic of this test is the presence of four highly heterogeneous regions. So we have here, if we look in the graph, a strong absorber represented by R1, followed by a moderate absorber, R2, a void region, R3, and a predominantly scattering medium represented by R4. So the entire first region that I'm showing in this image contains an isotropic source of neutrons and part of the last region that is, uh, if we look at the x-axis from five to six centimeters, contains a weaker isotropic source. So the macroscopic total and scattering cross-sections for each region is indicated in the figure as we can see. And also reflecting boundary conditions are imposed on the left boundary and vacuum boundary conditions on the right. So, in our calculation, we used a two-dimensional domain taking the mid-domain solution for comparison. And we considered three different scenarios for the boundary conditions imposed in the remaining top and bottom boundaries that are shown in the figure. So the first one is the vacuum boundary conditions in both limits in a square domain that is shown in the figure in a continuous black line. Then we have reflecting boundary conditions in both limits in a square domain shown in a discontinuous blue line. And lastly, the length of the domain 
is much larger than its width with either vacuum or reflective boundary conditions on top and bottom, which are far enough to not affect the results and is showed in dotted points. So the second one is the Kofi test, which is another classical case that comprises four regions of varying material properties and alternating zones that have unit sources with areas without sources and differing scattering coefficients, with the last region at the end of the thickness uh, having uh, the highest value, sorry. So as the, with the read case, this test is also designed to analyze over schemes using cross meshes and having strong heterogeneities in the domain. So for this case, vacuum boundary conditions were set for the left and right edges and reflective conditions on top and bottom using SN equal eight for the angular discretization. And the solution is compared with data presented in the literature obtained using the MCMP code, which stands for Monte Carlo and particle uh, code. So it can be seen that there is a good agreement between the results from both codes, showing a small flow, uh, flux sorry, from the left source, decreasing towards the surrounding scattering regions, and a higher flux value from the source on the right, on the region with the highest scattering. The third classical test carried out has been a deep penetration case. So in this type of problem, Neutrons from a source required to permeate deep into the medium before reaching the detector, and thus the detected flux becomes very low. So even though this makes it difficult to give a good numerical simulation, cases such as these are very present in the radiation shielding and neutron detecting field. So if we look at the graph, the solution obtained with neutral is plotted against the results obtained with the MGMCMP 3B code. And our results uh, display a good performance in the entire domain, noting that the range of the flux in the solution varies up to six orders of magnitude. And the last classical test carried out has been a shielding case. So this test is a simplification of a two-dimensional problem in which the domain represents an actual slice of a cylindrical reactor with a source surrounded by a shielding sections of water, iron, and voids, as we can see in this plot. So the boundary at the beginning of the length is set to a reflective condition, and the case involved three energy groups and a scattering matrix up to the third order. So I would like to note that in the original case, the third group, which comprises the lower energies immediately below the iron inelastic threshold, presents convergences, difficulties, and is not considered physical realistic as its cross-sections data does not include any outscattering from these epithermal range. So the results provided by neutral for groups one and two represented by G1 and G2 show a good agreement with those reported in the literature emphasizing the fact that the resulting flux varies eight orders of magnitude. So to further validate neutral, we selected several benchmark cases for testing purposes from SIMBAT. And our particular analysis was based on the set of experiments that took place at the Octavian facility of Osaka University. And to give a summary, uh, this uh, group of tests used hollow spheres with an inner deuterium tritium neutron source with a typical pronounced peak in the range of 14 MeV. So the spheres were made of different materials, such as iron, nickel, aluminum, among others, and with different diameters ranging from 14 to 100 centimeters. And the main purpose of these benchmarks was to study the neutron and gamma ray leakage spectra from the outer surface of the spheres. So as an example, the left-hand side figure presents a comparison between experimental data and calculated leakage values for a silicon sphere of 40 centimeters in diameter. So these cases were simulated using constructed meshes comprised of linear tetaedra, using 59 groups to divide the energy spectrum and an angular discretization using discontinued, uh, discontinued sorry, finite elements. If we look in the right-hand side figure, 
we have plotted a summary of seven of the cases studied with neutro and comparing the numerical results for leakage with the measured data. There are several points in the plot for each case comprising the 59 groups used for the energy spectrum. And although a few of the results display some dispersion at certain points in the energy range, it can be seen that almost all of them, more precisely the 95% of them, fall within the 10% error lines. And the ongoing development and improvement of the neutral module aims at reducing precisely the number of points that these are the parts of each leakage curve that are farther from the ideal result. So to continue advancing the evaluation of the effectiveness of the neutral module, we have performed simulations of a 3D layer of one by 1.5 meters with a thickness of 20 centimeters for different materials. A neutron source of 14 MeV was established on one end of the thickness with the vacuum boundary condition on the opposite face. So the four remaining edges were set to a reflective boundary condition. The energy spectrum ranged from approximately eight kilo, kilo electron volts to 14 MeV and discretized in 59 energy groups. And also the angular discretization used was set to Sn equals six. Also, the cross-section data was obtained using ENJOY from the FENDEL 3.1 database, which stands for Fusion Evaluated Nuclear Data Library. The results are compared against analogous ones obtained with the MCMP code, which has been established as the industry standard in nuclear fusion simulations. So as an example, on the left-hand side, the plot shown in this slide, include the leakage as a function of the energy on the vacuum boundary opposite to the source of the figure and as neutron flux profile through the thickness of the domain on the right hand side using an approximation of a steel as a material. So even though there might be some dispersion in the results, for example, in the leakage toward the lower end of the spectrum, it can be appreciated that the values provided by neutral are generally in good agreement with those obtained uh, via Monte Carlo simulations. So finally, uh, we have made comparison, uh, comparisons between the average volumetric heat calculated by neutral and that of MCMP. And I want to remark that these calculations are very important due to the fact that when neutrons interact with the surrounding materials, secondary neutrons, gamma rays, and charged particles may be created. And target nucleides are knocked on potentially causing all of them to move within the material, slowing down and losing kinetic energy by exchanging it into thermal energy. And they are also important because fusion reactor components, such as the first wall, breathing blankets, diverters, and superconduct superconductive magnets, are restricted to a certain range given that the temperatures must be controlled. So for example, in the case of tritium breathing blankets, and uncontrolled heating could compromise the production of tritium required to fuel the reaction when neutrons interact with lithium. So this phenomena is often described using kinetic energy release in material coefficients or kerma coefficients such that the heating rate is the product of the flux and kerma coefficients. And these coefficients are provided by the ENJOY software. So the results obtained with this new future implemented in Neutro are shown in the plot, where we compare the average volumetric heat of the whole domain obtained with Neutro and MCMP. And even though the results for some materials fall below the DL line, it can be seen that all of them are within the 10% region. So the deviations, I would like to point out the deviations may be due to the Kerma coefficients being slightly underestimated by Enjoy when considering only the kinematic energy depositions of source neutrons that are originated outside the domain. We have also performed calculations simulating a rectangular section of the first wall tritium breathing blanket from DEMO, which is made of tritium lead enclosed in Eurofer steel. And this is part of a collaboration with UNED University located in Madrid. So the left-hand side figure shows a comparison between the heat generated in the domain by neutrons and the right gamma photons using neutral and MCMP. 
So we can see that neutro reproduces the change in slope when there is a transition to one material to another, as it does with MCMP. And the right hand side figure shows a comparison of the neutron flux through the thickness of the domain between neutro and Monte Carlo code. And it displays a good agreement when compared to the reference neutronic code. So the variation near the source uh, is due to a higher neutronic flux regarding the neutron's energy source, meaning that a higher Kerma values are obtained for the higher energy. So regarding HPC scalability, using re uh, mesh refinement and mesh partition methods, which are part of the features that Alia offers to users, the scalability of neutro was studied when running in a SOPA computer here in Mare Nostrum. So in the plot, we have two instances of the same case, except for the number of elements and the number of computing nodes that were used. So to put you in some content, context about the computational demand of these calculations, the simulation used linear tetrahedral mesh with SN equal 12 quadrature and 59 energy groups. This means that for each element, G times M equations need to be solved. And if we take as an example, a mesh with 624,000 elements, this leads to an order of six billions of calculations in total. So in the graphic can be seen that the case with 78,000 elements, which is plotted in black, reaches a 95% efficiency with 256 processes. And on the other hand, in blue, we have the same case with almost one order of magnitude more of elements and show some degradation due to the overhead required for the communication between the processes, reaching an 82% efficiency with 1,024 processes and 70% efficiency with uh, 2,048 processes. So the implemented parallelization strategy is the main secondary technique with the main processes uh, in charge of distributing the data and the communication and the secondary threads performing the calculations using the message passing interface or MPI. So um, to improve the HPC aspect, uh, we are currently working on, on process placement schemes in computational nodes to reduce communication overhead, as well as working on including shared memory parallelization schemes with OpenMP. So the current and future work with Neutro involves calculating the tritium produ production from neutron interaction with breathing blankets, as well as further validation of heating due to neutron radiation interaction with materials. And one of the most important goals in which we are currently putting our efforts is the coupling of Neutro with other alias physics modules, such as the thermohydraulic and select some validation cases to test the coupling with the eventual hope of solving the thermal, mechanical, and neutronic behavior in one simulation at the same time. To conclude the presentation, we have a neutron transport solver integrated within the ALIA ecosystem, which allows to adapt to both the needs of our group and the surrounding organizations. The goal is to create a tool to contribute to future design studies such as DEMO, I explained that we are able to handle composite and alloy materials in 3D domains with instructed meshes, as we showed. We have also validated our results against four classical tests. We have also compared neutral against several SIMBAD experimental benchmarks. We have also included heat due to neutron radiation, and it has been integrated in our code, and we would like to further validate heat calculations. We have also compared neutral against the standard neutronics code or MCMP, showing a good agreement overall between them. Also, the code shows good scalability, but we are planning on further improvements, as I explained before. And as a next steps, we would like to expand the set of features, such as treating production and multiphysics couplings, in which we are currently working on. So thank you all very much for your attention.
Thank you, Marty, for your presentation. Um, well, we, we have the first question of Ama Khan. Uh, Ama, when you, when you want. Oh, hi. Uh, so, Rochelle, thank you so much. Um, it was really, really good. I really enjoyed listening. Um, I had one question, which is that, um, so, <laughs> sorry, I should, have, I should have thought about it. Um, what makes neutral um, more useful than using like MCNP or like when would you use that? Like, hmm, yeah, like why would you use that over something else? Like what makes it a little bit, or okay. yeah, or when would you use it okay. over? So for example, if you compare to a stochastic uh, code such as MCMP, mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have to keep in mind that uh, MCMP is a stochastic method, which means that keeps track of every particle that is uh, considered in the input. Mm -hmm. And this has, when we have uh, such a vast source of neutrons, such as infusion reactions, this has a high demanding computational cost. Right, so, okay. So for example, with neutro, we define uh, a neutron source, and then all we have to do is discretize mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 variable, the variables that are discretized and then integrate for all these variables uh, and which also another important feature is that neutral is developed within ALIA and has the capability to be coupled with other modules to simulate multi-physics uh, uh, behavior, sorry, such as happens in fusion reactors. Right, cool, awesome, thank you. Thank you and good much. luck with uh, all the other next steps. Thank you. Well, thanks, Arma. Uh, we have another question of Yol Palermo. Yol, whenever you want. Yes, I'm Yole Palermo. Yole, from, Yole. Yes, from CMAT. I'm uh, the head of the Breathing Blanket Unit in uh, Fusion National Laboratory. Uh, thank you, Marty, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm very surprised because I'm not aware of uh, uh, your work. Also, I understand inside the Eurofusion, maybe, or in ITER project, uh, maybe. And so I, I would like to have some more information about the framework maybe of this line of activity, uh, if it is inside Eurofair, Eurofusion. And then I would like to uh, know about uh, more um, complicated geometry, if you should uh, optimize, for example, the meshes uh, in the boundary between two different layers, or you can use um, just one, uh, sides of the meshes or what happens for example when you have a mesh that uh, catch two different materials inside something like the things that occur in unstructured mesh in MCMP thanks okay so uh could you please repeat the, the first question sorry no the first is the framework I don't know if oh, okay. this is an, inside the uh, okay, Eurofusion okay. or ITER program because I, I have seen that you mentioned UNED University, that is uh, our link to party in uh, uh, also in uh, a refusion task mm. in neutronics. So I don't know if uh, this activity is inside uh, one of these projects, maybe. Uh, I wouldn't like to uh, lie to you, but I think it is. And regarding this second question, uh, yes, refinement mesh is a, a quite important uh, topic, and and when 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 using uh, different materials, but uh, here in 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 neutro, what what we do is define uh, multiple heterogeneous material each with uh, each isotope composition, and we define that in the input, in the input files. Okay, and another question, uh, how much time uh, do you spend in uh, a simulation standard, in a standard simulation, for example, a uh, typical comparison between an MCMP and a neutral simulation? What could be the difference in time? Okay, okay. So, uh, really we haven't performed such computational demanding um, calculations with MCMP, but what I've personally tested is that when you try to introduce um, a lot of particles with MCMP, 
there's a certain point with uh, when uh, when neutro takes advantage of the deterministic uh, nature and 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 in terms of computational demand or spending uh, time uh, is is better to to say better than 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 MCMP code. Okay, thank you very much, and good luck for next thank step. You. Well, uh, thanks for the questions. I think, thanks, Marty. Um, I think that we we can pass to the to the next presentation in charge of Estiliano Barutis. Estiliano, yeah. Hello. you, can are, you hear me? I can hear you very well. Very good. Okay. May May yeah. I share my screen? Please. Yeah. Thank you. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Whenever very you good. want. Okay. So, um, thank you very much for uh, for this opportunity to present uh, our work in this uh, HPC workshop. Um, on behalf of my colleagues, I would like to to present uh, the work which is related to deterministic and stochastic modeling of uh, particle exhaust in the subdiverter region of W7X. So a short outline of my presentation is the following. So first I'm going to talk about the particle exhaust. I will describe the particle exhaust system of W7X. Um, then uh, I will describe the numerical model of the low iota section. I will talk about, uh, I will make a very short introduction to the Boltzmann equation and um, the DIPCAS code that uh, we have developed in order to uh, model um, uh, neutral gas dynamics uh, in the subdiverter area. Uh, I will talk about the two solvers of the DIPCAS code, uh, namely the solver uh, related to, to the deterministic solver, um, uh, which is based on the discrete velocity method, and the stochastic model, which is based uh, as, um, the stochastic solver, which is based on the direct simulation Monte Carlo method. Um, uh, I will present uh, the numerical results, and then I will close with some conclusions. So the particle exhaust of W7X um, is shown in the left-hand side uh, or, or figure. So here uh, we have the, 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 the plasma area. Uh, so here we have the, um, uh, the, the plasma chamber, the plasma hits uh, the targets, the two targets, um, the charged particles are neutralized and they start to penetrate the subdiverter area uh, through the pumping gap and they flow uh, behind the, the diverter uh, targets and baffles. Uh, and uh, some of them, either they are flowing towards uh, the pumps through the pumping uh, duct, or um, uh, partic neutral particles are coming uh, through in the, in the plasma chamber through the uh, leakages, um, uh, which can be found um, on the diverter targets and, and baffles. So the main objective actually is to model uh, the, the area uh, uh, of the subdiverter and to um, and to calculate all the fluxes or all the neutral fluxes which are uh, going through the individual uh, leakages, uh, poroid, uh, toroidal and poloidal uh, leakages, and to see the influence of the leakages on the pumping efficiency. Now, the um, uh, in the, the vacuum system of um, of W seven X uh, consists of uh, two um, uh, of two sections: the low iota section and the high iota section. And um, uh, the low iota section uh, has two turbo molecular pumps, while the high iota section has one turbo molecular pump. Or uh, in the current, in the present work, I will focus only on the low iota section and um, and the modeling uh, uh, and the two D modeling of, of this um, of the geometry. Now, here uh, in this problem, we consider a gas hydrogen which enters um, in the subdiverter area with uh, with a given temperature of six hundred Kelvin. Uh, the temperature of the targets um, and baffles is considered to be four hundred Kelvin, while the vacuum vessel uh, has a temperature of three, uh, almost three hundred Kelvin. Um, the, the neutral particles which penetrate the subdiverter area, um, the, the flux of these uh, neutral particles ranges between 10 to the 20, 10 to the 22, uh, and for us is an open parameter, since this information um, uh, uh, should come uh, from, a, from a plasma code. 
Um, uh, additionally, in the in the in the in, in the pumping ports, um, and especially in the position uh, where we denote here uh, as D, um, uh, exactly at this surface, we impose a capture coefficient, um, uh, which is a uh, which depends on the on the effective pumping speed at that position, and this effect, effective speed uh, has been calculated uh, taking into account the nominal speed, the, no, the nominal pumping speed of the pumps, as well as the conductance of the pipes uh, which uh, connect the turbo pumps and um, uh, the, the surface D and the position D. Now, uh, as I said before, uh, the uh, the idea is to model uh, to take a two D cut um, uh, exactly at this position, uh, which where we have the the lower yeto section. So we take a two D cut, and if, uh, and uh, the from the the complete three D um, starting from the complete three D uh, CATIA file. And the 2D cut which um, we obtain is uh, is shown here. So uh, in these 2D cuts, um, uh, all the individual uh, uh, poloidal leakages are are present. Uh, we have uh, the pumping surface where uh, we have we impose a capture coefficient psi. Um, then we have the pumping cap panel. Uh, we have the pumping cap where the, the neutrons penetrate the subterranean area. And um, the idea, actually, as I said in the beginning, is to calculate the whole flow field, uh, all the macroscopic uh, parameters of practical interest, as well as all the, uh, the fluxes which go through the um, individual leakages. Um, uh, the the capture coefficient which is imposed on the on the on the pumping surface T takes values from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5, and uh, this shows the pumping intensity. So 0 0.1 uh, means uh, low uh, pumping efficiency, 0 0.5 means uh, high pumping efficiency. Here on the right hand side you see a, a cartoon where the particles are introduced and they start to flow inside the subdiverter um, area. Now, in order to, to, to model this problem, um, uh, uh, the Boltzmann, uh, the main equation which uh, describes uh, the flow um, in the whole range of, of the gas collisionality is the Boltzmann equation. Uh, the Boltzmann equation uh, on the left-hand side uh, has uh, the streaming, uh, actually uh, has a term which describes the, the streaming motion of the, of the particles. Um, uh, while on the on the right hand, si hand side we have the the term which describes the collisions, the intermolecular collisions uh, between the the particles. Um, since the the, inter the 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 collision term is quite complicated, usually we uh, di di we substitute this um, uh, complex term with um, uh, uh, more simplified uh, terms, which are called kinetic models, and uh, in the literature. Um, uh, uh, known uh, popular kinetic models are the BTK model or the Sakov model. Um, uh, so the Boltzmann equation is valid in the whole range of the gas collisionality, and the gas collisionality is described from uh, by the Knudsen number. So, to, so the Knudsen number is is equal to the ratio of the mean free path over a, over a characteristic length um, of the problem. So the uh, small values of Knudsen number means that we are in the continuum regime. Uh, large values of Knudsen number we are uh, in the in the in the free molecular regime where we do not assume collisions between uh, particles. So in order to solve the Boltzmann equation, we can apply two different uh, numerical methods. The deterministic method, which is based on the discrete velocity method, and the stochastic uh, uh, approach, which is based on the direct simulation model Carlo method. Um, these two um, these two solvers uh, are included in the in the DIVCAS uh, code, which has been developed at um, at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, the idea actually of DIVCAS is to uh, to use it in order to solve the Boltzmann equation. Um, and uh, this code conserves the momentum and energy as well as um, it estimates correct transport coefficients. The advantages between and disadvantages between the two uh, numerical methods um, uh, which uh, reproduce the Boltzmann equation are the following. So the, in the case of TVM, of the, of the discrete velocity method, which, uh, as we said, the deterministic method, um, this method is uh, free of statistical noise. We have a very good co convergence uh, in slow flows. 
um, uh, it is possible to, to use uh, special um, techniques in order to, to simplify the equations and uh, uh, to make them um, easier to, to, to be solved numerically. Um, it is simple to use for unsteady flows um, and um, it, it is uh, also simple to implement MPI or open MPI open MP techniques. Um, the disadvantage of DSMC is that it is difficult to use uh, for complex geometries and um, uh, more complex than gener uh, generalization of these methods uh, in the case of polyatomic gas and gas mixtures um, uh, requires a, a big effort. Now, if we compare it with the DSMC, uh, which is the Zohasic or solver of, um, of, uh, of the DIVGAS code, here we see the, the advantages. So um, it's an accurate simulation uh, of non-equilibrium uh, gas flows and actually is uh, quite um, popular in, uh, in, the, in the community of rarefied gas dynamics. Um, it is simple to use for complex geometries. Um, it is um, very simple to, to, to generalize and to include even more physics inside. Um, and uh, it can be combined with, uh, with other methods in order to create hybrid codes. The, advantage, the disadvantage of TSMC is that uh, it has a statistical, uh, uh, statistical noise. And uh, in order to, to reduce the statistical noise, we have to, uh, to do um, uh, I mean, uh, sampling. Uh, and uh, this sampling increases the computational cost. Uh, in the case of, um, of, of slow flows, we, um, we have slow convergence rate. And um, uh, the, in the, it is very expensive, uh, computationally expensive in the case of unsteady flows. Uh, this, uh, uh, th this work that I'm going to present here actually uh, describes uh, the, 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 uh, the differences uh, or describes uh, the implementation of uh, the DVM and the, D and the DSMC method in solving, in modeling the, the, the W7X uh, subdiverter. Um, uh, I will uh, present, I will not present details on the discrete velocity method. More details can be found in the following, um, in the following uh, talk by, uh, by my colleague, Christos Tantos, which, uh, who, who is going to, to present in more detail um, uh, the, um, uh, the discrete velocity method. Um, uh, uh, model the discrete velocity method. So uh, here I will uh, I will focus on the direct simulation Monte Carlo method, so the, the stochastic solver of DSMC, and uh, just to give you uh, an idea of the algorithm. So here we have the the flow uh, through um, uh, over a sphere. So the idea is that we divide the uh, the, the domain in in, in grid uh, in cells. Uh, we distribute particles uh, inside our grid. Um, uh, then uh, we uh, include or we, we, insert, we insert particles from uh, uh, the, the open boundaries. Um, then we uh, uh, move the particles uh, in a given time step. Then uh, we perform any interaction of particles with uh, solid surfaces. Uh, then uh, we uh, sort the, part the particles uh, into cells. Actually, we rename the particles whenever the particles have, have moved in another cell. Uh, we perform, um, uh, we count uh, quantities in, in each cell. And, and then we, um, uh, we model the collisions between the particles um, by calculating the post-collision velocities. If we want to see the speed up for the speed up uh, of um, the, uh, the DSMC solver of Divgas, so here you can see that um, a good scalability is observed. Um, the code is written in C++, and uh, at the moment it's being used. Uh, it has been uh, it, it has been already tested, and it's being used in different uh, HPCs. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, the the code performs reasonably well for both increase in load and increase in number of MPI tasks. Now let me go to the to the numerical results and uh, let me describe uh, the numerical parameters which were used um, in both uh, numerical methods. So in the case of DVM and DSMC, we used the same uh, the same grid. In the case of uh, of the of DVM, we used uh, seven hundred eighty four um, uh, uh, molecular velocities. 
Um, in the case of TSMC, we used, um, since uh, it's a particle-based particle method, the number of model particles is, is of the order of 80 millions. And uh, the time step in TVM and in TSMC is a 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 7, respectively. So the DVM method uh, solves uh, the trans and PTK kinetic equation. Um, uh, and it is uh, based on the velocity space de uh, decomposition technique. And uh, the, um, the DVM needs uh, 500,000 uh, iterations for convergence, while the DSMC needs uh, almost 10 million uh, iterations for convergence. Now, uh, both, uh, if we compare the, the pump flux, uh, for DVM and DSMC, in the case of open leakages and closed and closed leakages, uh, and for different uh, capture coefficients, you are going to see that uh, a very good agreement between the two numerical methods is achieved. Um, this um, this agreement is of the order of one percent. Um, in the case of, of W7X. Now, uh, similar behavior has been observed also in the case um, of DEMO. Um, uh, these references can be found um, uh, here at the bottom, um, uh, a work which has been done by Christos Tavros. Now, if we want to compare the, um, the pressure distribution in the subdiverter area between DVM and DSMC, we will see that uh, very small differences uh, are observed, but in general, um, uh, a, a very good agreement uh, is, ob is, um, is obtained between the two, the, the, the two uh, methods. So here, uh, I don't want to, uh, to invest uh, uh, more time. Um, what I would like to, um, uh, to present next is the uh, influence of, um, of incoming neutral flux gamma in, um, in, uh, uh, the, in, the, in the fluxes through the individual leakages. So here uh, we have two different values of the, of the incoming particle flux in the subdiverter area. And um, here we have the percentage of, uh, of flux uh, of the incoming flux, uh, which goes through the individual leakages. So here you, we see the following, that in, in both cases, um, the biggest part uh, um, of uh, incoming flux goes back to the plasma chamber, while uh, a small part um, of a few percent uh, are going to the pump. Now, of course, in the, uh, in the, in the individual leakages, um, we see uh, some, uh, I mean, we see some particles are going through uh, and uh, we, uh, we can identify that uh, leakages 1, 2 and 10 are the, are the leakages or, or even 6 are the leakages uh, which can, uh, which actually um, influence the overall particle balance in the subdiverter uh, area. Now, if we, um, uh, if we see the influence of the capture coefficient, um, so here we keep the, the incoming particle flux constant and we change the, the, pumping, the pumping intensity, then we see that uh, by increasing uh, the pumping intensity, we see that the outflux uh, uh, decreases. So the, the, the flux which goes back to the plasma chamber uh, decreases, while the pump flux uh, increases as well. Um, uh, of course, there's a, a non-linear uh, dependence between the increase of Xi and uh, the increase of, of pump flux. Um, in general, of course, uh, as Xi increases, uh, the pump flux increases and the, and the outflux decreases. Uh, now, uh, in the case that we, um, uh, we compare the, um, uh, so here we, we, we compare the, the case where all the leakages are open and all the leakages are closed. So um, for, 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 for a given uh, Xi, for a given capture coefficient equal to 0 0.1, and for a given incoming particle flux uh, through the pumping cup, we obtain the following. So we see that uh, by closing the, 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 the leakages, the, 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 the poloidal leakages, we see an increase in the pump flux, in the, in, uh, an increase in the outflux. Um, this is an increase um, of, uh, one point, of a factor 1.1, but we see also an increase of the pump flux um, by a factor of 1.5. So uh, this means that uh, if we manage to uh, to seal and uh, and to um, uh, to close uh, uh, most of the uh, individual uh, poloidal leakages, this will help uh, to increase the uh, the pumping efficiency of uh, of the diverter of the sub uh, This brings me actually to to the conclusions of this work. 
Uh, so uh, the main message that I would like to, to convey is that um, the DFCAS code is a reliable tool which can uh, which can be used in mo in modeling neutral gas dynamics uh, in the particle exhaust of a stellarator uh, and of course of a uh, of a tokamak. Um, the DFCAS code consists of two different solvers: the deterministic one and the stochastic one. The deterministic uh, uh, is based on the discrete velocity method, and the stochastic uh, is based on the direct simulation Monte Carlo method. Um, both uh, both solvers uh, uh, in the case of the uh, 2D low IOTA configuration of W7X uh, have a very good agreement uh, um, and discrepancies of the order of 1%. Uh, in general, we uh, observe the following: that um, the higher the incoming neutral fluxes, then uh, uh, the, um, uh, the the higher the the pump flux uh, which is uh, obtained, and also uh, the lower uh, um, the uh, the out flux, uh, namely the flux which goes back to the plasma. So this means that uh, higher incoming neutral fluxes facilitate um, uh, the pump, uh, the increase um, to, of the pumping of the pumping efficiency. Um, the the closure of the polar leakages um, it is seen that the. Uh, it, uh, it facilitates the, the increase of the pump flux uh, as well as the, uh, the, the neutral outflux towards the plasma. And uh, all these um, uh, above numerical findings uh, could be used in order to optimize uh, the pumping efficiency of the, w, of the W7X particle exhaust. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, in case of uh, any questions, I would be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Estiliano. Uh, it's time to question. Uh, maybe I will check the chat. Yeah. Uh, I, I I have a, a question uh, for you. Is is relating to the computer time used by the, the both methods? You, you compare deterministic and stochastic. Mm -hmm. it, it, more or less, which is more demanding on computing, or more or less the same? Or I don't know in the condition that you use. Yeah, uh, no, uh, the, the answer is clear in this case. Um, uh, much faster is the, uh, is the, the deterministic method. Uh, the reason is that um, in the stochastic, uh, as I uh, said before, uh, in the stochastic uh, method, uh, we have statistical noise. And in order to reduce the statistical noise, we have to have uh, uh, more iterations. So this, uh, this increases the computational effort. On the other hand, of course, DVM does not need uh, any sampling or any reduce of, um, of uh, statistical noise because uh, the method uh, intrinsically does not have any uh, statistical noise. So the answer is that the DVM is a bit faster than the DSMC. Perfect. I love your, your answer. <laughs> because I, I from the deterministic uh, codes then. <laughs> Yeah, okay. it's, uh, it's uh, you know, both methods have advantages and disadvantages for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but in terms of computational time, uh, here we have to be honest. Perfect. Okay, thanks very much uh, to you. you. And, and I think it's time to pass to the next uh, presentation. Hello. How are you, Maria? I'm good, thank you. I'll be sharing my screen. Per perfect. I hope you can all see my screen. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, hi, everyone. Today I will be presenting part of my ongoing PhD work on the mathematical and computational simulation for plasma <laughs> physics. This project is under the supervision of Steve Milmer and Nikos Nikiforakis at the University of Cambridge and in collaboration with Tokamak Energy. Tokamak Energy is a nuclear fusion energy company. Uh, and their approach is to combine uh, spherical compact tokamaks with high temperature superconducting magnets to achieve improved confinement at a lower cost. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the SC40 device, which is uh, the tokamak that they're currently using for op operational purposes. And at this point, I just want to draw your attention on the red boundary, which uh, outlines the confinement vessel of the SC40 device, which is the shape that you're going to see later in this presentation. Uh, we're still a long way from using these devices for commercial purposes, uh, which is why there is a lot of room for research. Uh, but of course, running real-life experiments is uh, very challenging, which is why simulations are very important. 
Uh, of course, it's not very easy to do simulations of these kinds of devices because as I'm sure you all know, there's a lot of complex physics taking place at a wide range of spatial and temporal scales. Some events are very fast, others are very slow, and they can all interact in nonlinear ways with each other. And to top it all off, it's all happening in this very complex geometry. Of course, there's a lot of codes out there who, which are doing a great job in helping us understand what's happening inside these reactors, uh, but they do have certain limitations. Uh, one way to simplify the system is by using single physics modeling to separate the scales. And then people try to integrate the physics back together by means of co-simulation. Of course, when you're doing that, you're bound to miss out on some of the important physics, especially those who are related to non-linearities. And one of the more traditional ways to discretize space is by using coordinate transformation, which can be a big bottleneck for simulations. Our approach is quite different and it's uh, more similar to latest advancements in the field, which focus on integrated simulations. So our overarching goal is to have these integrated simulations using multi-material and multi matter interface capturing methodologies in a Cartesian frame of reference and by using a hierarchical adaptive measure refinement both in space and time that should help us uh, overcome the problem of desperate length and time scales. When it comes to my specific project, uh, my goal is to integrate the three regions that you, that you can see on the figure, namely the plasma, the vacuum, and the wall. So here is the underlying formulation for the following simulations. Um, as I have said, I'm modeling the plasma, and for that I'm solving the resistive MHD equations accounting for ohmic dissipation. And I also want to model the confinement vessel as a resistive wall, therefore I'm also defining um, an evolution equation for the magnetic field inside the wall, which now depends on the resistivity of the wall itself. Very briefly, our framework, we want to use solve the equations in their conservative form using a finite volume approach because that allows us to respect the mathematical properties of the system under consideration. And it also uh, allows for weak solutions. We generate our mesh in a, on a Cartesian grid uh, because that provides a lot of advantages when we're working with complex geometries. And we use uh, adaptive mesh refinement uh, to make sure that we have enough resolution in regions of high interest to be able to capture all the relevant physics. Uh, when we do that, though, we're not reinventing the wheel. You, we use uh, the already existing package of AMREX, which uh, provides all the functionality to write uh, highly parallel and adaptive measure refinement applications, uh, which also ensures that our simulations won't run forever. And we also incorporate material boundary conditions by using state-of-the-art sharp and or diffuse interface methods because we recognize that if we're trying to capture all the physics involved, we need to take into consideration the properties of all the materials instead of just uh, simply treating them as uh, boundary conditions. Uh, so as I have already mentioned, my objective is to integrate the plasma, the vacuum, and the wall, which is a significant departure from current segregated solutions. And of course, this is not very easy, which is why we're gonna turn our attention uh, uh, at interactions into phases, which require special treatment. And in this case, of course, that has to be the plasma vacuum interaction at the plasma vacuum interface. So when we're uh, developing our model, we want to make sure that our underlying solvers are capable of capturing the correct wave behavior. And in the presence of vacuum, ordinary single material codes usually fail to do that because the continuity assumption that we make in the first place is no longer a valid description of the physics involved. Usually a commonly adopted approach is to model vacuum using a low density approximation. However, when you do that, you assume the wrong wave configuration, uh, which could be result to unphysical flows. And that's definitely what we do not want when we're trying to understand a physical system, uh, which is why an important development uh, of my work was to modify the system of the equations to enable realistic and physically consistent simulations of vacuum. And for this reason, we go back to the basics and we consider one dimensional vacuum movement problems uh, to demonstrate that we are indeed capable of capturing the, way, uh, the correct wave structure. So the first step was to develop an exact Riemann solver for MHD. Um, and here you can see the solution produced for a standard MHD Riemann, Riemann problem that consists of seven waves, just to demonstrate that we are indeed capturing all of the waves. And, the, and then uh, the next step was to basically modify the, um, the solver so that it could deal with the initial state involving a vacuum state. 
Uh, here you can see the exact solution produced for a plasma vacuum ribbon problem uh, at different uh, magnetic field strengths. Uh, we're capturing two rare fractions, a fast and a slow one, as well as the contact wave between uh, at the plasma vacuum interface, which is what we would expect. So now that we have an exact solution, we can uh, benchmark our numerical, uh, our numerical method and build confidence in our, in our approach. Uh, so we move on to the numerical method. In order to be able to capture the interaction between the plasma and the vacuum, we implement a novel diffuse interface method, which was developed by Tim Wallace, which is also a member in our lab. His method is based on uh, flux modifiers and interface setting routines. And it has proven to be capable of uh, modeling uh, true region, uh, regions of true vacuum. I will not go into the details of the method in the interest of time, but uh, the basics, we basically need to introduce an additional variable, which is the void volume fraction variable. And it basically defines uh, the amount of uh, vacuum in each cell in our computational domain. Here are more uh, details on the algorithm, which I will skip. And I will go straight into the validation. So I considered three different test cases to validate our numerical solution against uh, the exact solutions that we were able to produce. And I will only show results for the last case, which involves a magnetized fluid expanding into a magnetized void. And it corresponds to the exact solution that I've shown you earlier. Uh, so here are the results. We plot the numerical solution against the exact solution for different resolutions to demonstrate convergence. And in the second and fourth plots, we can see zoomed in versions of the density and the Y component of the magnetic field around the plasma vacuum interface. Uh, we observe good agreement, but of course there are discrepancies. Uh, we need to keep in mind, however, that this is a very stringent test. Uh, these are very severe initial conditions. The left state is equal to unity, whereas the right state is equal to zero. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, none of the uh, existing solvers in the literature can perform as well uh, under these uh, conditions. Uh, at the same time, we do not expect to encounter discontinuities of this uh, nature inside a tokamak reactor, uh, which is why these discrepancies are, are not of, of a big concern. Uh, so now that we have a way to model the, uh, to capture the interaction between the plasma vacuum interface, we want to add a model for our wall. And as a first approximation, we're gonna treat that as a rigid body which means that we're not gonna discretize in that part of the domain. And we're going to capture the interaction using a Riemann rigid body goals fluid method with perfectly conductive boundary conditions for the magnetic field. Uh, in order to demonstrate that we can um, model all the different regions in a single computational domain, we set up this toy problem. We put some plasma in the middle of the ST40 device. We surround that uh, by vacuum, which corresponds to the blue region uh, in these uh, figures and we enclose that within the SC40 geometry and we allow the plasma to expand into the void and get reflected by the walls of the SC40. Uh, here you can see how we generate our mesh. We use a Cartesian grid and then we add uh, patches of AMR in regions of high interest, including high gradient regions, as well as material boundary conditions, uh, as, well, as well as material boundary, sorry. And uh, those levels of AMR can, uh, can evolve independently, both in space and time as you can see in the simulation right here. So it's a very fast simulation, but you can basically see uh, the plasma expanding into the vacuum and then getting reflected uh, by the wall. Uh, moving on. So now that we have a basic model for our, uh, for our rigid body, we want to take it a step further and also consider the electromagnetic properties of the wall. And this is now when the equation that I've shown at the very beginning becomes important. Uh, so in order to demonstrate what the, the effects of the resistive wall, we consider the cylindrical equilibrium test. Here you can see the initial conditions. We have the density, so we have some dense plasma in the middle of this circular container surrounded by low density plasma. And then we also have uh, the initial conditions for the three components of the magnetic field. Uh, we apply uh, this perturbation uh, and then we observe what happens after we evolve the system for a certain amount of time. So we perform the same simulation using two different boundary conditions at the location of the interface between the plasma and our container. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have perfectly conductive boundary conditions. And on the right-hand side, we have resistive boundary conditions. And we can see how the different boundary condition affects the flow of the plasma within the container. Uh, here we show the Z component of the magnetic field. Uh, and in the resistive case, we can see how the magnetic fields also evolve inside the wall. 
the same test was performed within the SC40 geometry just to demonstrate that we can deal with complex geometries. Uh, and again, we can see how we have these more uh, uh, variations uh, in the flow of the plasma within uh, the, the vessel when we do take into consideration the properties of the material. Here is the video of the previous simulation. So we basically have some dense plasma again in the middle of the device. We apply the perturbation. Uh, that moves towards the wall diagonally upwards. It gets reflected by the wall. And once the perturbation reaches the wall, we have all these magnetic fields which uh, propagate inside the wall and affect the flow of the plasma uh, on the inside of the container. Uh, moving on, how do we know that our resistive wall model is uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing? Uh, we consider this validation test case. This test case was taken uh, from a paper by Ferrari et al, uh, which was on wall instabilities. Again, we have uh, the similar situation to before, but now in three dimensions, we have some dense plasma in the middle, surrounded by low density plasma and enclosed within this cylindrical ring. And the rest of the computational domain is filled with void. We apply a perturbation along the Z and the radial directions. And here on the right-hand side, you can see how that equilibrium evolves after we apply the perturbation. And on the plot on the left-hand side, we can see the stability analysis. So we basically uh, study how the instability grows for different wall radii and different wall resistivities. Uh, so the growth rate uh, is being plotted uh, for different wall radii, and you can see how as the wall radius increases, the growth rate increases because the stabilizing of effect of the wall is reduced. And similarly for the different resistivities, as the wall resistivity decreases, the growth rate also increases because again, the stabilizing effect of the wall is reduced. So to wrap it all up very quickly, uh, we are making progress towards the development of a fully integrated model for whole system simulations. We are considering alternative methodologies to include uh, material boundary conditions to model the vacuum vessel and to also take into account the electromagnetic properties of the wall. And these methods have not been traditionally used uh, in this specific field. Uh, however, there are a lot more things to be done in order to have uh, the full system and the full model. Um, we can always add more physics. Uh, right now, I'm simply solving the resistive MHD equations. Uh, but we can consider an additional sources. We can also consider the multi-species system. Uh, in addition to the electromagnetic properties of the wall, we can also uh, take into account the elastoplastic properties of the wall, which will allow us to, to compute heat loads on the diverter. And uh, the final end goal is to be able to use this model to study uh, instabilities and unstable events such as vertical displacement events. Uh, I hope this has given you a good idea of what this project is about, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, you, you talk very fast. <laughs> I admire the, 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 a lot of words, but, but very clear. Eh? It's not, uh, Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, there are a question of Ama Khan, Ama, whenever you want. Uh, hi. Uh, so, well done, Maria. I could tell that you had a lot to say, and that's why you're like rushing to get through it all. But you did really, really well for the time. So, good job. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. So, one of them is I wrote it down. I'm just gonna look. Uh, yeah, in the beginning of your slide, you said that um, coordinate transformation causes bottlenecks um, in code. So, I wanted to ask you why. So basically coordinate transformation, uh, you generate the mesh according to the magnetic field lines. So your mesh is aligned with the magnetic field lines. Every time those change, you have to generate your mesh again. Oh. So this is why it takes longer and it's okay. uh, expensive. Right. When you have a Cartesian grid and everything is on that, then you don't need to generate your mesh every time. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and the second thing I want to ask you is, can you flip back to the slide that you skipped about the um, your yeah. algorithm. So yeah. Did, yeah, cool. Just so, just so I could read it while someone else asks. Yes. When someone else asks their questions, I could just be like reading it in the background. So sure. thank you. No worries. Uh, I will see if there are a question in the chat. I have a, a question myself. The, what is the, the CPU time using in this simulation? For example, one of the you show the, the movies. So 
those are relatively uh, quick simulations, I would say about 20 or a half an hour. Uh, when we are considering like um, a simulation that involves uh, two materials, uh, AMR, um, yeah. And, and and you are using some kind of some kind of parallelization. Yeah, everything is parallelized. But I'm running on like uh, my laptop uh, on four four cores. Oh, okay, okay, four cores. Yeah. It's, it's, it's relatively fast. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. Well, I see that there are no more questions for you. Well, thanks, Maria. Thank you so much. Well, and uh, we will pass to the last talk of, of this uh, session in charge of Alexander Pharmacalides. Can you hear me? Very, very, very clear. Okay. Um, am I sharing the screen? No. Uh, not, not yet. Now, yes. Okay, and it's full screen? Perfect. Okay. Whenever, whenever you want. Okay, so thank you to HPC Fusion for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, so my, my talk is based on development of uh, computational multiphysics methods for whole system reactor simulations. And it has a lot to do with the talk that Maria just gave with colleagues working in the same department. So under the supervision of Professor Nikki Horakis and uh, Dr. Milmore, at the University of Cambridge. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll get into the, into the topic of my, my talk. So I'm just gonna give a brief introduction and then I'm gonna basically talk a little bit about steady state computations and unsteady computations. And these have been the two things that I've been uh, working on throughout my, my PhD. Um, so just a, a brief introduction. Uh, basically, uh, some of the things that Maria highlighted in her talk um, and current issues that, that the community has raised uh, is that regions of the of the device, so we're simulating tokamaks here, uh, regions of the device are, are isolated and, and simulated separately and then coupled together in uh, with, with various codes um, coupling together in, in different ways. Um, sometimes codes uh, lack shock capturing capabilities and while standard tokamak operation doesn't really involve strong shocks, uh, once you develop instabilities and, um, and these instabilities grow, you can get strong uh, kind of discon almost discontinuous regions, um, and that's where shock capturing capabilities would be uh, really valuable. Um, also mentioned was that that uh, codes use grid aligned coordinate systems, and these can be a bottleneck, especially with uh, to do with mesh generation, uh, especially if you have complex geometries uh, in there, such as uh, full tokamak uh, design. Uh, regions of true vacuum aren't uh, always considered. Um, and then also, as well as the materials of the of the wall, so whether these are elastoplastic or electromagnetic properties uh, of the material. And then as well, we, we have found that um, equations of state for the plasma are, are mainly used as, as ideal uh, gas equations of state, whereas you can have much, much more complex uh, equations of state that describe the partially ionized plasma uh, as, as you go from the core of the plasma to the, to the edge. Uh, on the left here is uh, just an image to to show the how the how we kind of simulate the plasma. So the plasma is, is sitting inside a vessel, uh, and you have this last closed flux surface, which kind of denotes the, the edge of the of the plasma. Um, so how do we fit in? So basically, uh, our goal was was first to do to develop a GS solver uh, inside our framework. Um, so I think it was spoken about in a previous talk, but essentially the GS solver is is for computing the equilibrium uh, profile of the plasma, a steady state profile. And then once we have this steady state profile, we want to be able to simulate all the regions uh, of the device in, in one go using multi-physics and multi-material methods. And this would require the, the mesh refinement in both space and time to of course handle the, the vast disparity in length scales and, and time scales that are present in, uh, in, in a tokamak uh, simulation. Uh, we want to be able to to capture discontinuous solutions so which respect the mathematical properties of the underlying system of equations um so for all of this we use a cartesian frame of reference uh, reference um and then we also try to, to capture the the vacuum interface which maria has, has spoken about and that was the focus of her talk uh, and then we want to eventually include uh, more complex equations of state as well as the electromagnetic elastoplastic behavior of the of the walls uh, and all of this is is basically to be able to to run uh, computations of instabilities and how these instabilities might develop and 
what kind of heat loads you would have on your on your walls and whether or not your your tokamak would be able to to handle let's say a certain kind of instability so the uh, full system of equations that i'm considering in, in my project is the visco resistive uh, mhd uh, system of equations in conservative form um so here we have uh, the the evolution of of the fluid properties uh, one fluid essentially um the the uh, density the momentum and the energy of, of the fluid and then as well is uh, coupled the the maxwell equations uh, so that we have the evolution of the of the magnetic field as well and then on the right here is the kind of visco resistive um, tensor which which in, involves uh, heat flux terms um, viscous terms and of course resistive terms um so as i said i'm going to focus uh, part, part of my talk on the steady state uh, behavior and so that involved kind of uh, implementing a grad solver within within the amrex framework um here just shown uh, for for completeness is the is the grad of equation it's a partial uh, it's a nonlinear um a partial uh, differential equation for for the psi the magnetic flux and here you have essentially uh, pressure profiles of, of the plasma and the toroidal field profiles of the plasma and this this itself um you can find uh, solvers for this uh, in the literature uh, and essentially uh, we implemented a free boundary solver which allows you to, to determine the equilibrium solution uh, given certain constraints such as the coil currents uh, the plasma current and, and the pressure of the plat of the plasma on on axis um, so there are various results but just in the interest of time I'm going to get to, to the most interesting one so uh, here is uh, a set of profiles that tokamak energy provided so these are the their experimental profiles that they they've uh, found in their machine uh, after running some experiments. So you have uh, the location of coils uh, around here uh, the device, and uh, we show here that basically we uh, validate the solution of the of the GS solver, um, and I'll show in the next slide one uh, D validation of the profiles. Uh, but here I want to show and and focus on how we would then generate uh, the mesh um, th that goes along with the simulation. Uh, and if we were to then model instabilities, how we would uh, depart from that. So here you can see on the right how uh, the, the plasma sits inside the device. We add refinement of the mesh along material boundaries and as well as uh, regions of high gradient. Uh, so obviously at the edge of the of the plasma. And here on the right, you can see a, a zoomed in version just to see how that uh, mesh refinement uh, takes place. So I, I want to stress here that we refine in both space and time. Uh, most people refine just based on space, but we also I refine on time and that allows a uh, great kind of scalability to to when you have uh, disparate length scales and time scales uh one devalidation so here uh, the our numerical solution in points uh compared to uh, an existing validated code uh, that was provided by tokamak energy and we obtain excellent agreement um, against the the reference solution here so now i'm going to move on to, to unsteady simulations uh, which are grouped uh, mainly focuses on um, we use uh, approximate Riemann uh, based methods here is uh, HLLC uh, which is an appro approximation of the of the wave structure uh, that is that that comes out of a, the solution of a Riemann problem uh, so these are explicit fully explicit schemes that are, are shock capturing and capable of of uh, capturing discontinuous solutions um, to the to the MHD equations um, this scheme I'm using here is a second order in in time and space uh, via muscle uh, reconstruction. I won't go into too many details, but I'm happy to answer uh, questions on this if, if there are any. Uh, to do with the multi-material uh, capabilities of the scheme, uh, we essentially use a ghost fluid method, and this catch captures nonlinear interactions across the interface. Uh, initially, I'm going to consider a rigid body uh, type of interaction in, in my simulation, and all of this, all this involves is basically uh, copying fluid states into the rigid body reflecting normal velocities and essentially providing a boundary condition on the fluid. Uh, but once this framework is in place, um, kind of going to more complex uh, materials, as indeed I was said, uh, elastoplastic or electromagnetically responsive materials would not be uh, too difficult of a task um, once the, the framework is in place. So here is uh, some validation for the, for the multi-material, the rigid body interaction. So I'm taking here a standard uh, Brio Wood test. Um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with it, but it's it's a one-dimensional MHD test, uh, which involves a discontinuity in, in magnetic field uh, density and pressure. Uh, and this evolves uh, to have uh, the, the structure that you see here on the right, uh, which is uh, uh, there are 
I believe five waves in the simulation where two of them are composite waves. And it's essentially a test of, of the scheme, uh, the scheme's ability to, to capture the underlying wave structure of the MHD equations, the solution to the MHD equations. Um, so here on the left, I've taken this test, uh, put it inside a rotated uh, geometry, um, put uh, adaptive mesh refinement on the top, uh, and just as a sanity test to see that, yes, indeed, our, our scheme is capturing everything on a, on a you know, non-grid aligned mesh, um, and, and the solution is as we expect. Um, so then I've, I've taken a more complex geometry, I've taken the same test uh, and evolved it inside. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, is an iter-like geometry. Um, so you can see here again, uh, the mesh refinement capturing the steep regions of gradient, uh, basically tracking the, the shock waves as they uh, travel inside the domain, as well as uh, mesh refinement on the, on the material boundary uh, itself. And again, everything uh, is well behaved and, and that's uh, really pleasing to see. Um, so, okay, how do we then, then combine? So we begin from that uh, GS steady state solution that I spoke of, and then we add a perturbation to this uh, and evolve it in time to see uh, what happens. This here is a, is a proof of concept that I've done. It's not uh, realistic perturbations in any way, uh, but I, it was just a, a case of uh, demonstrating the code's capabilities of handling all of these things going on. So I've initialized here um, a density profile, um, and then the, the solution of the GS gives me the magnetic fields that go along with it. And then I've perturbed it, giving it a strong uh, velocity perturbation in, 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 the, in the radial direction, uh, and then basically evolved it in time. And you can see as the plasma here um, travels towards the wall and indeed interacts with, with that wall uh, as, as the shock waves uh, reach and impinge onto, onto the wall. And then you can see the boxes here, which is the AMR tracking uh, the, the steep regions of of uh, gradients, uh, the regions of interest, as I as I spoke about uh, earlier. Um, okay, so we can now simulate instabilities, right? Well, not not quite. Um, basically, uh, we found out that uh, fully explicit schemes uh, suffer quite a few limitations when it comes to to uh, modeling this kind of kind of tokamak behavior, and that's because disruption events typically typically develop from from near steady state, uh, and that's where you have strong magnetic pressure and low velocities uh, going on in your simulation. And this would mean that for fully explicit schemes like the ones I've, I've just shown, uh, it would be the simulations time, the simulation times would be really unfeasible. Um, the number of time steps you would require uh, to get to the final time of your simulation would be uh, ridiculous. And, and then not to mention that because of the number of time steps required, um, numerical viscosity would lead to your solutions diffusing and kind of missing out on the, on the important uh, behavior. Um, of course, depending on, on your interests, so for our interests, the fast waves, uh, which, which are um, far, the fast waves which are present in the, in the MHD system, they're not so much of an interest to us. Um, and so some form of implicit treatment could really help us uh, kind of get over these uh, bottlenecks that I've, I've just described. Uh, so motivated by uh, flux splitting. Uh, so flux splitting is, is kind of uh, a way of splitting the flux into two uh, subsystems. So uh, we have here a convective subsystem and a pressure magnetic field subsystem. Um, so flux, flux splitting allows you then to, to split the flux and, and to treat one subsystem differently to the other. Uh, and motivated by kind of recent uh, work in the field to do with the Euler equations, uh, where you treat one subsystem fully explicitly and you treat the other one implicitly, um, you can bypass certain restrictions on, on the stability constraint. Uh, which allow you then to, to have a time step that is driven by a different uh, stability criterion than if you were solving the system fully explicitly, uh, while still uh, being able to capture uh, weak solutions to the, the, the equations um, and, and still capturing most of the physics that, that is there. So uh, following this uh, splitting of the flux in one dimension, um, the eigenvalues of, of the convective subsystem are simply the fluid velocity. And that means that our time step uh, is restricted really only by the fluid velocity. And you can see here the, the uh, time step uh, stability criterion that, that results from this uh, splitting. I won't go into the details of, of, the, of the algorithm itself. It's quite complex. I, I'm happy to answer questions on it. But essentially, we, we have implemented and developed this, uh, this scheme uh, that follows this uh, flux splitting, treating the, the right subsystem, the pressure and magnetic field subsystem, implicitly in time. Uh, in order to, to get uh, solutions. 
Um, again, I won't talk too much about numerical solutions. There are many validation test cases that we've done, uh, but some of the, let's say, the more important ones, so, so validating the, the HIMAC uh, capabilities of, of our scheme. This is the Orsang Tang uh, test problem. Uh, it's a problem which uh, really tests the transition of uh, supersonic turbulence uh, in, in a scheme. And these, these results here match uh, really well with, with those found in the literature. Uh, and we're we're really pleased with that. So basically, our, our scheme is able to to really capture the the physics of high Mac um, uh, problems. Moving on to the low Mac uh, behavior, which is more similar to let's say what you would find in the in a tokamak. Uh, I've I've simulated here. It's it's a it's a screw pinch. Actually, this is just a theta pinch. Um, but essentially, uh, it's it's a plasma equilibrium where you have your gradient of pressure matching the, the J cross B uh, Lorentz forcing uh, term. Uh, so I've, I've initialized a, a simulation with, with a low velocity constant density uh, where the equilibrium is advected around a periodic domain. Um, and here is the, the final solution of, uh, shown on the left uh, for, the, for the gas pressure. And essentially this is almost like the, the initial condition. Uh, this is the final simulation, uh, sorry, the final solution shown here. Um, and just as a comparison to, to kind of really highlight the, the benefits of our scheme, so I've compared our, our semi-implicit scheme against a fully explicit scheme like the ones I was using towards the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, and for different values of, of the initial magnetic field. So essentially, a stronger, magnet, oops, a stronger magnetic field uh, means a, a, a lower Mach uh, number, of, a lower Mach number for the, for the simulation. Um, so you can see that with the semi-implicit scheme, uh, all of the, no matter what the value of the of the initial BZ component was, uh, the simulation took the the same uh, time to run, and the error. So on the y-axis, I'm measuring the the error with respect to the initial condition. Uh, the error remains uh, approximately the same and and quite low. Uh, the fully explicit scheme, on the other hand, you can see that as I scale BZ, uh, the not only is the simulation time increasing. Uh, is increasing respectively, but also the, the error itself is, is increasing. Uh, I just want to highlight here that an error of one would mean that the solution has completely diffused in the, in the domain and, and nothing remains of, uh, let's say, this, this uh, shape that you see here. So this really highlights uh, the, the, the gain and, and the performance of, of our semi-implicit scheme here um, with respect to a fully explicit scheme. Um, so here, just um, showing some some solutions for for things I have I've done throughout this project. So we've got steady state stuff here on the left uh, with various solutions of the GS. Uh, then we've got fully explicit unsteady uh, with material uh, boundaries and considering rigid walls. These combined in, in a simulation. And on the right here is the is the the uh, semi implicit scheme and some some results that that I've had uh, uh, with this semi implicit scheme. Uh, so. As a conclusion, basically, um, we're, we're developing here a framework which, which should be uh, useful in studying instabilities, uh, such as edge localized modes and vertical displacement events. And uh, we've had success so far, and, and now the, the aim is kind of to, to increase uh, the physics and, and then to, to do some real test case scenarios and validation against uh, experiments uh, from, from Tokamak Energy. Uh, with re respect to future work, uh, there's some work to be done on the GS solver. I want them to be able to use it in, in an optimization algorithm. And, and some of the initial talks were really helpful in understanding some of that. And relating to unsteady, um, there is some more validation that has to be done and the inclusion of, of more physics, uh, such as the, the two fluid equations or more complex equations of state. And then uh, with the final goal of, of simulation of uh, edge localized modes. So thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Very interesting. It's time to some questions. Is there are, I have someone, a couple of questions. The, the first one is, you say that you use uh, several codes to validate. Which code do you use to validate the, your, your code? Uh, do you mean the, the unsteady or the steady state? Uh, I don't remember. The, the one of the first uh, PPT that you saw uh, yeah, that we saw. Um, um, do you are... more, more, more. In this one, you see this one. You use no the next one. The next one was 
this one. Ah, uh, yes. So, uh, so this, I think this was with uh, Centauri. Ah, Osama Centauri. Okay. Yes. Centauri, I think, was the, the code this was validated against. Okay. And and you, you, you say that you used the ghost fluid methods. Mm -hmm. um, and this is for for the case in what you have two different uh, the interface with two different media. Yes. Yes, it's true. And and you use this, for example, with uh, vacuum and I don't know plasma. Uh, yes. Um, uh, so Maria's focus was on the vacuum and plasma. Uh, she used actually a, di a diffuse uh, interface method for. Ah, diffuse. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Ghost and fluid you... is usually used for a sharp uh, interface, so such as you would have between, say, the plasma and the wall. Uh, but for the vacuum, uh, diffuse uh, interface methodology was used, which, which involves a sort of mixing, you have a sort Absolutely. of mixing between the, the plasma and the vacuum. Perfect, I understand. Okay, I think there's no more questions for the audience. Uh, thanks very much, Alexander. And well, it's time to to the lunch break, uh, we will return uh, to uh, 20 past two for the third session of the day. Thanks to all, and we will see in, a cup, um, in an hour. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I hope you had a really nice break. So my name is Mary Mansinen, and I have the pleasure of chairing this next session which is entitled Advanced Computing with Emphasis on the Use of Accelerators. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to the three talks in this session. We have one plenary talk, which has a duration of 35 minutes plus 10 minutes of questions. And then we have two talks, uh, contributed talks of uh, 15 minutes of duration, followed by about five minutes of Q&A afterwards. Um, please use your uh, the raise hand button or ask your questions via chat. And let's let's go for the first talk. It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Philippa Speaker uh, as our keynote speaker. Philippa comes from Nvidia Limited in Cambridge, UK. And uh, the floor is yours now, Philip. Are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I'm ready to share my screen, which we tested is going to work without problem. Perfect. So, no, so thank you. Excellent, excellent. So, so I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to this audience. So my name is Filippo. Uh, thanks, Mary, for the introduction. I work at NVIDIA, and I, in NVIDIA, I will summarize my role as a developer relation or technology person with a focus on GPU, but also on the CPU, because uh, Today, we also build CPU now in NVIDIA. So I'm based in Cambridge, but actually this presentation put together the, the, the material and the effort and the ideas and the insight of colleagues that are actually involved in driving the programming model and the software for GPU all around the world. So it's really a collaborative effort from that point of view. So today I want to talk to you about how in NVIDIA and with NVIDIA technology, you can accelerate your time to science. So ultimately the science output and the science outcome are what matters and with NVIDIA, are really a mean to an end. To achieve this breakthrough, you need hardware, but you also need new algorithms, new methods, new approaches. So actually for me, listening to this workshop is super interesting because it helps me understanding what does this community need or may need in the future to go beyond just make a fort on C++ code run faster. So really, thank you for the invite. So 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes. I always struggle with time. Um, so I want to exclusively focus my talk on programming the GPU and future-proof programming model for the GPU. Uh, we uh, um, so uh, I know that a lot of the future communities do a lot of simulations. So uh, about you know the plasma behavior, the vessel, the material. Uh, you know, and this simulation is very important to achieve you know sustainable fusion energy. So we've been engaging with the community, uh, both in Europe and worldwide, on code development, code porting. During this talk, I will point out to some of the activities we've been doing together, but I cannot really dive in 30 minutes into a lot of detail. Um, but we are not experts on the physics, so be, bear this in mind. We are a technology builder. Uh, we as a company, we know we can have a tremendous impact on the work. So uh, I hope that what I can be able to communicate today 
in these 30 minutes is really made you think bigger, better science, more impactful things in order to achieve the goal. So uh, we have 30 minutes. We have a lot to cover. Um, there will be references. Uh, we need to organize more material for the Qs and the Geek, and then people can contact me to this email address at the end of the day. But let's get started. So I mentioned that I will talk about software, but I have to talk a little bit about hardware, or at least mention a few words about the hardware, because you know nowadays hardware and software somehow go go together. But the core focus will be to explain to you, you know, what we for us means programming the GPU and this NVIDIA platform in general. What is programming the super chip platform? That is something new that we introduced that have as a scope um, the ability to enhance the developer productivity. And then, you know, we're talking about HPC here. So people like to see some number and I, I have to do that. If times allows, but otherwise this is gonna be for, uh, for, for the future. I have a, a set of slides coming from our corporate uh, um, headquarter around the HPC, HPC plus AI, the role of edge in HPC, the role of the digital twins. Um, in, the, in the big scheme of future research, I think some of those topics are, are very relevant or will become more relevant as soon as experiment comes online, more that is acquired through physical experiment and things like that. But again, we are short on time. So if we can cover them, otherwise they stay as a reference. So a little tiny bit about on the hardware. So we announced a new GPU. We do this every few years. Uh, the new GPU called Opera is essentially the, 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 the evolution of the A100. There's a lot of A100 system in Europe nowadays, also using fusion research. And uh, the, some of the key aspects of this GPU is they become bigger, so more flops, more memory bandwidth, some specialized capabilities, and at the end of the day, also better connectivity in and out the GPU. Opera in particular add a few things, for example, confidential computing, for example, multi-GPU instances, uh, special instructions to do dynamic programming that are very useful for genomic or graph analytics on some type of data processing. These are instructions that in hardware are accelerated to do something like a compute mean and maximum of, 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 some, of some arrays and values, and then cast them through a ReLU to, to, to higher value or lower value. Uh, and then there is the so-called transformer engine, which is very much more um, AI. AI focus. Uh, looking at the, the system, not just at the, at the GPU per se, this is the gets better and better every generation, system of, over the last decade, I would say, evolved in the way they are designed. So when I started, there was um, you know, one GPU, one CPU, and a cluster of them. And the, the ratio in terms of performance between the two was like uh, probably 4X, 5X in the best case scenario. Um, the most notable system back in the days was Titan. Two days, there's still a system like this called a Pitz Diant in Switzerland. Over time, because of AI, because of people moving certain type of workload more on GPU, we actually adopted this idea of FAT nodes, you know, where you have a couple of CPU, but then you have uh, this HGX module that have uh, four, two, four, eight GPU sometimes together. So obviously the way this is engineered allow GPU to communicate very fast to each other, so in a very efficient way, but there's still something that is this so-called PCI bottleneck, which developers that are started to look at porting code always face and, and, and hit this wall, which means that moving the data from the CPU when the data comes in or is generated to the GPU for computation is still slow. And so we as NVIDIA, we're looking at a different architecture that we, see being adopted in the future that we call it the super chip, and I will talk about that, that goes back to the idea of one CPU, one GPU, which is a slightly more balanced um, in terms of IO and connectivity, but aims to remove this bottleneck of the data transfer. It also had some level of hardware coherency that make the, the programmability of the GPU much easier. The ultimate goal is to essentially give tools and choices to developer to be productive, and uh, to have achieve performance, but actually spend time uh, onto the science, essentially, onto the science. And I will talk a little bit about super cheap because it's important in the way the programming model are evolving. Also, GPU are becoming not just powerful and fat, but also really fast in terms of the amount of computer they can do. So Kepler, that was the one um, present in Titan, was essentially released 10 years ago. There was 15 streaming multiprocessor and it was capable to do 1.7, um, 1.17 teraflop uh, in double precision. Opera, that is the GPU of today, has nine, nine to 10 times the amount of compute unity inside this, the silicon. Obviously, the silicon is slightly bigger, but it's almost 10 times the amount of compute. But if you're able to use TensorCore because you do dense linear algebra, you achieve basically 
57, 56 uh, X uh, in terms of performance boost in 10 years. Uh, obviously, if you do just single or double, it's still very competitive, 30, 20, it depends what you're doing. So basically, you can fit a, you know, between eight to nine Kepler card in one single open. Using such a very powerful GPU is a problem or maybe is a challenge. A lot of developers that, uh, that uh, wants to use this, this, this architecture and this type of hardware very efficiently, they need to somehow understand a little bit how it works and lose all this power uh, at, their, at their fingertips. We pair up the, CP, the GPU with the CPU and we create this super cheap kind of platform and we call the CPU Grace. This is, we announced the product a year ago. We find it very exciting because through this tightly coupled architecture between CPU and GPU, we can achieve some level of programmability that was not possible before removing some of the key bottleneck in previous design. Uh, we have the Grace Hopper with the CPU and the GPU and then magically people ask me, why you don't do two CPU? And that was simply, not, almost as simply as swap one with the other and create a, a CPU only type of product that is useful for many other things including adoption to other scalar and enterprise computing. And these are always coming pair, and I will explain you a little bit why. So the GRACE was designed to be a data mover architecture. One of the key aspects that every people tell me is that, okay, flop are cheap, but I have to move data around. And this includes moving data on the CPU and from the CPU to the GPU. And so we create GRACE to be mostly a, 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 a CPU that has a huge amount of memory bandwidth, more than current x86 at a very, I would say competitive power envelope um, and also a lot of bandwidth in and out of the chip. And uh, this connection that we realize between the CPU and GPU is a little bit of a secret source that enable and unlock a lot of capabilities also from a developer perspective, because uh, it's not a PCIe, it's much wider than PCIe, it's almost seven times more bandwidth than a PCIe. And uh, it enables also some level of coherency between the two engines. If today your problem, as we probably check uh, later during the continuing presentation, is, uh, oh, my, my data transfer from the CPU to the GPU is low. If you make the pipe larger, the problem goes away. And this was one way to essentially remove the, the, the problem by keeping backward compatibility to everything that has been doing programming GPU in the past 10 years. And this is more or less the speed and feed, how it looks like, which is, I believe in some respect, is very impressive. CPU and GPU will always have two different memory pool, but thanks to this link in between, the C to C and the special link in between, it's possible to move data from one to the other in a very efficient way. A lot of the optimization and tuning on how to program a GPU efficiently boils down to data movement. If you make the pipe long, bigger, and you make the coherence in between the two engines at the right level of integration, then you can move data fast or ignore the data movement and assume that the system moved the data for you. I was going to explain a little bit. A lot of people also tell me, wow, but you're building an ARM chip. How difficult it can be to recompile my code on the ARM chip. Recompile any code on an ARM chip is a piece of cake. I know most of the time it's just a matter of really recompile run. Other time is really straightforward because nobody has done before and you have to tweak some compiler flag. There are cases where for any reason, um, for example, a dependency with other libraries, assembly language that is embedded in the code, um, use of vector intrinsic, building a code on an ARM architecture is more challenging, but it's not an impossible job. It has been proven in, in multiple occasions, and you know, Fugaku in Japan is, is the, the example that can be done. We choose ARM because ARM's architecture allows us to innovate also on the CPU side and create a super cheap architecture. And uh, the CPU architecture is coming next year. Um, so it's going to be available next year. But uh, if you want to try ARM today, and the programming model that I'm going to explain to you today, it's possible to use something called the ARM HPC developer kit that we have been able to de deploy with partners all over the place. There is one deployed at the PFL, uh, managed by the Shita Center in the PFL, and I'm pretty sure the, the, the head of the lab there will be very happy to get uh, um, you know, people from the from the fusion community, since they're very close to the advanced computing app for Eurofusion, to the system so you can try by yourself. But then there are other ARM systems worldwide, so you name it, you have a choice. So let's talk about the hardware and let's talk about programming actually for the NVIDIA platform, for the GPU. So when we talk about NVIDIA platform, it's not just a compiler. We have to recognize that um, in, after 10, 15 years of GPU computing, we build a, such a rich ecosystem of libraries and a framework to do AI, data analytics, 
communication library, math library, you name it. There's, there's more than I actually can count or remember the name. Uh, I, me, as an HPC person, I'm more focused on the HPC side, but we have tons of people working on AI, ML, method, pushing the envelope in that area. We have this, that with this, um, I would say, kit with SDK, uh, that is free of charge, updated multiple times a year. They basically take the, the core building block that an HPC developer need to compile on the Nvidia car, on the Nvidia platform, which means also CPU in the future and GPU, um, and then be productive and do whatever work and implemented all our programming model that we support. So in terms of compiler, which is the key, uh, if you were to use only ARM, you can pick whatever compiler you want, it doesn't really matter. But if you need to program the GPU with NVIDIA HPC SDK, you have essentially everything you can do and all the programming models supported. This SDK, this, this, this type of compiler uh, support already multiple platforms. So a lot of people tell me, oh, well, Filippo, you know, uh, I had to switch platform, I have to switch compiler. Yes, you can, but in principle, this one works essentially everywhere. And because now we are entering into the CPU space and we build our own CPU, we are paying a lot of attention to make sure that this stack also has CPU optimized directive vectorization and libraries. In terms of libraries, and there are some work done already with the Fusion community here, we have libraries that goes from the normal linear algebra, you know, the BLAST, the LAPAC, the Eigen solver, to distributed version of those, to tensor version of those, and then more high level library like uh, FFTs and, um, and, 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 and other. Uh, there's a couple of examples here that we've been using uh, a lot. Uh, so I'm aware about several code within the Eurofusion community, for example, GBS, uh, the other developers in Germany that uh, are exploring the use of MGX, is our multi grid AMR library, which, by the way, is also open source, um, to accelerate the, the, the computation in the GPU. And they're having very good success to integrate it with Petsy or independently by Petsy as a standalone library. Uh, a lot of the codes in the Fusion community, especially the one that simulate the plasma, implement a, a sort of Poisson solver or a flavor of Poisson solver uh, that basically boils down to do FFTs. We have FFT that runs on GPU very efficiently on one GPU, but then we build over time a uh, multi-node, multi-GPU version of this QFFT. And we demonstrate uh, at the moment with, with turbulence code in the CFD space to be able to scale up to 4,000 GPU for domain in the range of 1,000 cube, which is, which is fairly good. The investment we're making in library is because this is one of the simple way to basically bring pieces of the code on the GPU in a very efficient way. And we try to really focus and optimize on multi-process, multi-GPU, and also support the mixed precision, which sometimes is um, it's not as um, it's not as standardized compared to the legacy, you know, Blast uh, LAPAC from NetLib from, from 10 years ago. But you know, there are now numerical method developed that want to exploit this mix of precision. And so we try to fulfill also this need from the developer perspective. Libraries, fine. OK, but I have a piece of code. I have loops. How do I program in it? So frankly speaking, we as NVIDIA, we support a lot of programming model. And uh, we don't pick a preference, I would say. For us, CUDA remains the primary vehicle to achieve what we call the speed of light on the GPU no, not is today. the the best um, is the best um, I'll say uh, language to get the capability of the hardware. Yeah, but we support to... we support OpenSCC, we support OpenMP, we support also this idea of adopting standard languages going forward, including ISO C++ and ISO 4. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Directive remain the best ways to go from serial to parallel languages, because are we looking at the moment going forward in the future, uh, the standard approach with standard languages sometimes it's not uh, as uh, uh, it's not always possible due to the limitation of the language itself. So this is essentially the vision at the end of the day. You have one single code where looking at the code you don't see if you run if there is GPU code or not. It's just just Fortran, just C plus plus, and sometimes also Python. And with a compiler flag, you magically run on the CPU multi core or you run the GPU with GPU float. And ultimately what we want to achieve this idea of ramp up. So the developer spend time to expose parallelism in his code, to use library wherever it's needed, and then specialize all if it's really strictly necessary, if the last mile of performance really matters. And if you adopt a language that has parallelism intrinsically into it, then essentially you make your code portable. So a little bit of, um, I go and go very quickly here. Yeah? So in terms of C++, uh, we are supporting up to C++ 17 and 20, some extension of C++ 23 already. We are involving and pushing the boundary on 
beyond for example execution and um, um we have some example about uh, um the um codes that will be ported this is lulesh this is very you know it, it's it's a very simple code but um it's it's what what we want to show here essentially is that uh, what was very big using openmp by modernizing the code it makes very very, very very more compressed more concise and it still can run everywhere cpu and and gpu uh, obviously we have performance number here that show that once you flip the flag is runs faster. Uh, we've been importing more complex code, for example, this CFD Maya code, um, same approach, uh, one single code base, pair up with MPI, and um, yeah, and then being able to essentially use, uh, use the GPU. Um, a collaborator in Bristol in, in UK uh, has been trying some experiments, say, okay, what if I run multiple version of the same algorithm in this case is a very simple one bubble stream is like a stream for for gpu and um, and compare the performance as choice cho choosing one programming language versus the other will penalize me and the answer is most likely no uh but the approach with iso c plus plus making the code for sure more future proof because if you look on the right there is nothing that, that says there gpu nevertheless it runs and uh, one thing that we're pushing directly as NVIDIA, we're really championing with the standardization body, is about um, 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 executor. Because C++, like you see on the right, you do one, one loop, another loop. If the two loop can be run independently, there is no construct in the language that allow you to overlap the two, the two step of the computation. By, and with CUDA, you can do it fairly easy. So with the execution, um, extension of the standard library, we are building a way to create the execution graph, um, execution graph of steps that can be run together or one after the other, and then add the ability to create a scheduler, which can schedule your task or your part of your computation, either on CPU, either on GPU, or either in an hybrid way between one of them in the most efficient way. But ultimately what you write is C++ standard code, which is very powerful. Um, I skip this one. Uh, for um, for a Fortran point of view, instead, we are a little bit behind. A lot of code are written in Fortran. I'm a Fortran person by myself, but the reality is that the standardization process is slow. C++ is more used even outside HPC compared to Fortran. So it is what it is. And um, there is already a console called the concurrent that is fully supported. Uh, we are not supporting core arrays at the moment because there's not much code actually using them at the moment out there but we do actually be able to take fortran intrinsics the math mold the reshape these these intrinsic fortran keywords that are there since probably 30 years and they offloaded them automatically on the gpu uh, when it's when it's a map demo library and offload your gpu when it's required we've been pioneer and this part of the specification uh the the the, the do concurrent reduction which is a kind of obvious things to do in a loop sometimes uh, but also we are pushing with the committee um the ability of uh, um you know having executor similar things like c plus um, plus beyond c plus plus 23. um example of matmul nobody write a three-way loop people usually call blast but if you don't like blast for whatever reason uh, because maybe you have to switch with blast, ku blast, mkl blast, whatever it is, you can do matmul and that is automatically offloaded to a library and then exploit uh, even the tensor core from a GPU perspective. And obviously we ported some application here. There is a blog post for this one that explains how we went to slightly refactor of the Fortran loop to expose parallelism. It's a very interesting journey in that space. And then we have another application that we ported, which is, was very interesting because uh, due to the fact that these languages do not handle data movement explicitly but they rely on something called unified memory which i will talk about sometimes the ability to mix and match two programming models so do concurrent very portable with for example opencc openmp data directive allowed to tune the data movement in the way the developer want and achieve slightly better performance how far one a person wants to go really depends about the interest of each one developer and this Games is, is another example like this one really as a reference. So from a from a programming point of view, when developer asks me how I port my code, well, if you can use standard language, this will make your code as future proof as possible. If you can use library, please do whatever library you want, an open source one, one provided by NVIDIA. Uh, for as long as it's, it's, it's well supported, it, it's great. If you want to go further in capabilities, directives are a good compromise between developer time 
portability and performance. But ultimately, if you really have, uh, you know, the 100 million allocation, the, the big machine, the big challenge, and you really want to go to the last mile of performance, could remain the only way to get the full hardware capabilities and unlock maximum performance. We support interoperability of all these primary models. I'm not suggesting anyone to take your code and mix and match OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA. It's becoming a little bit messy. But this interoperability is key because you as a scientist, you do not want to stop doing your science to refactor a code for a year and then run somewhere else. Incrementally, you can add capabilities. And when for any reason, a compiler bug, a library bug, a missing feature in the programming language that is not there, you have to stop. You can switch with something else and get going. This is extremely powerful because essentially put you into a productive mindset where porting is not an activity that requires you to stop, do something else that is not your core work, and then resume. So this is, this is I really like this, this interoperability aspect, despite it, it's just a temporary thing. Ultimately, you have to settle on a primary model that you like. We talk about Grasshopper very quickly. So what's going to be different in the Grasshopper super chip? So this is already many years ago, we invited some, we invented, or we added as a capability in our CUDA programming model, something called unified memory, which basically allow the, 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 the runtime to understand if a pointer is on the CPU or on the GPU, and then allow the runtime of the, of the GPU, so the CUDA driver to react and move data on your behalf automatically from one pool of memory to the other. So from a high level point of view, you see one memory, even though there are two separated physical ones. And then there is some magic at the driver level in software that basically allow to move data back and forth. And this is essentially what will happen in today x86 plus GPU, which is very interesting because you can enable this mode. And I've been working, for example, with the, with the, with the, with the Gisela mini app voice during one of the GPU hackathon, when we use this mode to basically ignore data transfer and just focus on the computation and we're able to achieve 9x on the mini app, then obviously Gisela is much more complex code. Um, but uh, basically you can ignore data movement and say, okay, I need data on the GPU. It's not present in my memory, my page table. I raise a page fault request, the driver capture it, looking at the CPU memory, I find the page that I'm looking for, and then I transfer it to the physical memory. But this page fault often require uh, extra cycle on the CPU or very consume, consume time. And this data, pay, data movement happen over PCIe in the x86 world, which is unfortunate because it has a limited bandwidth. So when we add the Grace Opera architecture, we have two key aspects that makes this whole experience much easier and also much more performant at the end. One, there is one single page table, so there's no page fold mechanism. Immediately, both engine can figure out if they have the memory in their own pool or not without consulting each other, you know, without raising page fold. But also, as soon as you need to move data from one place to another, so when you have to move data from the CPU to the GPU because you need to have a fast access with high memory bandwidth to drive a GPU kernel, for example, you can still move the data, and this data is moved through the C2C. And if before you have 128 gigabit per second with the speed of PCIe Gen 5, now you have 900 gigabit per second. So transferring gigabyte of data back and forward doesn't cost much at all. So there are, the Grasshopper model allow the developer to develop in three ways, which are all somehow compatible with the old way of doing things. You can move data explicitly if you really want to, can be done through a CUDA API or CUDA directive. You can use managed memory, which you can still do to system today, but it's gonna be better purely because we have a large pipe and we have a faster mechanism to catch and understand where the data is relocated. But also you can absolutely ignore special API to allocate data. You just use malloc, you just lose allocate and you allow the GPU through this special coherency to access the data on the CPU memory without the need of moving it. It's not the best, but it still works and it literally require zero change in the source code. How this boils down in performance, and then I wrap it up. I don't know how, how long I'm going. So the CPU, it's a very high-end CPU. Um, it has a lot of core, a lot of memory bandwidth. We expect to be faster, but not extremely faster compared to other CPU in the market. One good, often its strength comes from the high memory bandwidth. A lot of codes, stencil code or, or code that works on, on um, especially stencil code, really require a lot of memory bandwidth. One good thing though, 
and they may be more interesting to people that run machines as well or procure machine is that the entire CPU is at least twice as more energy efficient compared to the, our competitor. So even if you don't gain a huge speed up from the CPU point of view, you save energy. And today you're actually saving energy matters. Uh, from a AI workload perspective, the fact that they have these two capabilities allow to even run even large models that couldn't fit in the memory of the GPU before. The GPU has 80 gigabytes today. Yeah, we can put a little bit more on that, but that will increase the cost considerably. The CPU has much more accessible, much larger pool of memory that we can use as a capacity memory. These C2C links allow essentially to exchange data fast enough that you can use the CPU memory as a pool and only bring it in when you actually need it. And without avoiding all the tricks to programming, batching, data transfer, overlapping, you basically gain a lot of simplicity in the way the code is written, but also a lot of performance. From a pure platform perspective, there will be in the future codes that are not fully ported, code that are still limited by IO or PCA connectivity, applications that require cache coherency because they work in tightly coupled manner. For example, you run a simulation on the GPU, and once in a while you have to pick up a data from the CPU that comes from the ingestion, from example, from an experiment, you put data on the CPU, and then sometimes the simulation on the GPU, they need to read the, the CPU memory. Do it this in a fully synchronized way, code can be tricky, uh, but this level of coherence allowed the GPU just to grab when it needed, what it needed without even the CPU blink. And then obviously there are new GPU apps, which I will consider something like, um, you write your code in Julia, you write your code in Python. These languages have no knowledge about data movement whatsoever. Uh, they are very high level in a lot of respect. They hide a lot of complexity from the developer. And as a result, uh, having a platform that simplify a lot of things behind the scene is just a plus. From a performance point of view, uh, we've been starting to look about what will look like just to take a, an x86 for a GPU that works very well and replace it with the hopper system. And again, without any changing of the code because of the way the hardware is engineered, um, you're gonna get a, a little bit of extra performance. And uh, I expect to see multiple cases like this one um, would work fairly well on, on GPU and x86, but they get an extra kick uh, because of this marriage between uh, um, the CPU and the GPU, but also a programming model that is still a good fit about, uh, on the hardware that is designed. One last thing that is probably interesting for you guys as well, uh, your workflow are getting complex and complex. Some of you may run just one simulation and move on, uh, but maybe you want to start to pair your simulation with some AI inference engine, you want to enhance your simulation while simulation is running with data that you ingest, or may simply couple simulation and couple two different code, you can very tightly couple, sometimes you just you know, run the two codes and exchange data when it's convenient. I've seen multiple use cases. This platform allows to uh, do two things, one on CPU and GPU that are a bit of unique. The GPU can be split in multiple partition and seen as an independent GPU, they do not interfere one to each other. It's called a MIG, this mode. And this, on the CPU side, we have a new capability that comes from the ARM world called MPAM, which is actually allowed to create partition of your CPU resources and dedicated them to one or multiple process in, um, with, with some level of quality on service. So you can guarantee like a fraction of the memory bandwidth or a fraction of the number of core or a fraction of the number of the cache. Why this matter? Because remember the GPU now is very powerful the CPU is still lacking behind, no matter how modern it is, but there are co-scheduling opportunities to, to have uh, multiple jobs running on the same node, multiple processes that are part of the same workflow running on the same node and pair them, pair them up uh, based on convenience. And so you can have one CPU job with one GPU job, you can have multiple CPU jobs doing different things, integrating or talking with the GPU, with the CPU, GPU jobs, and things like that. So there are a lot of flexibility now with this platform, how to not just use efficiently the resources, but also how you can couple your code with other code and make your workflow more rich and more, um, you know, essentially more useful for the for the purpose you're doing. Philippa, uh, three minutes. Yes. I, I'm done. I'm done. I have a couple of slides more on the on the HPC plus AI and and Omniverse, but if you if there is time, I'm gonna show them. Um, yeah, otherwise. Just, yeah, you have still a few minutes uh, okay. more, so, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah very briefly, uh, it's not just HPC anymore. There is much bigger presentation of this. We are building a lot of software stack around, uh, you know, um, 
many other vertical, including visualization, edge, a, 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 the so-called digital twin. One notable idea that we'll be embracing internally to do some of our work, but also with our partner, and this idea that uh, we move away from the traditional, you know, design and experiment, run an hypothesis, you know, drive a simulation to a more data-driven type of world. When you also have AI enhancing, you know, our simulation through data, or basically to sometimes to even replace through surrogate entirely and just be completely data-driven. So we have, uh, um, and obviously there's also this um, challenge around um, um, devices. And I think Fusion will be one of those. When you get a big reactor, you know, and then you have a lot of data generated that you can drive control through it, or maybe do post-analysis processing and figure out what's going on. So this, this massive experiment will drive a lot of data that uh, can feed into simulation, but can also feed into, into more, you know, like, like control kind of system. I really know expert that. So we have a, a stack specifically around how to connect this device, this and we call it edge device through experiment to enhance data simulation, data acquisition. We have also stack that is designed specifically around AI and coupling HPC plus AI, called modulus. And we've been a couple of examples over there that, uh, that there are link here that you can, you can, you can follow. And, uh, and then we try to pair up all together and figure out how we can build essentially digital twin. Now in the, in the, on the digital twin side, uh, it's interesting because there are two aspects. There is obviously the ability to simulate, uh, acquire, um, simulate uh, no, specific physical phenomena completely in silico, but also the ability to get uh, a ground truth from the real world and somehow pair up together. And the mode you can have are multiple. You can have you know, a physical world, um, a simulated world and compare them. You can have one feeding into the other, but being somehow independent or somehow through a proper digital twin in real time, you can, you know, you can merge them together. And we are really actually looking for some of the fusion use cases in this space, even though we are not really the expert. And uh, Omniverse is this piece of software that we are, we are basically pulling together that allow to bring together multiple input sources. Some of them are graphically and visual, you know, the geometry of whatever it is. Um, other are, are, for example, an output of the simulation. And so you can have from a, from a digital twin, um, you know, your geometry, you can have uh, some data simulation, you can have some simulation feeding up, for example, velocity or whatever it is, and then you can visualize, interact with it, understand and expose to the user. And we see this technology be becoming very, very powerful if people want to go beyond HPC and, you know, and understand a little bit better how, how everything glue and fit together. But entering into this technology detail will require, I would say, more time. I'm really done. Um, I'm happy to take questions, uh, if any. Thank you so much, Philip, for, for the, this extensive talk on the solutions by NVIDIA on this um, HPC front. So this talk is now uh, open for questions. Use uh, the raise hand button or the chat to ask your questions. At the moment, I don't see yet anything, but um, let's see. I, while you while you think about your questions, I, I ask you something first. So I um lately I have heard the word or concept of co-design in this in this field a lot. Uh, I understand it's sort of um working together between the code developers or application owners and hardware developers. Yeah. So uh, what is your understanding of this uh, this concept and has it already influence the, your solutions or do you see that it could be important for your future work and if so in which ways so uh, co-design as the word itself i believe has a lot of hype and based on your talking to it may mean different things i tell you what i be, what it means to me and what it means to a person like me that works very closely to domain scientists and domain expert to help them to do their work to basically empower them to the work better. So in that sense, uh, co-design already happening because every time I talk into, you know, to you, Mary, for example, you tell me, I have a problem, this compiler does not work, or I have a problem, this other does not do that particular again solver in the way I need it. This is essentially trigger a feedback loop, a co-design activity where I take on, on your problem, understanding how to prioritize internally and eventually producing a solution that you can test 
and we improve together over time. So for, from software, from application to software perspective, there's a lot of co-design already happening, just basically having direct engagement and active engagement, and also the willingness to learn from each other. Uh, we are technology experts, we don't know about, well, we, we have some people that knows about plasma fusion, but we are not the expert in plasma fusion, but we understand in technology and by feeding to each other information and exchanging information helps both ways tremendously. And I see this as some sort of co-design. A lot of people see co-design as a, then you take this feature and you implement it into the hardware. That uh, it is possible, this is happening in certain markets, in certain type of, um, you know, um, for example, in AI that happens often, like uh, oh, transformer model are very popular. So uh, can I find a way to speed up them into the hardware? And we did it. Uh, but the reality is, uh, and this is a little bit of a sad from an HPC point of view. HPC is such a it's a it's a big you know community, but it's not big enough to drive technology company to completely change their silicon roadmap from A to B. So the reality is that uh, silicon is happening, um, innovation on hardware is happening, often driven by other factor. But there's a lot of work that can be done in co-design way through software and application that we can start uh, today and doesn't require nothing else than just us talking and, you know, and work together. Yeah, I very much share that view, Filippo. Thank you so much. Now I see questions coming. So first, let's try Hugo Ferrari has a hand up. Can you try to unmute yourself? I asked you a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay, my, my question is, uh, I understand that you're new GPU H100 is designed to for scientific computation. Mm. Is that okay? Yeah. How will you compete with the uh, I mean, with the GPU which is designed for gaming? I mean, I'm asking about the price. So is I am so in a yeah, yeah in a I am in a lucky position that the people don't tell me the price of the of the GPU. So I really ah, don't okay. know how much they cost. <laughs> Uh, obviously, the, the, the card that goes in the data center costs more than the, the, the card you put on the, your workstation for mm -hmm. a couple of multiple reasons. So the architecture is the same. The way the GPU is engineered is slightly different. In terms of reliability, you don't, I mean, you can easily burn a graphic card gaming 24 hours, seven, you put it in data center, you put them 100% of the load every time. While the card that goes in the data center are designed to, you know, to sustain working 24 hours, seven, 365 days all the time. Also, you know, cooling point of view, um, you know, power and capabilities of a GPU also are a factor of uh, how much power you can give it to them. The more power you give them, they can faster they can go. I had a dimension, but the H100 for the data center has a power sloshing and a power range that goes from 400 watts to 700 watts. So you don't have to run 700 watts, uh, but if you run 700 watts, you go stupidly fast. 400 watts, you go fast, but it's not as fast, but it's 400 watts. Gaming card, they have to stay 250, 250 watts, so they can be capable, um, but not mm -hmm. at the same level of capability. And then it boils down to what the graphic card is used for. So the one data center often, often has full 32-bit and 64-bit capabilities to run, you know, flight simulator or to run, uh, you know, I, I don't know, World of Warcraft, I just, just never, you really don't need FP64. So it's the same architecture in the way it's designed and programmed, but it's tuned based on the use cases. And obviously the, the GPU and data center cost a little bit more for these things than more memory, bad, bad, uh, good memory. From a programming point of view though, from a programming point of view, you can have a gaming card in your desktop and do the programming there. All our programming software stuff will work in any type of GPU. But then when you want to run a full simulation, big memory, large scale, you need to go to the big boys. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Then in the comments or in the chat rather, uh, I see two questions asking whether the slides will be available. Everybody, yes. <laughs> yeah, you are happy to share them. That's- um, Yeah, I, I actually the slide that I shared have more information so you can dig in and do other stuff because the yeah. time is was short. Yeah, that will be so, so informative. And then uh, I think we have, Question time for one more question. Is anybody? I don't see anything more. So let me let me ask you, ask you myself. 
So lots of, thi uh, lots of uh, things are happening in this field and very far. So do you have any advice how the scientists could keep up <laughs> on the progress? So, so this is a good question, actually, because a lot of people telling me, I don't know what to do. Maybe I wait and see what happens. Don't do that. Because the reality is that uh, there is NVIDIA pushing the envelope in GPU computing. There is our, our competitor, Intel MD and other building their own stuff. If you have a problem today, and you need these kind of resources, there are mechanisms to give you, to make you productive and do something about it straight away. Procrastinating between brackets too much to understand how things are actually gonna go in the future is very hard. And uh, the choice of where you want to go in terms of problem model is really based on your um, priorities, uh, pure performance, pure productivity, pure portability. So there are some balance that you can strike there based on your unique priorities. But it's very hard to predict the future. GPU, what, the only thing that we know for sure is that GPU are going to stay. 10 years ago, people would say, well, no, but GPU are useless, you know, CPU are enough. Guess what? People that say that are now building GPU. So at the end of the day, it looks like GPU are going to stay. Um, and some of these programming models are extremely portable across all of those flavors. So hard to predict the future, but nothing should stop you to, to basically use GPU today, essentially. That's the idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that piece of advice and thank you for the nice presentation once again, Filippo. Now thank it's time much. to move to the next speaker of this session. And it's really my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Xavier Saez, Saez from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Are you ready to share your slides? Yes. Um... Wait a second. I am. Ah, okay, now I go. Okay. Now you, you, you can see. Yeah, looks yeah. good. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Mary. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Xavier Saez, and I am going to talk about the task that my colleagues here, this uh, presentation, and I are doing in the Advanced Computing Hub at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So, firstly, I need to give you some background about Advanced Computing Hubs to understand better what is their mission, okay? The European Research uh, Roadmap forms the basis for the programs of Eurofusion and Fusion for Energy and provides also a clear and structured way forward to the commercial energy from fusion. In this, mo uh, in this roadmap, the research we move from the being laboratory based and science uh, driven towards an industry and technology driven venture. ITER, for example, is an experimental machine not connected to the grid and demo will be the next step because it would be an example of a nuclear facility capable to deliver electrical energy to the grid. The design, the construction, and the operation of the demo requires full involvement of the industry. But the step from ITER to demo is challenging to the demo's complex design in terms of the number of systems needed. And also the experimental data obtained from ITER and ICMIDONES are essential but insufficient to design demo confidently because there is an explored environment to predict plasma and materials performance. So it is clear that there is a need to create a high quality suite of research codes to model data from existing Eurofusion facilities and to reliably extrapolate to future devices. And this set of code is what we call Eurofusion standard software. So to develop this software, Eurofusion has initiated a coordination among Fusion, uh, fusion uh, physicists, material scientists, with computer scientists to make use of high performance computing to accelerate the development of the fusion energy. This coordination consists of the of two structures that are thorough simulation, validation, and verification tasks that are responsible of performing fundamental research. And then this other structure is the advanced computing hubs that uh, will be computing sectors of excellence in specific fields of scientific modeling. Uh, yeah, 
Let me see that in Euro, we have five of these advanced computing hubs. The way that this uh, structure work is the following. The TSVBs propose a list of codes that are of interest to each research. These codes are distributed among the different advanced computing hubs depending on the requirements of the developers and the expertise of each advanced computing hub. For example, our advanced computing hub consists of these teams, operation teams that provide the knowledge of hardware, the best practices and performance for performance and programmability team that provides knowledge on software, and case fusion team that provides knowledge on fusion. These three teams work collaboratively to give support to the developers of the applications. <clears throat> for example, they can ask us to optimize the parallelization of a code, to analyze the performance of a code, or to port the code to another platform as GPUs. This, for example, is the list of codes that has been assigned to our advanced computing hub. As this talk is, has a limited time, I am going to describe briefly the work that we have performed uh, in three calls that we have started this year, the, the work. So the first example is 02. This is a Monte Carlo code where the trajectories of the particles are tracked inside the vessel of a reactor for the study of the interaction of these particles with the walls of the vessel. This code is written in C++ and it is paralyzed using MPI and OpenMP. As a starting point in all the projects, we hold a kickoff meeting with the developers team to establish the objectives for this work. In the case of Hero Tools, the proposed tasks were performance analysis and porting the code to the GP. So the first step always is perform a profiling or a trace of an execution. In this case, we started with a trace using tools developed at Barcelona Support Computing Center. Extra was the tool used to get the trace, and Parabel was the tool used to visualize the trace. The result is a figure here that uh, shows a photo of the execution of the application. Each row, it's, the, it's a thread, because here we have OpenMP. And we can see what is doing each thread in any time, uh, looking the color of, of the point. Um, in this figure, I'm interested that you see the gray color because the gray color means that this thread is not doing anything at that moment. So if you see at the end of this thread, you will see that most of the processes are doing nothing because they are waiting the slowest process to finish, okay? So here we have a case that are low at imbalance. Also, uh, we want to run these codes in high PC systems with many processors. So to see that they do this efficiently, we did a, we do a scalability test. This test consists of running the application with an increasing number of processors and analyze how affects this increasing this increase increase of the the computing power in the execution. In this case, we can see that the computation part is this uh, red box. Uh, reduces proportionally, okay? So it means that it scales well, but we can see also that the gathering part maintains the size when we increase the size, the, the number of, of processor. So this part doesn't scale. In this part, I want to focus again in the last part of the computing uh, area. Uh, you can see that when we increase the number of processors, this area increases. So here it, it points that there is a problem with the MPI parallelization because this load in balances is increasing. To confirm this issue, we perform uh, sometimes an analysis that consists of computing a set of metrics. This metric gives a number from zero to 100 that allows us to evaluate the efficiency of each of these aspects that we have here. In this application, the global efficiency shows a very low efficiency because it's under 50. And this is because, because it's like a tree, this is because uh, we have a low parallel efficiency and the low parallel efficiency is because, because there is a low load balance that it means that there is an imbalance. And then there is a low communication efficiency that it implies there is a serialization in the communication. 
so when we that when we have analyzed this uh, our next step is propose a solution to optimize the the application we detected that only the master thread uh, was done the communications these communications were to get new particles from the process zero so the rest of threads uh, were either when they finished the, they work to get new particles to compute in order to remove these idle spaces, we move the OpenMP parallel outside. So in this way, the OpenMP parallel include the communications, okay? So its thread now, when finishes uh, to compute its particles, could ask the process zero for new particles without waiting the, the slowest uh, thread to finish. The second part was to port the application to GPUs using, in this case, OpenNCC. This choice was to facilitate the work because the compiler was responsible for generating the kernel and managing data transfers. To decide which routine we could start to introduce uh, OpenNCC, we did a profile. In this case, we use Intel Vtune, that is a tool that you can find here and is provided by Intel. However, uh, when we introduce OpenMCC in the code, we face different issues, uh, such as uh, C++ style loops were not supported, polymorphism were not supported. Uh, moreover, the feedback from error messages uh, that we get was not clear. Although this problem showed us that the OpenMCC option was not much for C++ language when you use oriented object, we got the first version of the routine running on GPUs and we could trust using the uh, tools that NVIDIA provide us, uh, like in this case it's inside. Uh, now we are working on introducing CUDA to improve the performance of that routine. So the, the second example is the SPICE2, okay? This is a particle in cell code where the particles are, simulate, are simulate, simulated in a fixed and magnetic and self-consistent electric field for the study of the plasma deposition. This code is written in Fortran and in MPI, and the parallelization is MPI. So here we can appreciate that we receive in our advanced computing center codes with different languages, with different parallelization, with different complexity. And this diversity is a difficult for the advanced computing hub. After the initial kickoff meeting, with the developers, the tasks required by them were basically the implementation of a 2D parallel Poisson solver, the parallelization of the E-field calculation, and a general improvement of the code. Again, for the general improvement of the code, the first step is a profile in this, using the Intel tools. However, this time, the modification that we apply to the most time-consuming parts of the code produced a small imp improvement. To go more in depth, we perform a trace using the VSC talks that I mentioned before to get a photo of the execution. Again, each line, in this case, as we only have MPI, this li each line is a process, okay? So each line is a process and we can see what this process is doing. When we have black color in this case, it means that the process is not doing anything. The, the, the figure shows that all the processes went to the same file at the beginning of the simulation. So uh, the modification that here we did basically was to introduce code to allow only process zero to write this file and then the rest of the, the process wait on a body. And we could see that the, uh, this in, improved the, the, the situation. Xavier, you have three more minutes. Okay. In another part of the code, we detected the, the potentials and entities were sent from process zero to all the processes using point-to-point -point calls. Here the call, the, co the color indicates MPI receipt. So the, the decision here was to substitute this point-to-point -point communications using MPI by collective communications. And the figure shows the improvement. In this case, the potentials, we substitute the point-to-point -point communications by MPI broadcast. And here, in this case, we substitute the, for the density, the NPR uh, communications point to point by reduced collective. Finally, the last stat in this program was the implementation of a parallel Poisson solver. 
the current implementation was using a direct solvent. And this had uh, really two important limitations for the, for the high performance computing. The first is it scales up to only 32 cores. And the second is that there is a grid limiting one dimension. Here, the solution was to implement a iterative solver that we uh, took from the patch library, a well-known library, very extend, extended. And then we tried several solvers, we tested, and the best performance was obtained by the uh, preconditioned conjugate gradient that here in the figure we can see. The result of the solution was an increase in the scalability, okay? Because now we can get a good performance up to 128 processors. And also we have removed the grid size limitation so we can solve bigger domains as we mentioned here. Finally, the last example is NOSOS. In this case, we have a code that calculates neoclassical transport in low collisionally plasma or 3D magnetic confinement devices. This code is written in Fortran and it's parallelized using MPI. The tasks required by the developers of the code were a performance assessment and the optimization of the application. In this code, we have detected a high load imbalance between MPI processors that seems to be related to a different number of iteration in some routines among the different processors. So this information has been communicated to the developers and now we are waiting the feedback from them. Apart from that, another way to improve, um, improve the global performance of an application is by improving the code that is inside the process. So the, the sequential part. As always to do that, we did a, a profile. In this case, we use a free tool. It's called a Valgrin, okay? And, and we get this tree of calls where each box is a routine, and this is the total percentage of the total. It's a percentage of the total time spent in each routine. Look in the figure. The most time-consuming were these three routines. And in this case, as we only have one level of parallelism, we decided to optimize introducing a second level of parallelism. So using OpenMP. The implementation here was not difficult because the iterations were independent between them. So in other words, there were no conflict, data conflicts among the iterations. And the result was a reduction of the consumption time from 15 to 10 seconds using uh, four process. And lacking the improvement obtained with OpenMP in the other two routines was miserable. So to finish this talk, I wanted to explain to you a bit what is the work that we are doing in the Basco PT Hub. And um, basically the message is here, we are developing an ambitious mission to increase the efficiency of simulation codes in a small time window. To do that, it is necessary a close collaboration between developers and the advanced computing hub staff. Uh, in the examples that I have shown you, you could see that there are different levels of success regarding the required requirements from the developers. But always, always, the code improves its capability to run on HPC systems to perform more complex simulations in the future. So thank you for, for your attention. Thanks a lot, Xavier, for this, well, short glimpse to this very ambitious Eurofusion program of improving our codes in Fusion. So now this talk is open for questions. Who wants to, who wants to ask first? There is something in the chat. Let's have a look. Um, Mary Kay Jesse is asking, how might the modifications to improve the efficiency of the codes impact the accuracy of the physics results? Uh, yes, obviously sometimes if the optimizations are aggressive, they can impact in the validation. Uh, for that reason, or when we practice an optimization, one of the things that we do is test the that we are getting the, the same resource so, or the error is acceptable by the developers. So always we ask the developers if the optimization proposed is it fits with their expectations uh, and they said if they, they agree with that uh, resource. So yes, obviously when you do an optimization, you have to check that the, the, you don't modify the resource. Fantastic, thank you for that. Any other questions? No hands up yet. 
So let me let me try to ask myself something. So um, I'm, I'm sure there have been, and I know that there have been some challenges in this work uh, so far. Um, could you comment on the main challenges and any sort of suggestions or um, or any any ideas for improvements in the collaborations or any aspects um, what is coming out of this this work so far? Well, this is a really general question. So from this work, basically. Um, my recommendation, for example, for the people that write code is you have to document very well the code because when, for example, in our case, in our case, we receive a code from from a developers that have been working on that several months or years. This code is really extensive and it's and it's complicated. And when you have to do an optimization and you have a very short window, or the, the period is really is really uh, small, you need to uh, understand very well what is doing the code in each part. So a well-documented code is a good point to facilitate this, this uh, work for the optimization. Um, experience, um, about the performance, well, um, if, if, if the people can do it, it is interesting to try to do a performance analysis, a very easy performance analysis uh, using the, this uh, free tool like Bitune or that, that can give you an idea about where is consuming, so in which parts of your code are consuming the time, because sometimes you focus on a routine and that routine perhaps is only spending the 20% of the time. And perhaps there, there is a big issue in other routine that uh, it needs more than the 40% of the time. Um, so, well, it could be a lot of... <laughs> yeah, I, I know this could be large, but okay, I think you gave us some hints of at least of the main things that uh, that you have in mind. So I think we need to move on. Thank you once again, Xavier, for your talk. Uh, very nice. Uh, let's let's move to the last talk of this session. And this is given by Hugo Ferrari from CONICET and National Atomic Energy Commission, CNA from Argentina. Are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I see this coming yes. up already. Would you be able to put it on full screen mode? Oh, uh, I think it's full screen now. It's not full screen? Not in my screen, on my screen yet. Not yet? Okay, uh, let me see. Oh, I, just, I don't know how to change. Well, what perhaps you there, there, at the top, you see bear. Perhaps you could click on that bear and then see where it. Stop sharing. As you say, okay, share again. Stop. Share. What about now? Now it's much better. Thank you so much. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so I start. My name is Hugo Ferrari, and I will talk today about simulation of NVIDIA, NVIDIA ion losses using GPUs. Um, I will talk in this talk about the motivation, and then I will present the focus code, which I use to run, to make the simulations, the model I use, results, and conclusions. The motivation of this talk is to study the it's an experimental fact that when, when, when there are uh, NTMs, energetic, you can measure energetic ion losses in the experiment. Um, in particular, it was measured in the upgrade with Barcia Muñoz in 2007. And there is a lot of numerical work, but here we will focus in tablet particles. Uh, we will use here to study this problem. Uh, we develop a code called Focus, which run. And for us, uh, we will use GPUs as a, a way to simulate a large number of particles with modest resources. And I, 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 I want to say that this uh, commercial GPU was cheap for us. 
And we also, we also use a reconstruction technique to, to reconstruct the perturbed magnetic and electric fields. Well, the core focus, as I say, is a full, is the acronym for full orbicular solvers. And we will study energetic particles. And in this case, we use the approximation of tracers. That means that the plasma is not modified by the particles. So the code is perfectly parallelized. Originally, the code was written in full orbit, but now we add a Shido Central Solver and also has packages for elastic and elastic collisions through a Monte Carlo operator and can read data from if it solves and different codes. Uh, as I say, I present here a small speed up analysis. You can see here in, in orange, uh, the simulation time for different number of particles with a CPU. And of course it's linear in the number of particles. They are collapsed here. We simulate 10,000, 1,000, and 100,000 particles with different times. And for a CPU is linear because the particles are considered tracer. For the CPU is different, um, but it start to be linear when you fool all the, the nucleus of CUDA. But the important thing for us is here, here um, the, we can run a lot of particles with just one GPU. And in the past, we need to use a cluster of PC, which is expensive. We, we do several work with this code. For example, here we calculate the um, slowing down distribution of alpha particles in an inter-like configurations. The ion star 3.5 map with the diffusion rate distribution. And we follow them to the slowing down. And you can see there is a good agreement between the calculated slowing down distribution and the theoretical one. And we also have recently modules for calculate the neutral beam injection. And here is a typical picture of a figure of energy versus pitch for a neutral beam. Well, to, to our problem, we use um, an analytical expression of the equilibrium magnetic field derived by McCarthy to fit a series of as the view discharges. You can see here the magnetic flux surfaces. And here we calculate the Safit factor with crosses. Uh, there is a value of Q equal to, and here we will put our iron or NTM. For the NTM, we also use a paper by Igo Shin. When he read that paper, he reconstructed the perturbed current uh, using the using the experiment, experimental measurements. With this, with this uh, reconstructed current, we calculate the perturbed flux, and this is done in cylindrical geometry. So we need to, to, to pass from the cylindrical geometry to our real geometry. This is done with a method proposed by Darwin to control flux coordinate. And with these flux coordinates, we also add the dependency of the NTM, which is in this case is two, one, two for the polar number, and one for the, I probably just, one for the total number, and you can see there is two islands here. In this case, because the size of the island depends on one parameter, which is we we call it h. But in the experiment, is reported that the island is eleven centimeters. For the initial particle distribution, we use a collection of particle distributions they distributed like we you can see in the figure, with pitch uniformly distributed between zero point two and zero point nine and uniformly toroidal distributed also. We run this case that is called the initial and we run also the case kind of relaxed. We, we just run the particles for, for a short time. In a typical simulation, we run 250 particles during four milliseconds, more or less. And this take us uh, something like 2.5 million time steps. And when the particle reaches the last closest surface, we consider the particle lost. For three distribution, we call it initial or relaxed, it's the same. 
we have something like 20% of travel particles, 65% of passing particles, and 50% of early losses. So it is the early losses that we're considering in the simulation. And these are for 93K, which is the injection energy. And we also simulate the hull of the injection energy, which is 46.5. Well, we, we focus our studies in the trapped orbit, but they call it also banana orbit, because the, for an energetic particle, the size of the banana can be comparable to the weight of the island. Um, the location of the, the location of the particles is defined in, in the most part by the canonical angular momentum. And we distinguish three kinds of uh, orbits. First, we here you can see orbits that are outside, or most of the part is outside the island. You can see here the island. Orbits which encloses the island, as in this case, and orbits which are inside the tokamak and only a part of the orbit touches the island. You can see here that the position of the, the orbit depends on the depends on the on the canonical angular momentum. Here, this is the, the main, the most important figure of this, of this talk. And you can see here in green, the, the trapped ion losses. And in brown, with the bars, the histogram bars, we plot the frequency, the toroidal precession frequency of the particles. You can see for, for the green line, the losses, that there is a maximum of the losses when you have a maximum and the precession frequency of the particles. So this is a kind of resonance. And the same happens when you, in, in, when you reduce the energy of the particles to have the injection energy. This is plotted in the line, in the red line. You can see there is a maximum here in four, 10 to minus four. And this is the frequency of the mode. Sorry, I didn't say that, but we changed the frequency of the mode. So there is a maximum, uh, a certain frequency of the mode. And here in Cyan, we plot the distribution of, of precession frequencies of the particles. So there is a resonance between the distribution frequency of the particles and the frequency when, when the, with the frequency of the mode. And in black, we plot the vertical line the frequency, the experimental frequency. So the experimental frequency is far from the, from the precession frequency for 93 kep, but, see, but it's the same as the half the injection energy for this 45.6 kep. So uh, you can predict here that uh, even if you don't lose uh, the 93 cave ions, we, you, you have uh, a lot of losses for the half of the injection energy. Regrettably, in the experiment, only they measure to 60 kev. Uh, I will talk a bit about the ion dynamics. You can see here a trapped orbit, and this is the bouncing point in green. And this is what happens when you put up the orbit. The, the orbit start to, to, to change. And here we show a zoom of the bouncing point, the upper bouncing point. And the, the, the palette, the palette, the color palette is the time. So you can see the, the particles starting in the black point and start to migrate to the yellow point. And finally, the particle touches the last closest surface. And this is a case for when the frequency of the mode is close to the precession frequency of the particle. In this plot, we show what happens with the bouncing point when we change the frequency of the, of the mode. In blue, you can see the, uh, what happens when the frequency of the mode is close to the frequency of the particle. In yellow, you can see a case when the frequency of the mold is bigger than the frequency of the particle, you can see that the bouncing point oscillates, but the particle is not lost. And the same happens when you have a frequency that is lower than the frequency, the precession frequency. The, the, the bouncing point oscillates, but the particle is not lost. 
Here is the same information of the previous plot. The red line is the amplitude of the, of the oscillation of the bouncing point as a function of the frequency of the model, of the NTM. And you can see that there is a kind of resonance between the frequency, the frequency of the model and the particle, the precision, the precision frequency of the, the moment of the particle. This is look like a faucet oscillator. Finally, we plot here all the information we need to, to lost or not. Here is the, the toroidal canonical angular momentum in the E axis. And in the X axis is the, we call it the phase of the mode. And you can see that there is three situation here. The first situation when the toroidal canonical angular momentum is bigger than 3.5, the particle oscillates mostly in the, inside the inside the tokamak and, and just a, a part of the of the orbit touches the, the NTM. And the particle is not lost, it's that the green points here in the upper upper, upper sub of, of the of the graph. And when the troy the canonical angular momentum is between 2.5 and 3.5 in the, the, the blue points. The orbit encloses the, the, the island and all the particles are lost. This is the case where we call it resonant. Um, and finally, this is the situation in the, when your canonical angular momentum is below 2.5. And you can see that these particles that, that they are lost as uh, the blue ones, you can see the, the blue points, which is, which are below 2.5, but there are particles which are not lost as the green points, for example, for the phase zero. And the reason is this, you can see here in the upper figure in your left, that there is part of the orbit which is uh, touched the, the island, but, but not. The main conclusion is of this talk is, um, when the frequency of the NTM matches the precision frequency of the double particles, the losses increase significantly. In the experiment reported in two, the 93 cap ions have a precision frequency that is approximately twice the experimental mode. And even if, if you're far from the from the resonance, you, you have a you can see an increase of the, the losses. For, for, for half of the injection energy, the frequency, the precision frequency of the particles matches the more frequency, and that means that you, we have a, a lot of losses. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the experimental measurements goes only to 60 k. Whatever conditions, passing particles, losses are small, and we have a very weak dependence with the frequency. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Sorry. Um, I, I'm sorry because I think that my pointer is that doesn't show in the talk. I don't know what is. Oh, I appears. Well. Yeah, we, we I, I could follow it very uh, very well. So, sorry, thank, yes, so thank you very much. Why, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um now the talk is open to questions. Who wants to have the first question? I don't see yet anything here. So perhaps I could ask first one while others are thinking about their questions. So um, I understand that um, you have sort of model for the perturbation, the NTM in your study, yes. and it has some free parameters. Is this correct? And then yes. the question is, yes. have you studied the sensitivity of your result um, in terms of yes. you know, this perturbation? And what do you find? I don't know if I have an extra slide here, but yes, if you change this parameter, you change the size of the island. Mm. Uh, I think we have a, no, this is our thing. Well, this is similar with other energy, but you can see here that depending on the size of the island, you have more or less losses. But the frequency basically doesn't change. You always have to be at the same. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is as a of function course. of the frequency, you know, of yeah. the model. 
And did I see a backup slide on the pitch and distribution? That is interesting as oh. well. Uh, yeah. At the moment, I made the simulation. So you, I must say that the, the neutral bean injection code is not tested. So I use it. Uh, I try to mimic the, 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 the pitch distribution I saw in the papers. OK. So I just put a uniform distribution of the pitch angle. Okay, and it, I try different initial conditions. And I mean, the main result is that for the the trapped particle, you can see I, I think in a real experiment should be an increase in the losses for for half half the injection energy because the precession the royal precession frequency is similar to the experimental value of the NTM. Mm, okay, that's that's. Uh... Well, important result in, in one way. And I hope that it could be experimentally valid, verified, basically. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> so, also hope that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know that their team, Aztec's team, doing this type of experiment is very active. So perhaps if talking to them, you might, yeah, might yeah, the find that there might be a data somewhere <laughs> sitting yeah, about. Probably now there is a, a, I don't know if they improve the, the, the the tools to measure the, the losses. But at the moment of the paper I study is only to 60 cap. Mm, okay. The, the lowest energy they can measure. Okay. Um, are there questions? Let's check the chat. No, there isn't anything on the chat. No hands up. Oh, perhaps everybody needs a cup of coffee <laughs> at this point. Mm. So thank you very much, Hugo, for your talk. And thank you. thank you to all all speakers of this session. Um, I will close this session now, um, and then I hope to see you all back here for the last session of today's um, uh, um, program, which is starting then at sixteen o five Central European time. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back. Let's begin soon the final session of the first day of the workshop, which is on simulation of turbulence in fusion plasmas. Please welcome the first speaker, who is an invited speaker. Uh, and as you listen to the talk, start thinking now about the questions you would like to ask afterwards. Dr. Emily Belli is a physicist at General Atomics, a company located in San Diego, California, where I believe it is 7 a.m. at the moment. Uh, she's carried out fusion theory and computational sciences research for the past 16 years at General Atomics. Dr. Belli earned her PhD from Princeton University in astrophysical sciences. She is a co-developer of the NEO and C-Gyro HPC codes. Earlier this year, she won a United States Department of Energy Insight Leadership Computing Award to support her work on turbulent transport in DT fusion plasmas. Dr. Bentley, the Zoom room is yours. Okay, um, thank you, Mary-Kate. I will share my screen. Uh -huh. um, hopefully you can see my slides. Yes, I can see, I think, more than one slide at a time. OK, um, um, there, that's the full screen mode. Yes, okay, yes. Um, so thank you to the organizing committee also. Um, I'm Emily Belli from General Atomics. And in this work, um, we have developed a multi-scale optimized gyro kinetic solver that efficiently captures the coupling between ion and electron scales for simulations of plasma turbulent transport in the tokamak edge or pedestal that are computationally challenging and require leadership scale resources. So the most promising operating scenario for achieving fusion in tokamaks is the so-called H mode or high confinement mode regime. And a characteristic feature of H mode is the formation of a transport barrier at the edge of the plasma. And this region of reduced particle and energy transport leads to steeper gradients in the density and temperature and a characteristic pedestal structure forms at the plasma edge. 
So the pedestal plays a key role in determining the overall global energy confinement. So understanding the transport in the H mode pedestal can help to develop operating regimes for optimal confinement and fusion performance. But turbulent transport in the pedestal is less well understood than in the core. So in comparison to the tokamak core, gyrokinetic turbulence simulations in the H mode pedestal are more challenging. So strongly shaped edge magnetic flux surface geometry requires a two to six times increase in the resolution and the parallel field line direction. Weaker pitch of the confining magnetic field or large safety factor in the edge requires larger radial resolution due to an increase in the non-adiabatic electron dynamics from the fast streaming motion, which leads to a rapid increase in the electron energy flux as shown here. Large collisionality due to a decrease in the temperature in the edge requires advanced collision models beyond standard electron pitch angle scattering used in gyrokinetics, for example, including energy diffusion, conservation terms for a number of momentum and energy, and fully interspecies between multiple ions and electrons, which is multi-scale and velocity space due to the disparate masses and thermal speeds. So most significantly though, the large temperature and density gradients in the pedestal drive multiple instabilities across a broad range of spatial scales, namely ions and electron scales that differ in size by the square root of the ion to electron mass ratio or nearly two orders of magnitude. So at long wavelengths perpendicular to the magnetic field or so-called ion scales with K on the order of the ion gyro radius, these include ion temperature gradient or ITG driven modes and trapped electron modes or TEM, as well as electromagnetic modes like the microtearing mode or MTM. And at short wavelengths with K on the order of the electron gyro radius, electron temperature gradient or ETG driven modes are often unstable. So since electron heat transport will play an even more dominant role in future reactors that rely on electron heating rather than ion heating, multi-scale simulations which couple ion and electron scales may be needed to fully describe transport in the H-mode pedestal. Thus, while ion scale turbulence in the core has been studied extensively, multi-scale pedestal simulations are far more challenging. For example, shown here are the toroidal wave number spectra for a typical ion scale ITG turbulence simulation resolving up to k theta rho i equals one, and a multi-scale ETG turbulence simulation resolving up to k theta rho e on the order of one, or equivalently k theta rho i on the order of 60, the core computation of which requires 2D FFTs of size 3456 by 574. Thus, multi-scale simulations require leadership scale computing resources and highly optimized solvers. Thus, we have developed the CGyro code, a multi-scale optimized gyrokinetic turbulence solver, and CGyro solves the 5D with three spatial dimensions and two velocity dimensions, delta F gyrokinetic Poisson ampere equations, using an Eulerian or grid-based approach. The motivations are accurate collisions in the H-mode pedestal and to provide efficient nonlinear electromagnetic multi-scale simulations. So because multi-scale simulations treat ion scale and electron scale turbulence simultaneously with complex nonlinear cross-scale couplings, they require an extremely fine mesh in real space and thus highly specialized numerical schemes are needed to prevent bottlenecks related to gyro averaging, the Maxwell field solve and the E cross B nonlinearity. And these bottlenecks do not exist for typical ion scale gyrokinetic simulations. So the core of CGyro is built around using highly efficient spectral or pseudospectral numerical schemes optimized for multi-scale simulations. And in fact, uniquely among gyrokinetic codes, CGyro is spectral or pseudospectral in four of the five phase space dimensions, specifically the spatial dimensions perpendicular to the field line, the radial direction X, the binormal direction Y, and in both velocity dimensions, but not in theta, the coordinate along the field line. So being fully spectral in the perpendicular spatial dimensions provides maximal multi-scale efficiency, Specifically, the spectral method ensures that the collision operator is algebraic or diagonal in space, and it allows for the most efficient evaluation of gyro averages, requiring only a simple multiplication in wave number space, and of the nonlinear term, where use of optimized GPU FFT root solvers like QFFT ensure maximum performance and scalability. In the velocity dimension, pseudospectral schemes provide optimal accuracy of collisions. 
So most gyrokinetic codes use velocity space coordinates optimized for the collisionless problem. For example, codes like gyro and GS2 use lambda and energy coordinates where lambda is the pitch angle coordinate and E is the normalized kinetic energy since these are the unperturbed constants of motion. And the main advantages of these coordinates are that they allow for a direct treatment of the particle bounce points defining the banana orbits, and there's no need to take a derivative across the trap passing particle boundary where the distribution function is discontinuous in the collisionless limit. So the C-gyro mesh in C theta space is shown here, where C is the cosine of the pitch angle, and the dashed lines represent contours of constant mu, the magnetic moment. So the closed contours in red represent the trapped particle orbits, while the open contours are the passing region. And the disadvantage of these coordinates is that it's difficult to evaluate the collision operator. For example, considering the Lorentz operator, L, which involves taking a derivative in C at a fixed theta, the gyro coordinates are not well suited as they map to an irregular grid in C theta space chosen by the bounce points. Our neoclassical code NEO has instead had great success with CV coordinates shown in the mesh below, where the points are Legendre nodes in C, implementing spectrally accurate collision operators. So CGIRO has the first pseudospectral implementation of the collision operator in a gyro kinetic code. It uses Legendre polynomials in C, for which the Lorentz operator is diagonal, and non-standard orthogonal polynomials in V. So most gyro kinetic codes will use a standard quadrature in V, but addition of energy diffusion and the advanced collision operator requires a new discretization, which is accurate for both energy integration and differentiation. And furthermore, because the energy domain is semi-infinite, standard finite domain pseudospectral methods like gauche legendre are not applicable. So the new method is based on a set of polynomials Q, which are orthogonal over a finite velocity interval from zero to B with Maxwellian weight E to the minus U squared. And an example of the polynomials is shown here. And in the limit that B goes to zero, the polynomials are just shifted monic Legendre polynomials, while in the limit that B goes to infinity, the polynomials are half range Hermite polynomials. So shown here is the convergence of a linear eigenmode frequency versus the number of C and V grid points for different values of collision frequency nu. And the dashed line illustrates a pure fourth order convergence rate. So we see that the method converges faster than this. So for C, the absolute error decreases rapidly as nu increases due to the smoothing effect of pitch angle scattering collisions in the vicinity of the trap passing particle boundary. And convergence in V is roughly independent of collisionality due to the lack of complex structure and energy in the collisionless limit. So typically only 16 C grid points and eight velocity grid points are needed for realistic simulations. And conceptually, this is equivalent to a 128 moment pseudospectral fluid hierarchy. So it is important to note that for any finite collision frequency, the gyrokinetic equation exhibits highly collisional behavior at the lowest energies, transitioning to essentially a collisionless behavior at the highest energies. And this is due to the scaling of the collision frequency with inverse powers of V. And this is shown here in contour plots of the electron distribution function in C theta phase space, where for the highest energies on the bottom, the collisionless trap passing particle boundary is clearly evident, while for the lowest energies on the top, the distribution is smoothed over by the high effective collision rate. So the variation of the collision frequency from the lowest to the highest velocities is nearly a factor of 10 to the five. So it's important for our numerical methods to be robust, even in the limit that the effective collision rate is very large. So an operating splitting scheme is used for the time integration to separate out the collisionless dynamics, which operate primarily on the spatial dimensions and the collisional dynamics, which operate on the velocity dimensions. The core computation of the collisionless step is the nonlinear term, which is a type of convolution and is done with a 2D FFT with de-aliasing, which is well suited to GPUs via optimized routines like QFFT. The collisionless step is explicit in time with an adaptive embedded RK54 time stepping algorithm. And in general, the time step restriction is set by the oscillation frequency of the fastest alphane wave, which for low K perp and beta is even more restrictive than the advective current condition due to electron streaming. 
But an explicit scheme allows for maximal efficiency for nonlinear multi-scale simulations, which require a very large number of radial and binormal wave numbers and make a direct implicit scheme impractical. The adaptive algorithm, however, gives faster solution for systems with impulse and oscillatory behavior. So while the code is fully spectral in X and Y, finite difference is used in theta, the coordinate along the field line. And a novel conservative algorithm is used in theta to prevent high accuracy, to allow for high accuracy electromagnetic simulation, even in the limit of very high beta and vanishingly small perpendicular wave number, where the well-known amper cancellation numerical instability arises. So the part of the gyrokinetic equation related to the parallel motion looks superficially like an advection, and it's well known that explicit advection must always include grid scale dissipation for stability. So we use a fifth order upwind scheme, which combines a sixth order center difference D and a sixth order filter S that provides the grid scale dissipation. And a key feature of the upwind scheme is that the strength of the dissipation vanishes as the grid is refined. So the continuum limit is obtained naturally as the number of grid points increases. However, the dissipation can cause inaccuracy due to violation of number conservation. And this spurious effect can be removed by projecting out the gyrocenter density distribution caused by the dissipation. So the new scheme is conservative in the sense that it conserves the gyrocenter number with respect to the numerical dissipation. And this type of conservation yields very accurate discretization and the long wavelength high beta limit where the amper cancellation problem arises and also improves the performance for high K electron scale ETG modes. So shown here is the convergence of a linear eigenmode frequency versus the number of theta grid points for different values of collision frequency. And the dashed line illustrates a pure fifth order convergence. So we see that the method achieves a maximal order of convergence for n theta greater than 16. The collisional step, on the other hand, operates primarily on the velocity dimensions, and it requires an implicit time advance due to the scaling of the collision frequency with inverse powers of V. So a second order Crank-Nicholson method is used, and the main computation is a matrix vector multiply with a large dense matrix of size NC times N velocity times N species squared. Though due to the spectral method, it is diagonal in space over which it is distributed. So CGR uses a spatial discretization and array distribution scheme that targets scalability on next generation HPC systems that use multi-core and GPU accelerated hardware. So CGR is inherently parallel since there are several steps in the simulation loop where each step can clearly partition the problem in at least one dimension and all the dimensions are compute parallel. So it's easy to split among several CPU or GPU cores and nodes. But no one dimension is common between all of the steps, so some dimensions may rely on neighboring data from previous steps, and overall this requires frequent transpose operations, which can be communication heavy. So there are three computational kernels and associated computational array layouts with each communication happening on two orthogonal communicators. So the collisionless layout for the linear terms has kx and theta on a MPI task that distributes over ky and velocity space on communicators one and two. In contrast, the collisional layout has all of velocity space on an MPI task and distributes in the spatial dimensions. The nonlinear layout is a little bit unique in requiring collecting all of the ky modes on a single core and redistributing in the rest of the space. So the collisionless to collisional or nonlinear layout requires an expensive MPI all to all, but only on a single rather than both MPI subcommunicators. So for the compute, all kernels are ported to GPUs using OpenACC and QFFT. In addition, critical use of GPU direct MPI minimizes the cost of memory movement. So on the OLCF Summit supercomputer, this provides a 30 to 40% reduction in communication time. And this is especially optimal for the first exascale machine frontier, since each of the four HPE slingshot network interface controllers is directly connected to the four AMD GPUs. So to further minimize communication for small ion scale simulations, since COM1 is more chatty, it is beneficial to keep most of the data inside the node to reduce the network traffic. 
And this optimization can give up to a 30% reduction in the network data, as shown here, comparing the left and the right bars. But this is limited since increasing the number of MPI increases the data communication of the COM2 and yellow. So multi-scale simulations are too large for this optimization, but making the number of MPI a multiple of the number of species can cut the volume size of this COM2 by limiting the exchange to only per species data. And in addition, using the smarter adaptive time advance that I mentioned also reduces both the compute and the data volume, particularly for multi-scale. So overall, CGR shows excellent strong scaling performance for an intermediate sized case on both CPU only machines like the Intel based Skylake and KNL, but particularly on GPU accelerated systems like Summit, which has six NVIDIA V100 GPUs per node and the new Perlmutter machine, which has four A100s per node. And the performance on the GPU systems is better on both a per node and a maximum performance basis by nearly an order of magnitude. So a breakdown of the time spent in each computational kernel is shown here normalized to the total time for a given system with the compute on the left and the darker colored bars and the communication on the right and the lighter colored bars. So for the CPU only systems, the compute time is dominated by the nonlinear FFT shown by the dark blue bar and the nonlinear communication or the MPI all to all dominates the communication. So the compute to communication ratio is fairly well balanced, though, at a ratio of about 60 40. In comparison for the GPU accelerated systems, high performance of the QFFT means a relatively short time spent in the nonlinear kernel and the cost of the nonlinear communication is larger than the compute, even with the GPU direct MPI. So even though the compute to communication ratio is low at 2575, it is important to note that this reflects the extremely high absolute performance of the GPUs rather than the poor absolute performance of the interconnect. So CGR multi-scale simulation is well suited to capability simulation on accelerated systems like the OLCF Summit. So these large simulations require greater than 10 terabytes of GPU memory. And shown here is a strong scaling and a weak scaling performance with number of species scaling from 20% of summit to the full summit for a coupled heat transport solve. And we look forward to our first exascale simulations on Frontier starting in January 2023. So these optimizations have already enabled a CGR multi-scale gyrokinetic turbulence analysis in the tokamak pedestal. And to our knowledge, no multi-scale simulations of pedestal-like transport with a full ion electron cross-coupling have been done previously. So for these studies, we consider parameters based on a high-performance D3D eater baseline H-mode experiment in the pedestal region. And we perform a scan over the ion temperature gradient given by the inverse scale length A over LTI, which is a key parameter that controls the turbulence in a subject to experimental uncertainty. So from the ensemble of CGR simulations, which required 250,000 node hours on summit, we find that the experiment lies in an interesting bifurcation region between the ion scale dominated and multi-scale dominated turbulence regimes. So examining the linear growth rate of the most unstable drift modes, we find that multiple modes are unstable across a broad range of spatial scales from ion scales to all, all the way to electron scales over several orders of magnitude. So at long wavelengths, an electromagnetic microtearing mode or an MTM mode is dominant, but this quickly becomes subdominant to a complicated ion direction drift mode. And this drift mode is a complex hybrid type that's driven by both the ion and electron temperature gradients, as well as strongly by the rotation shear. So at short wavelengths or electron scales, an electron temperature gradient or ETG driven mode is unstable. And for lower values of A over LTI, the ratio of gamma over K theta peak for the ion scale mode is comparable to or smaller than the ratio for the ETG mode, which is an indication that the multi-scale coupling may be important for the nonlinear transport. 
So for the nonlinear simulations, the transition from the multi-scale dominated to the ion scale dominated turbulence regime is shown more clearly here, comparing the electron density fluctuations on the right, which show radially elongated electron streamers that rapidly carry the particles out of the plasma to the relatively shorter scale ion eddies. So the nonlinear polluted wave number spectra on the left shows that as the ion temperature gradient increases, the low K spectrum increases, while the high K spectrum decreases, narrows in range, and is upshifted to higher values of K. So while the ETG linear mode spectrum was independent of the temperature gradient, here the electron scale turbulence is reduced by the ion scale fluctuations through a combination of the nonlinear mode mode interaction and an increase in the zonal flows. So zonal flows, which correspond to K theta equals zero, are turbulence-driven Ekrasby shared flows produced by the toroidally and polyoidally symmetric fluctuations of the electrostatic potential phi. And they're believed to play an important role in regulating drift wave turbulence. So shown here are the radial wave number spectra for the fluctuating potential intensity I corresponding to the zonal component and non-zonal component. And for the ion scale branch shown here, the intensities are peaked around Kx equals zero, but the total amplitude is very large. So the electron scale or the high Kx non-zonal modes are damped by the ion finite Larmor or radius effects. The zonal intensity spectra is qualitatively similar, which is consistent with the fact that the zonal flows are driven by these long wavelength modes and thus increase significantly with the ion drive. We can compare those with the multi-scale spectra, which are much broader in the radio wave number. So for the multi-scale branch, surprisingly an interesting secondary peaking of the zonal fluctuations appears at intermediate K between the ion and electron scales as a response to the high K ETG turbulence. And these ET driven flows play a key role in regularizing the multi-scale turbulence. So despite the rapid decay from K equals zero in the ion scale branch, the total intensity summed over K for both the non-zonal and zonal components are more than an order of magnitude smaller in the multi-scale branch. So the increase in the non-zonal fluctuating intensity is well correlated with the increase in the energy flux of the ions, and the results indicate that both long wavelength non-zonal fluctuations and low K-driven zonal flows play a key role in suppressing high K ETG turbulence. So rather than the intensity, what is important for the multi-scale turbulence is the drift kinetic energy K associated with the fluctuating E cross B drift velocity, which shows a significant broadening in K perp in the contours of K shown here from the ion scale branch at the bottom all the way to the very um, strongly multi-scale branch at the top. And finally, the significance of these results is that K and I together are representative of the total energy due to the fluctuating potential and the so-called Hasegawa MIMA model. So in the transition from the multi-scale to ion scale branches, the drift kinetic energy decreases while the fluctuating intensity rapidly increases such that the total energy in gray shifts from dominantly K to dominantly I. And it turns out that the shift in the total energy is well correlated with the trend in the energy flux. So overall, the analysis highlights the importance of the multi-scale coupling and turbulence for pedestal-like regimes. So in summary, a multi-scale optimized gyrokinetic solver, C-gyro, has been developed, and the core of C-gyro is built around using highly efficient spectral or pseudospectral numerical schemes in four of the five phase space dimensions. So being pseudospectral in the velocity space gives optimal accuracy of collisions, while being fully spectral in the perpendicular space gives spectral gyro averages ensuring the efficiency for multi-scale. Nonlinear evaluation on GPUs ensures maximum performance and scalability, and a novel conservative upwind scheme in theta permits high accuracy simulation for strongly electromagnetic modes. So overall, the spatial discretization and array distribution scheme targets scalability on next generation exascale HPC systems that use GPU accelerated hardware. And these optimizations have enabled a first multi-scale analysis of pedestal-like transport with full ion-electron cross-coupling. 
So the experiment lies in a bifurcation region between multi-scale dominated and ion scale dominated turbulence regime. And in the transition, the electron scale transport is reduced by nonlinear mixing with long wavelength fluctuations and ion scale driven zonal flows. And we look forward to our first CJAR exascale simulations of multi-species burning plasmas on Frontier in 2023. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellag, for that uh, fantastic talk. We now have time for some questions. You can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand. While you um, come up with your first questions for the speaker, um, I had a question about a couple of times you mentioned um, things that were well suited to the GPU, like a 2D FFT and a large matrix. Um, I wondered uh, what are some characteristics of numerical methods or of physical problems that are well suited to GPUs? Um, well, I think the ones you um, mentioned, I think there are um, basically any um, large matrix comp computation, even a matrix matrix solve, um, would be very well suited to GPUs. And with ours, with the collision operator, a, a key for it with the matrix vector is that we have a scheme where we actually have the entire matrix on a, on the GPU. So um, one disadvantage or thing that would make it not well suited to GPUs is if the matrix size gets too large that it doesn't fit on the GPUs, then you're um, continuously communicating back and forth and that dramatically slows down the speed. So one problem that we have had is when you increase, for example, number of species, because the matrix is square, is a um, goes like n species square, that dramatically increases the size. So one thing that we've been exploring with this is whether or not to use some approximations like um, FP32 or a 32-bit floating point operation for certain of the elements. It can't be done for the entire matrix, but um, for some of them to try to reduce the sizes. Thank you. Um, are there any questions yet from the audience in the chat or raise hand? Um, if not, I have another question uh, about the C gyro spectral method, whether you're able to handle global effects such as uh, flow shear. Um, yeah, so um, we have developed um, a novel kind of global spectral method. So in um, gyrokinetic codes, um, global effects like the E cross B shear or often what's called um, profile shear, like variations in the density and the temperature across flux surfaces are usually implemented directly using like a, a radial real space mesh with non-periodic boundary conditions, which can seem like a contradiction to a spectral method, which requires periodic boundary conditions. So the real space implementation is a lot more straightforward, but it often leads to spurious effects related to the artificial boundary conditions. So um, we have essentially developed like a wave number advection scheme that's based on a periodization of the shearing terms where the shear basically just becomes a difference operator, but on a discrete wave number grid rather than the real space grid. And um, the main advantage of this approach is that it is still radially spectral, so you can avoid the use of the ad hoc boundary conditions while maintaining the benefits and especially the scalability of the um, spectral method, particularly for the multi-scale simulations, which have a, a huge um, radial grid. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bellai. That's the time we have for questions uh, for now. You have another question, you could uh, continue in uh, chat with the speaker. So now we will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Alexei Mishenko, who is a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Greifswald, Germany, where he has carried out his work for the past 20 years. The Institute for Plasma Physics is a member of the Eurofusion Consortium. So, Dr. Mershenko, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see your full screen. Thank you. Okay, good. Thanks uh, for the introduction. So this uh, talk is on numerical tools for burning plasma applications. And I uh, give it on behalf of uh, my colleagues uh, listed here. Uh, 
in principle, uh, this stock is, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this stock describes software stock, which is under development uh, at the T3 task 10, which is a part of Eurofusion's eTask project. This project has been described in very detail by one of the uh, speakers today. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the codes which we develop uh, and uh, show some simulation examples. Uh, the most uh, HPC resource con consuming, demanding uh, uh, projects uh, in, in, in our task are the global jargon IT codes, ORP5 and Utopia. Those codes can be used to uh, simulate burning plasmas almost from uh, the first. Uh, principles. Uh, however, for longer time scales comparable to a sort of cycle, for example, uh, those computations become quite uh, demanding uh, so that uh, uh, we can switch uh, to less uh, time consuming uh, uh, approaches such as global hybrid MHD codes. And uh, we have HiMagic and Xstar uh, in our project as representatives of this uh, Codes of this type. And then for the full discharge, even uh, further simplification uh, is required. Uh, and uh, for that purpose, we use integrated modeling tools. Uh, first of all, uh, IMS based um, energetic particle workflow uh, and also SENIC uh, code framework, which uh, can be used for radio frequency heating uh, modeling and uh, uh, computing the uh, distribution functions of uh, fast ions resulting from from this heating. Um, okay, so in this talk, I'm going to present those tools and show some examples. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, for um, motivation, uh, yeah, introduction. Um, one of the features of uh, um, burning plasmas is uh, abundance of energetic particle uh, particles in, in, in such plasmas. Uh, those particles, uh, uh, they have kind of mesoscale dynamics and this uh, mesoscale dynamics may introduce couplings across different scales and uh, between different subsystems, subsystems which are uh, usually considered uh, separately but must be uh, computers studied within the same framework uh, for burning plasmas. For example, the uh, st traditional standard well-known paradigm of uh, turbulence and zonal flow coupling is nice, but it is not sufficient because often eigenmodes can also generate zonal flows and this way affect turbulence. Similarly, fast particle alpha eigenmode uh, cannot be considered uh, independently on turbulence uh, because there is a mutual attraction between those subsystems. All that uh, takes place, of course, in the presence of MHD events, so these can redistribute uh, fast particles, which then drive alphanic modes, which then generate zonal flows and affect turbulence, and all that at the end uh, leads to some uh, effects on uh, plasma profiles via different types of transport, diffusive or non-diffusive. So all that uh, needs to be described in a single framework. And here I have uh, just sentences describing more or less what they have already said. High beta, energetic particles in burning plasmas, complex coupled systems, and uh, yeah, single framework is desirable. Uh, many parts of this uh, problem, uh, many systems, they are kinetic and global, and many connections between those parts are kinetic and global. And it makes a global jargonetic approach uh, desirable. It seems to be a minimal inclusive description which puts all these pieces together. Um, of course, global jargonetics requires uh, very intensive computation and can be done on a full scale for demo size uh, devices, probably uh, at exascale uh, computing. Uh, of course, we can do uh, first very or clear steps now, and I'm going to show some examples. Uh, but uh, for longer, uh, yeah, for for large uh, time scales, uh, long time scales, reduced 
models can be used to speed up computation. And as I have mentioned, we use hybrid kinetic image to reduce energetic particle models and integrated modeling. Here I have some list of uh, uh, yeah, major actors and topics of interest. Uh, Energetic particle orbits, global alphenic modes, MHD modes, serial phone continuum, avalanches, profile corrugations, phase based structures, etc. Whole clump formation, reconnection, turbulence, uh, alpha eigen mode, zonal flow turbulence, mutual interaction. These are all subjects uh, which we are interested in. Uh, topics which are interested in. So this slide is uh, presenting uh, zero-kinetic equations, which result in a uh, so-called mixed variable formulation. I'm going to be quite quick at that point. We solve loss of equation. We solve also zero um, uh, kinetic zero center equations of motion, uh, non-linear equation. Uh, uh, loss of equation is not linear. Uh, the system of equation is closed by the quasi-neutrality equation written here in log values approximation, but there are other yeah, ways to write the same equation in the more general, for more general um, approach, which can also be used. And this is a parallel Ampere's law. Uh, since we're using uh, this mixed variable uh, uh, approximation, uh, sorry, mixed variable um, formulation of the zero kinetic theory, which uh, splits the uh, vector potential into two parts. Uh, we need a constraint, and this constraint can be anything, but we choose uh, the, um, yeah, this, this form because it uh, corresponds in the best way to the physics uh, uh, which we study. Uh, and more detail can be found on this uh, reference you can see here. OK. So for the sake of time, uh, I shall proceed. Uh, uh, for particle and cell codes, uh, we use Klimatovich uh, representation for the top distribution uh, function, uh, which is uh, discretized using weights and uh, and, um, and particles moving along uh, gyrocentered trajectories. Uh, then uh, the control variant, which we use, is normally Maxwellian, but uh, it can be anything, and uh, there is a talk by Thomas Hewitt Schneider, which describes other choices. And the fields are discretized using uh, finite elements, B splines, for example, in our case. Uh, in terms of um, computing, uh, we are now working or uh, well, doing some effort uh, for GPU enabling uh, in ORP5, uh, where Open ACC framework has been introduced. Also for Utopia, uh, we have uh, played with open ACC, introducing separate routines for different particle species. Uh, now we transition to OpenMP5+, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, idea behind this transition is why the support and more architectures which can uh, use OpenMP. Uh, then um, one of the key uh, steps in terms of programming was replacing global modules with uh, uh, for the abstract types. And this is a kind of step towards gradual transition of the code base for Utopia to C++. Uh, this is uh, something which we do now uh, on that side uh, as a kind of explorative pro project, a long-term project. Uh, and uh, by doing this, we uh, acknowledge the general trend in computing and uh, hope to get a better access to accelerators, frameworks, for example, COCOS uh, requires, well, it's better used, it, it's better to be C++ for, for Cocos, for example. Uh, okay, here uh, quickly, just some examples of simulations which we are doing with uh, ORP5 and Utopia Global Zero Kinetic Codes. Uh, we do uh, uh, things like uh, KBM turbulence simulations here shown for full-size ASICS upgrade, uh, beta uh, around 5% and, uh, well, uh, then uh, we study also electromagnetic turbulence in W7X uh, accelerator device using Utopia. Uh, we are interested in um, uh, zero kinetic simulations of Turing instabilities, uh, which can develop in presence of turbulence, uh, interacting with turbulence, and also fast particles can be added on the top of that uh, uh, of that uh, dynamics. Uh, we also have some examples not shown here of uh, alphenic modes uh, uh, destabilized by fast ions in presence of electromagnetic turbulence, ITGs or something else. Uh, this all generates zonal flows and uh, can also um, have interesting effects on chirping uh, phenomena in uh, alphenic dynamics. Uh, okay, so this was the kinetic part now, a hybrid uh, 
uh, MHD, kinetic MHD, but starting with X star K. X star K is uh, based on, uh, well, that's, uh, it, it has a, a full uh, nonlinear MHD solver. Uh, and uh, for kinetic part, uh, uh, the particles uh, are pushed uh, uh, using the full orbit uh, uh, equations. And then uh, the interaction between those subsystems is uh, done via the uh, pressure tensor. So there is a pressure coupling uh, for the fluid equations. And then the fields are, of course, used to push the particles. Um, here I have one example, uh, example of external simulations. Uh, this is an internal kink uh, so simulated in presence of, uh, uh, two, um, of using alphas. Of 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 us particles uh, and uh, yeah you can see uh, that the kink uh, developed to saturated state uh, yeah radial velocity and then fluid and kinetic uh, ion pressures shown here uh, and this uh, type of simulation uh, is now uh, extended well, our our purpose our goal is to extend this simulation to a sort of cycle uh, in the presence of uh, energetic ions and uh, alphanic waves coupled together. Uh, so uh, another uh, tool which we have, uh, which we develop is high magic. Uh, this is a hybrid MHD jargonetic code uh, to study energetic particles and alphanic instabilities, can be used for arbitrary tokamak equilibria. The fluid part of this code is actually uh, based on linear resistive MHD equation, uh, which is closely related to Mars uh, code. Energetic particles are described by uh, fully nonlinear jargonetic equations, and uh, the uh, two systems are coupled together via pressure tensor, pressure coupling, uh, as external. In, in, in case of external, Imagic is a highly imacified code, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I show some uh, well information on the IMAS uh, effort, uh, uh, which has been. Uh, uh, yeah, take uh, undertaken for 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 high magic. Uh, one can uh, read the uh, IMAS databases IDSs uh, using uh, the this this act universal access layer in initializer, uh, and then and then all this information can be passed to the next actor, which is uh, well that one uh, high magic IMAS that contains the actual code of. Uh, high magic uh, code prepares uh, input uh, data in a proper format which can be understood by the high magic then performs high magic simulation in all uh, complexity and beauty uh, and then uh, um, well forwards the output to the next uh, actor uh, this is the name i don't want to read it, but but this one uh, writes the output data to the database, closes the database, and then uh, all that can be used in all these uh, IMAS-ified frameworks by, by, by various codes uh, so that well, HIMAGI can do its part uh, in, in a more complex uh, simulation setups. The great you have less than two minutes remaining. Oh, this is nice. Thank you. I have just two slides. Uh, so another another thing which we develop is energetic particle workflow. Uh, it, uh, first, it's it's a <laughs> further development of Likka code. And here, uh, what we can do, uh, it's a Pythonic uh, code. What we can do, we can uh, take uh, uh, information from um, uh, experimental databases via IMS interface. And then uh, put this information into Likka code, and then you can see how the uh, in the course of the discharge, uh, this is uh, an example of L to H mode transition with uh, a nice uh, and beautiful alphanic dynamics, uh, including bursts and quiets and uh, phases. You can see how the continua developed uh, in time and uh, as this charge progresses, and also al alpha eigen modes uh, I developed, and then you can see the growth rate and the damping. Sorry. The damping grade in this case and the frequency of alphanic modes, uh, throttle alpha and eigen mode, uh, as a function of uh, discharge time. This uh, linear framework can be generalized to nonlinear uh, simulations. You can see here this linear part, how to generalize it on a linear uh, case. First, we need a block uh, for amplitude, the closure for amplitude calculations. 
And here one can use uh, nonlinear code, uh, for example, such as uh, all Hymatic or Warp 5. Uh, and then uh, the uh, nonlinear equilibria, so called phase based on structures, are computed based on all this information, solving uh, this type of equation. And all this information can be passed uh, via diffusion coefficient or the distribution function. Uh, the nonlinear equilibrium distribution function, long cleaved uh, distribution function to transport codes closing this way the loop. Okay, the very last slide almost. Uh, uh, our uh, code, uh, scenic code package, which we use to uh, compute heating, and it uh, cons uh, it has three components equilibrium component, uh, uh, then uh, the code which computes uh, um, ICRH field in a Called plasma approximation, and finally the particle falling code, uh, which also performs quasi-linear kicks. So we use that to compute heating in double seven x, for example. But it also can this code package can be used to compute energetic particle distribution function, which can be used for the other codes. So conclusions, and I guess I don't have any time left, so maybe I will just leave you with the conclusion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Mashenko. Um, it could be that as the audience thinks of their first questions, we don't have any yet in the chat or raised hands. Uh, could you tell us about your conclusions? Okay, good, nice, nice. Uh, yeah, okay, burning plasma, a complex multi-scale system, which coupled like, electromagnetic turbulence, zonal flow, energetic particles, and alpha nigra modes. And uh, of course, there are zonal flows, and this all happens in the presence of MHD activities. Uh, it is desirable to use global gyrokinetic uh, approach to compute all these uh, subsystems because it's a minimal inclusive approach. However, for long time dynamics reduction is necessary. And I have shown examples of hybrid MHD, which can be used for saw to cycle, fish bone burst, then integrated modeling, uh, which can be used for discharge time scale uh, simulations and also for heating modeling. Okay, and for enabling factors, improvements in theory and simulation of algorithms, then uh, code optimization and extension to new platforms, which is one of the subjects of this conference. And finally, uh, we have now a strong increase in computing resources available, and also availability of experimental data is increasing. And this, uh, this is nice to have it. Uh, it drives the progress. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much. There's a question in the chat, but um, go ahead, Eddie. Hello, Alexei. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a question. Can you elaborate on the interplay between alphas and the king mode that you showed in, in the slide? Between alphas and what? Uh... And the king mode. The king, king mode. Really... Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, good. Uh, this this thing, right? Yeah. Okay. This is just one of examples which shows that XTOR can uh, can can do such simulations, saturated kink regime in presence of fusion alphas. Uh, in terms of physics, well, we know that um, <laughs> the classical story of fast particles they can uh, uh, stabilize uh kink instability, and kink instability is kind of precursor for 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 sort of. Mm -hmm. This is one of the uh, effects which leads to monstrous sorties, for example. So one of the things is stabilization uh, of uh, of kink instability and increasing of sortus period. This is one of the things. Another thing is uh, fishbone activity, which can also take place if uh, uh, the fast particle uh, distribution is, uh, sorry, if, if, if uh, amount of fast particles is sufficient. Uh, beyond a certain threshold. But this is not the only uh, type of things which can happen. Uh, fish, oh, sorry, fish bones or sorties, they can, uh, uh, kinks, they can uh, uh, redistribute, uh, they can just transport a certain amount of fast particles to a different uh, place in plasma. And uh, in this place, we have also alphanic continua and uh, we have uh, eigenmodes, which can be destabilized mm -hmm. as a consequence of this transport process of, of, of sorties. So sorties, they can trigger alphanic uh, activities, for example, um, this type of thing. But this mm -hmm. is uh, not the end of the story. There is a, a link to turbulence uh, yeah, because uh, fish bones, for example, can generate uh, 
some some flows uh, shared flows which can uh, for example uh, affect uh, turbulent dynamics or uh, uh, in case of kink we have these helical cores uh, which can also lead to generation of uh, uh, neoclassical electric field for example similar to stellaratus and uh, yeah uh, there are many many combinations possible mm -hmm. thank you Okay, thank you. We will close the question and answer session now and move on to the next talk. Thank you again, Dr. Mishenko. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Wilhelm. Um, he's a PhD candidate at the Rhine-Westphalia Technical University of Aachen in Germany. He is also associated with the NHR Graduate School in Germany, which is an HPC graduate school that is part of the National HPC Center for Computational Engineering Science. Paul Wilhelm, go ahead. Good evening. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Um, and now the Slides should be full screen, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you for um, inviting me to give this talk here. Um, I'm Paul Wilhelm, and I'm working at the ACOM Institute at RWTH. Um, our institute is mainly focused on um, develop developing methods for kinetic equations. And in particular, me and my co-author for this work, we're working on a, um, on a new scheme, um, let's say related to Lagrangian schemes for a particular de Blasov equation. It could also apply to Boltzmann equation in a sense. Okay, so first, um, as I will present this scheme, it's a new scheme from, uh, it's not quite related to the classical ones. I will focus on the easier case of the loss of Poisson equation, so we will ne ne neglect the uh, um, magnetic field for now, just to present the scheme. So first, I will give a few um, points on the Vlasov equation in general and why we focus on this one and why we need a new scheme. Then I will really present a new scheme, give some uh, insights, numerical experiments, which we have done with this, and then conclude. Okay, so um, why use the Vlasov equation? We are focusing on kinetic models as these um, give you uh, more, let's say, a uh, more exact um, resolution of the physics underlying a plasma flow, in particular if we are talking about fusion reactions, but also in uh, different uh, applications uh, like at the TLR, with, which, with whom we are also working together. In this particular case, to present the method, as I said, I will focus on um, the vlasov poisson equation, which is a simplified model for collective electron behavior, where we say, okay, we have the magnetostatic case, we can neglect the magnetic field for now and neglect collisions. Both of these can be included again, and we can also include more complicated boundary conditions in the scheme. However, to for presentation's sake, for simplicity's sake, I will uh, keep it now short with this one. Okay, so what are the problems with the Vlasov equation when solving numerically and why we are in, in this HPC community here right now is um, the Vlasov equation or the gyro kinetic equation or the um, Boltzmann equations are all high dimensional equations. In the case of the Vlasov equation, we have a distribution function f, which is a seven dimensional equation, one dimension in time, three dimensions in space, and three dimensions in velocity space. So if you would uh, simply go ahead and uh, implement, a, let's say, a finite volume solver for this, um, you will have extensive memory usage. I will come back to this fact later again. Another big problem, which we see for kinetic equations, and in particular the Vlasov equation, is development of uh, turbulences and filamentation in a solution. So, so what I show here in these two pictures are two cross-sections cross of uh, a benchmark case of the Vlasov equation, 
which where, where we see the development of uh, these strong fundamentations, which bring star, uh, strong gradients in uh, v in x direction, in particular in v direction. Um, so this is simulation run for some time. This now uh, without um, uh, giving uh, dimensionless, sorry, in a dimensionless units. So we are here relatively uh, uh, far right in a simulation. We see that we have these strong filaments which you can't really resolve by any normal method, except if you would have an arbitrary high resolution. Also, if you would like to resolve this, you would need a very high number of points, let's say for a DSMC or a particle and cell method to avoid noise, as we have already heard before, which would also be a big issue even on a cluster. Okay, so basically our ansatz is, um, in a sense, we don't want to save the distribution function itself as classical methods would go ahead. And for example, for finite volume method, you would need to save a grid of all the values of F or for a particle and cell method, you would need to save the particle locations as same as um, you would need to save the values of F or some weights for these particles. Um, we want to avoid this, as this would uh, need a lot of memory. In our case, we want to use the thinking of Lagrangian schemes. So again, like particle and cell, but uh, really reconstruct this uh, phase flow phi. So let's uh, look at the schematic. Um, if you have given some point xv in phase space at some time and space, um, you could, if you would know the phase flow field using the methods of characteristics, you could trace back this point to initial datum and then evaluate um, the distribution function f at the initial datum where you know it already and reuse this point. This is the same idea which is behind particle and cell methods where you would not need to change the weight of the um, particles if you don't have a collisional term. Okay, now the big question is obviously, okay, how do we reconstruct this phase flow here? And basically the idea is, okay, um, for now let's take the symplectic Euler. You can also take higher order methods for this. The, you only need to save the electric field or uh, to be more precise, the electric potential for all the previous time steps you did. And then using this iterative scheme, reconstruct the phase flow. So what do I mean by this? If you have a uh, given X and V, uh, in this case, we call them XK and VK, you can go one time step back using the symplectic Euler by the above equation in X direction, as we know the V exactly. And now as we said that we have saved the electric field from the previous time step or can evaluate it as we save the electric potential, we can also evaluate E, the electric field on a previous time step using the newly computed xk minus one and have a vk minus one. Actually, you can also use uh, go to a second order method here using a Sturmer roulette and a transformation uh, argument. Okay, so basically, how does this um, scheme then look like? For the nonlinear case, you obviously don't know uh, the electric field at all time steps. However, you can uh, do one time step, compute the electric field or electric potential. So first you sample the function f. You do not save it, you only sample it at some points. From numerical quadrature, you can then compute the electric electron density rho. From there, for example, using an FFT or some other uh, solver, which you like, um, you can compute the electric potential from this rho k and then save the phi k, the electric potential from which you can then evaluate uh, the electric field. Now, as a fourth step, if you need to, you could uh, look at some characteristics of your um, function f or, I don't know, like temperature or density or something. And then you repeat this every time step. 
So basically, you never need to save F. You only save the phi h the electron pot electric potential. Why should we do this? As I mentioned before, if we would save the complete um, F on a, on, on a grid, let's say, we have enormous amounts of memory which we need to transfer from our uh, memory to the cores and back again in each time step. So uh, looking at some numbers, for example, if we are in uh, the three-dimensional case for 128 points in each direction, in the Wasserf equation, we would need to save approximately um, 3 million gigs of memory for F itself. If you only save the velocity, uh, no, the, uh, the electric potential, you would need one uh, zero point zero one five gigs of memory. So one million times less um, a memory. And the uh, gyroconnected case, if you would go to a um, two-dimensional case, this would still be a huge saving. Obviously, you would need to save this for every time step, but let's say you have like a thousand or 10,000 time steps. This is still a lot less than uh, what you need to save uh, if you have a full grid. And this is also not considering any additional information if you have a structured grid, for example, for finite element solvers. Okay, so. So what this enables really is that we are shifting memory uh, workload from memory access to computation on the fly. Um, modern computer systems have the um, possibility to run computations extremely faster than simply accessing memory. This was 20, 30 years ago, this was different, but nowadays it's uh, preferable to have a high flop to byte ratio. So, and what this algorithm really does is enables us to uh, really shift this uh, memory access to computation on the fly. Now, the short remark, using this structure, we also have several conservation properties, which we would not have for classical, um, classical schemes like uh, finite volume method, sorry. So for example, you um, save, uh, you still have the conservation property of maximum principle, you save all the LP norms and the kinetic entropy, and we can give numerical proof that you actually also, up to some cutoff error, preserve the total energy. This is not something you can expect from, uh, for example, a finite volume method. Or for, if you look at uh, particle and cell codes, you need to use three meshing usually to get them um, um, stable to work against numerical noise and then you also would lose these conservation properties okay i will skip this uh here so, so this is basically a um, short benchmark case but due to short enough of time i will not go into detail here so what we see is um even for low resolution uh the snoofy scheme is able to capture the dynamics correctly um, this is due to the, how the solution is computed. It really uses the, the solution, solution structure in a different way than uh, like a grid-based method would use. But I won't go into detail on this now. Um, basically, what we also see in these, these are um, error plots computed for the one-dimensional and two-dimensional case. We have the same behavior for the three-dimensional case as well. Um, you see that at the beginning, um, before the turbulent phase sets in, you get errors at uh, machine precision level. And later when the um, turbulent phase sets in, you level out again at a uh, constant level again, which is obviously higher than machine precision level, but still good enough. Depending on your resolution, it can range between relative errors at the order of uh, 10 to the power minus one, minus two, up to 10 to minus five. Um, what's maybe more interesting for um, the HPC community, we have, um, first of all, linear scaling in uh, the number of credit trap points, so the number of points which at which we sample F, and particularly you see that the scaling sets in quite late. Um, we did these computations on a single GPU, and up until this point, you see that all the um, coefficients which you need to compute uh, the solution 
um, are actually stored in the L1 cache of our GPU. And later they can only be stored into the L2 cache. And that's why um, um, the, the scaling really is only seen for later cases, especially for the two dimensional case we see it here. Um, sets in later okay and what's also interesting we have actually strong scaling so if you double the number of computational cores which you are using you also get half the time um, so we did this for on our RWTH cluster GPU cluster and if you really double the number of uh, GPUs and actually use all of your GPUs so for small computations you wouldn't see this actually but if your computations are large enough, you see that you actually get strong scaling. Okay, so let me conclude at this point. Um, what I'm trying to suggest is a new type of scheme. So to, to shift, um, basically to shift the mindset from saving the function f, the distribution function f, or H in the case of, uh, for example, Jurokinetics, instead of saving this at each time step, you can skip some time step, let's say, and only save it every so and so time steps. And in between, only save the electric potential having a lot less memory requirement, which gives you, first of all, a very parallel algorithm, very low memory usage. And uh, more exact, let's say, conservation properties. Future research, which I'm working on, obviously, I've presented this algorithm for a um, simplified model now. We can do this for um, more complicated, let's say, Vlasov Maxwell or Vlasov Maxwell Landau model. Um, we are working on efficient methods how to implement this. Okay, so I will stop here. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> The, we have time for some questions. Uh, you can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, I'll say it looks like you have some exciting results related to this new scheme. Uh, and I was curious whether in your view, the new scheme is a total complete improvement over the grid approach, or if you can imagine any scenarios where the grid approach might have some advantage. I think it's rather, um... A combination of both should be used. Um, so it really depends on how many time steps you do. Um, if you look at the scheme, you see that it scales with also um, the longer you run your simulation, the longer it takes because you have to save uh, every time step before the electric potential before and then evaluate and go back. So it takes longer if you have a longer simulation. So at some point, there will be a break even point where a uh, purely grid-based approach would be faster. However, this break-even point from our experience so far is quite late. Let's say a few thousand computational time steps. So maybe what's really the application of this scheme is to combine it with, let's say, grid-based approach and really only evaluate and save the function every thousand, two thousand time steps or so. Great, thank you. Um... And if there are no questions from chat or raise hands, I'll ask one more question. Um, could you say a little bit more about how it is that your new scheme for solving kinetic equations enables the high level of parallelism? Mm -hmm. So if we go back until this point, um, basically the difference is we do not have any um, uh, the, the, the points where you evaluate, where you sample F, are never connected to each other. You don't have any, um, um, you don't need to know the value of F at the neighboring node, let's say, to evaluate your F at this point. So you can take every sampling point and parallelize over all the sampling points. So in particular, if you go to three dimensions and let's take like 128 points for each directions, you will get, uh, as we've seen here, um, 100 to the power of six uh, uh, points um, in which you can parallelize. And this really enables to use you um, to use um, 
highly parallelizable structure or computational architecture. So basically all of the degrees of freedom are independent of each other. And that's why um, this parallelism is really uh, possible here, which is somewhat different from other methods. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we will close the question and answer session now. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers and to all of you in the audience for your participation in this workshop so far. We have come to the close of the first day of the third Fusion HPC workshop now. We will begin again tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central European time. The same link as you used to join the workshop today will also work tomorrow. So see you later, everybody. Bye for now. Uh, and we will close the Zoom room shortly.